William. The Dukedom Secret Series Book 2 Written by Edith Byrd and published by Starfall Publications Available on Amazon and free with Kindle Unlimited Enjoy! Chapter 1 Lancashire, England, 1815 I do so love the woodlands at this time of year. Look at the bluebells, a veritable carpet. Isn't nature remarkable? The mind of man can conjure beauty in so many forms, but nature so often surpasses even the greatest of artists, Miriam, Duchess of Lancaster, said, as she gazed around her at the sea of purple flowers spreading out across the woodland through which she and her husband Ralph were walking. The Duke nodded and smiled at her, the two of them walking hand in hand together. I suppose it's why they call it Bluebell Woods, he said, and Miriam blushed. Don't tease me, Ralph. You know what I mean. The bluebells return every year. They lie dormant beneath the earth, waiting to burst forth in spring. It's my favourite time of the year. I'm so glad Teresa lives here. I can hardly believe it's been twenty years since we first encountered one another right in this very place, Miriam said, shaking her head as she looked around her with a smile on her face. They had come in sight of a folly built by some distant ancestor of Ralph. It was overgrown now, clad with creeping ivy, but had once been a fine impression of a Greek temple, built in miniature, with steps leading up to a marbled entrance. Surrounded by the carpet of bluebells, it made for a pretty sight, and Miriam and Ralph had many happy memories of moments shared amidst this picturesque setting. A long time passed, Ralph said, smiling at Miriam, who shook her head. And now to think of William and Maximilian, both grown-up young men, setting out into the world. I can hardly believe it, Miriam replied. Me, neither. To think we weren't much older than they are when all this... Well, we shouldn't dwell on the past. But twenty years since my brother died, twenty years of being the Duke of Lancaster, twenty years of marriage, he said, slipping his arm around Miriam who rested her head on his chest. But no regrets, Ralph, she said, looking up at him and he shook his head and smiled. No regrets, not a single one. It's easy to regret moments, but looking back over the course of our lives, no, I wouldn't change a single moment of the time we've had together. I love you as much today as I did then. More so, in fact, he said, and he leaned down to kiss her. For a few moments they stood in silence, savouring the peace of the woodland where a gentle breeze was blowing through the trees and a chorus of birds was singing a chorus to the spring. Come now, we mustn't be late. I promised Teresa we'd be there in time for tea and before William gets home, Miriam said, taking Ralph's hand and urging him on along the path past the folly. They were on their way to visit Teresa, the maid who had fallen in love with Ralph's brother, the previous Duke of Lancaster, and whose child William had been born shortly after the untimely death of his father, twenty years previously. She lived in a cottage on the edge of Bluebell Woods, some five miles from Burnley Abbey, supported by a modest pension from the estate. Miriam and Teresa were the closest of friends, and whilst their outward lives were very different, they shared a deep affinity, not least through their sons who, though cousins, had never known the truth of the past. I hope Teresa won't mind my having made arrangements for William, Ralph said, as they hurried on through the woodland towards Teresa's cottage. She's always wanted what's best for him, and he's always known of our fondness for him. It's no secret you've helped him in his education, just as you've helped so many others on the estate. Why shouldn't you pay heed to his prospects now? You're in a position to make introductions on his behalf. I've talked to her. She's grateful for all we've done. Miriam replied. William knew nothing of his familial relationship with the Duke of Lancaster. Miriam and Ralph were William's godparents, but he did not know they were also his aunt and uncle. It had been decided twenty years ago to keep the matter a secret, both from William and his cousin Maximilian, named in honour of the former Duke and William's father. William had never openly questioned Ralph's kindness towards him in paying for his education and seeing him taken care of. The Duke had been careful to extend his philanthropy to others, 
and there were several young men on the estate who owed their good start in life to Ralph's generosity. I know she is, but I worry she might find this a step too far, Ralph replied, as they came in sight of Teresa's cottage. It was a pretty dwelling, whitewashed stone and a thatched roof, built in a clearing of the forest, and surrounded by a garden in which Teresa grew vegetables to sell at the nearby market. She took in mending too, and her pension from Ralph provided a modest income. Teresa herself was standing at the door as they approached, and she smiled, waving to them as they emerged from the trees. You're just in time for tea. I've the kettle boiling, and I've just buttered the bread, she said, beckoning them inside. Miriam greeted Teresa with a kiss. Her sister Claire was married to the Earl of Wingate and lived in Derbyshire. She rarely saw her and was glad to have Teresa close at hand. They were as much friends as sisters. You needn't have gone to any trouble on our behalf, Miriam said, stopping into the parlour, where a fire burned in the hearth, and the table was covered with checkered cloth and set for tea, with a large fruitcake at the centre, along with biscuits and currant buns. Teresa's cottage was a far cry from the opulence of the drawing room at Burnley Abbey, but it had a homely quality to it, and Miriam always felt comfortable and at ease there. She sat down by the hearth as Teresa poured the tea, and Ralph stood with his back to the flames. It's no trouble to entertain friends. I walked into the village with William this morning and went to the bakery, Teresa said, smiling as she handed Miriam a cup of tea. And his studies? Are they going well? Ralph asked. Teresa nodded. Miriam knew how proud her friend was of her son. He excelled in every pursuit, and his tutor, the kindly Professor Murray, who lived in the village, had often expressed his astonishment at the boy's learning. Professor Murray says there's little left he can teach him now. He needs to study elsewhere. There was talk of Oxford or Cambridge. But William doesn't want to enter the church, Teresa said. Miriam laughed. I should think not. Don't let him waste his talents in theology, she said, shaking her head. But what should he do? I don't know. It's not easy for a boy in his position. They don't normally... Well, he's had a wonderful education. But he's not a gentleman, is he? Boys like him become hall boys in grand houses or labourers on estate farms. But he's got a mind filled with other things. He wants to write books and make discoveries. I keep telling him, William, you're not born into that. You've both been so kind, but we knew this time would come. He's not who he's supposed to be, Teresa said, shaking her head. She passed around the tea plates and Miriam helped herself to a slice of bread and butter and currant bun. They had always known this day would come, even as they had known it would not be easy. William was the son of the previous Duke of Lancaster, though born out of wedlock. The matter of his would-be inheritance was questionable. No one, save a handful, most of whom were sitting in Teresa's cottage that day, knew the truth. It was Maximilian, the son of Miriam and Ralph, who was to inherit the dukedom. His cousin was merely a friend and the son of a lowly seamstress who lived in a cottage in Bluebell Woods. In his childhood, it had seemed reasonable to educate the boy and provide for him, but Teresa was right. William had been directed in a way he could not hope to continue in, not whilst remaining at home with his mother, at least. Actually, Teresa, that's what we've come to talk to you about today, Ralph said, pulling out a chair from the table and sitting down. Teresa looked at him in surprise. Is that so? And what do you want to talk about? She asked, helping herself to a slice of cake and sitting opposite Ralph and fixing him with a curious expression. I know it's not been easy keeping the secret all these years. We've all felt the burden of it. But I always vowed to do what I could to help William. I hope I've done so. And now I want to help him again, Ralph said. He and Miriam had talked about the matter often and Miriam knew the sense of responsibility Ralph held towards his nephew. Twenty years ago, Ralph had done all he could to help Teresa in her time of need, and he had never reneged on his word. And what do you propose? Teresa asked. To give him the opportunity to make something of himself by independent means. We live in a world of new opportunities. Wealth isn't only for those who inherit it, but for those who create it too. 
I want to send William to London and offer him letters of introduction to various firms and businesses. With my name behind him, he'll soon find doors opening to him. But he'll be the one to make those opportunities for himself, Ralph said. It was a sensible idea, or so Miriam thought. Ralph would write a letter of introduction for William and pay his expenses during his first few months in the capital. With the education he had been given and the name of the Duke of Lancaster behind him, William could look forward to a bright future. The question of who he really was would remain. Teresa had always told him his father had been a soldier, killed whilst fighting the French. But as to his future, it would be secured. Teresa now looked at Ralph and shook her head, as though in disbelief. I, it's a very generous offer, she said, glancing at Miriam, who smiled. It's not generous, Teresa. It's what was always intended. William deserves the help of the estate. It's in his birthright, Miriam said, and Ralph nodded. Miriam's right, Teresa. Think of Max. It's what he'd have wanted, short of William inheriting the title, he replied. Teresa looked suddenly sad. She had never married and still spoke of the Duke's brother as though she could never love anyone as she had loved him. If Ralph's brother had returned from Corsica alive, the two of them would have married, and William would be the true heir of the dukedom. But that's the truth, isn't it? He should have inherited the title. He'd be a gentleman, but sometimes I feel we robbed him of his right, she said, shaking her head. Miriam reached out and took Teresa's hand in hers. It was never going to be easy, Teresa. But wasn't this for the best? He was protected, and there was Maximilian to think of too. If he'd grown up knowing his cousin was his rival, it's better this way, surely, she said. They had talked about it often, but it made no difference. A terrible secret lay in the past, one they had lived with for so long, but still gave cause for difficulty as to the future. I know it is, but one can't help but think. What might have been? Teresa replied, shaking her head. It's twenty years now since Briar Heights and Connor Edge, and threats to the dukedom. Didn't we agree it was all for the best back then? Ralph asked. Still, after twenty years, Miriam shuddered at the mention of the name Connor Edge, the land agent who had discovered the secret of William's parentage and threatened to ruin the dukedom in its wake. But his own treachery had been discovered, and he had been sent away in shame. Still, Miriam often thought of what had become of him, and whether he still held a grudge against her and the others. I know. I'm just being foolish. I never wanted Max's name to be sullied and I never wanted to see the dukedom brought to its knees. He'd have wanted the secret kept, and that's what I've done. It's what we've all done, isn't it? No, you're right, and you're kind too, Ralph. I'm so grateful to you for all you've done for William, and for what you propose too, she said. Miriam smiled, sitting back in her chair and taking up her cup and saucer. I'm so glad you agree, Teresa. Won't it be exciting for him, London, the possibilities he'll have? I just wish Maximilian, well, Maximilian is Maximilian, Miriam said, thinking of her own son and glancing at Ralph, who shook his head. Maximilian was nothing like his cousin, even as he had been afforded all the opportunities William too had been given. But unlike William, Maximilian had not applied himself, and the prospect of inheritance had taken away any sense of ambition he had. His life was privileged, and he was wealthy. Why did he need to work? or make any effort to better himself. There were times when Miriam despaired of him, though she was pleased for William, who had turned every opportunity to good. I'm sure he'll find his way eventually, Teresa said, rising to her feet and offering around the plate of bread and butter. We can only hope as much. Still, it's William we're here to help today. I propose to make the offer to him this very day. He's due home soon, isn't he? Ralph asked, and Teresa nodded. Yes, he should be here now. But you know what he's like. He stays for hours with Professor Murray, asking him questions, and then he idles his way home, dreaming of some new venture or idea. He'll arrive home with a dozen thoughts in his mind, all of which he has to write down, Teresa said, smiling and shaking her head, as she glanced towards a desk in the corner, piled high with books, many of which had come from the library at Burnley Abbey. Then we'll wait for him. It's no trouble. And how good it is for us to be together, we three. 
what memories we have, Ralph said, helping himself to another cake, and Miriam and Teresa exchanged glances. We certainly have plenty of memories, Miriam said, shaking her head and smiling, for they were memories she was glad of, and despite the difficulties they had endured, she would not change for anything. Chapter 2 But did Aristotle really mean to say that? What about the translation? Can we be sure we've got it right? The texts were lost for so long, how can we know they weren't changed? William Baker said, rising to his feet in a fit of exasperation at the long-dead philosopher, over whom he had been debating with his tutor, Professor Murray, for the past half an hour. Professor Murray smiled and shook his head. You've come up against the great problem with philosophy, William. Did any philosopher ever really mean what they said? And what was the meaning of it to them anyway? You're right, of course. Aristotle's text was lost to the Western intellect for centuries and only preserved by Islamic scholars. But as for their meaning in translation, well, how would you translate the passage we've been studying? He asked. William turned to the professor and pondered for a moment. Knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom, he said and Professor Murray nodded. And do you believe it? he asked. William smiled and nodded. To know oneself was surely necessary before a person could be said to know anything else at all. He thought about his own life for a moment and the things he knew about himself. I think so, yes. I know who I am at least and that means I can know about others, he replied. But do we really know ourselves? Are we honest with ourselves about who we are? Or do we hide from ourselves at times? Professor Murray asked. William smiled and shook his head. I don't hide from myself. I know who I am and I'm proud of it, he said. Professor Murray returned his smile and closed the volume of Aristotle in front of him. And for one so young, I'm glad to hear it. But that's enough for today, William. We've grappled with the works of Aristotle, rehearsed both our French and German conversation, and explored the entire history of the Peloponnesian War. We'll resume tomorrow. Hurry home, I'm sure your mother's waiting for you, the professor said. William liked Professor Murray. His tutor had taught at Oxford for many years, before retiring to his native Lancashire, where he lived in a small house in the village near Burnley Abbey. The house was a veritable library, and every conceivable surface was stacked with books. Their lessons took place in an upper room overlooking the churchyard, and on sunny days the professor and William would sit beneath the shade of a large oak tree in the garden, reciting poetry to one another, or reading philosophy. I will do, professor, and thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll bring you the chapter of the novel I'm working on. Perhaps we could discuss it, William said taking up his hat and coat from the cloak stand. Professor Murray smiled. I'll be delighted to read it, William. Good day to you and give your mother my fondest regards, he said. William hurried out of the professor's house, his mind filled with thought of Aristotle and all he had learned that day. Knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom, he repeated to himself, imagining the ancient philosopher at work. William was certain he knew himself, or rather he knew a great deal about himself. He was the son of Teresa Baker, a seamstress, and the two of them lived together in a cottage in Bluebell Woods. His father had been a soldier, a brave and courageous man, who had gone to fight the French in Corsica and had never returned. William had a benefactor, the Duke of Lancaster, his godfather, and whilst William had always been curious as to why the Duke should pay any attention to a commoner like him, he was glad of the Duke's kindness to him over the years. It was the Duke who paid Professor Murray to be William's tutor and who gave him a small allowance to enable him to pursue his studies when other young men of his age were forced to work as labourers or bellboys. I owe him everything, William thought to himself, waving to several young ladies who were congregating around the window of the village bakery where fresh batches of cakes had been placed appetisingly on display. Oh, look, it's William. Good day, William, one of them called out, and William smiled. 
he was treated as something of an oddity by the young ladies of the district. His mother was a seamstress, and yet William lived the life of a gentleman, albeit at the Duke's expense. He was a handsome young man, dark-haired like his mother, and with amber eyes he was told were those of his father. But William's mind was too filled with learning to be much interested in courtship and romance, and whilst the young ladies congregating outside the bakery were charming and pretty, they did little to interest him. Good day to you, William called out, tipping his hat, as he hurried by on the opposite side of the road. His mother's cottage lay in Bluebell Woods, a mile or so from the village, and William crossed three stiles, skirting the edges of the wildflower meadows and enjoying the pleasant spring weather. The sun was warm on his face, and the sky was blue and bright. Standing on the last stile, William could see Burnley Abbey in the distance, the sun reflecting on the sandstone walls, and the standard of the Duke of Lancaster fluttering in the breeze. It was a fine sight, and one William often stood to look at. He thought of the Duke's son, Maximilian, for he knew he too was under Professor Murray's tutelage, though with less than impressive results. Maximilian just doesn't apply himself to his studies, William thought to himself, repeating Professor Murray's words, for his tutor had often spoken of his exasperation at the efforts of the young heir. On his part, William could not understand why Maximilian did not apply himself to his studies. He had every opportunity to do so, and a library unrivalled by any in the county at his disposal. William was allowed to use the library at Burnley Abbey too. He often went there, though did not always see his godfather. He liked to sit amidst the shelves of books, with their comforting ancient scent, and imagine himself in possession of all they contained and all there was to know. Is it possible for a man to know everything there is to know? William had once asked Professor Murray. The professor had smiled and shook his head. There are those who've professed to know everything there is to know, in their time at least. Aristotle was one such, or others spoke of him in such terms. But as for knowing everything there is to know, I don't think so. Wouldn't life be terribly boring if we really did know everything? No, William, that's the wonder of life. There's always something new to discover, he had replied. William was now making his way along the path through the trees, leading to his mother's cottage. Bluebell Woods was living up to its name, and it was the time of year when the woods were carpeted with the purple flowers of its namesake. William paused to pick a bunch for his mother and hurried on. His stomach was rumbling, and he was eager for something to eat. I hope she bought some currant buns, William thought to himself, as now the cottage came in sight. William was looking forward to telling his mother everything he had learned that day. His mind was filled with thoughts of the next chapter of his novel, the story of a man who sets out to fight the French in Corsica and falls in love with a woman on the side of the enemy. William often thought about his father, and the story was based loosely on how he thought his father might have been. He wanted to sit down and write immediately, but as he opened the door, William was surprised and pleased to find his godparents sitting at the tea table. Oh, William, I thought you were never coming back, his mother exclaimed as the Duke stepped forward to greet him. It's good to see you, William. How are you? I'm sorry I missed you at Burnley Abbey last week. Did you find the books you wanted? The Duke said, offering William his hand. Yes, thank you, sir. I'm in excellent spirits, William said, smiling at the Duchess, who was sitting by the hearth. Good day, William. How glad we are to see you, she said as William's mother cut him a large slice of cake and handed him the plate of bread and butter. Here you are, William. Sit down and eat. You'll be hungry, I'm sure, she said, and William grinned. Ravenous mother, he replied, sitting down at the tea table to eat. William was glad to see his godparents. They had always taken a keen interest in him, even as he remained somewhat unsure how the son of a seamstress had come to be the godchild of a duke and duchess. His mother had always been friends with them, and William's earliest memory was of playing with Maximilian on the lawn at Burnley Abbey. Tell me, William, what have you learned today with Professor Murray? I trust he's making you work hard, the Duke said, and William nodded. Then the Megarians, being all half-starved, desired the Spartans to desire of us just to repeal those laws, the laws I mentioned, 
occasioned by the stealing of those strumpets. And so they begged and prayed us several times, and we refused. And so they went to war, William replied, repeating the ending of a poem by Aristophanes on the origins of the Peloponnesian War, and which he and Professor Murray had studied that day. The Duke appeared impressed. Aristophanes, he asked, and William nodded. That's right, on the origins of the Peloponnesian War. It's fascinating. I've learned so much already. We talked of Aristotle today, too, knowing thyself, William continued, and he went on to explain the debate he and Professor Murray had shared on the beginnings of wisdom. I must say, William, you're quite remarkable in your intellect, the Duchess said, and William blushed. He was not arrogant in his learning, nor did he boast of it. There was still so much he did not know about the world, even as he was determined to learn all he could. I... I just remember things. And I find it so interesting to learn from the professor, William replied. The Duke and Duchess exchanged glances. If only Maximilian would follow your example, the Duke replied, sighing and shaking his head. But doesn't he want to learn? William asked. I think he sees little point in doing so. He knows he'll inherit my title, and it makes him lazy to the point of lethargy. He simply doesn't want to, and no amount of threats or cajoling can change his mind. I don't know. Perhaps Professor Murray can inspire something in him. Anyway, it's not Maximilian we've come to talk about, it's you, William, the Duke said, rolling his eyes, as though he felt an exasperation towards his son but there was a sense of sadness too, and William had always wondered if his godfather felt he had failed his son in some way and was trying to make up for the fact in his treatment of William. William was surprised. The Duke had always taken a keen interest in his education, and now William wondered what he was about to say. Would his godfather now tell him the time had come for other pursuits? William knew he could not remain forever without occupation even as he feared what such an occupation might entail. He was no gentleman, and despite his ambitions, William had always feared they would go unrealised. Are you displeased with me, sir? I've worked exceedingly hard. I hope I've not disappointed you, William said, glancing at anxiously at his mother. But the Duke only laughed. Disappointed? No, William, I couldn't ever be disappointed with you. Quite the opposite, in fact. I'm exceedingly proud of you, and I want you to know I've always had your best interests at heart. But you're growing up now, and you can't expect to remain forever under the tutelage of Professor Murray. I want to send you to London, William, along with a letter of recommendation and introduction. You can use it to open doors for yourself and pursue a career worthy of a gentleman. Law, perhaps. I'll pay for your lodgings and ensure you have the best possible start with an allowance, too, to continue until you find your feet. What do you say? The Duke asked. William's eyes grew wide with astonishment. He could hardly believe what his godfather was offering him. This was what he had always dreamed of, a chance to pursue a career and make something of himself and use all he had learned for the furtherance of good. A smile spread over his face and rose to his feet, holding out his hand to the Duke, who took it and smiled. Your Grace, I can't thank you enough. It's everything I've ever dreamed of. But is it true? Will you really send me to London? William exclaimed. In his mind, London was a city paved with gold, a land of opportunity in which anything was possible. William had never left Lancashire, but he had heard so much about London and the Empire from his reading and the professor's instruction. I will, William. I know it's what you want and I've always sought to help you. It's the least I can do. We'll make the arrangements in the coming weeks, and then you can leave for London at your convenience. I'll speak to Professor Murray about the matter, but for now we'll leave you and your mother to talk, the Duke said, as the Duchess rose to her feet. William was still grinning from ear to ear, and he thanked them both profusely, his hands trembling with excitement. After his godparents had left, William turned to his mother in astonishment. Can you believe it, mother? he said throwing his arms around her. She kissed him on both cheeks and smiled. You deserve this happiness, William. You can truly make something of yourself, she said, and William nodded. 
But London? Can you imagine it, Mother? I, but what about you? he said, imagining for a moment the sorrow of his mother at their parting. William had no siblings, and his mother was a widow. He would be leaving her behind, and a sudden sense of sadness overcame him. I'll be quite all right, William. You'll write to me, and I'll write to you, and when you're established, I'll visit you. You must pursue your dreams, William. Your godfather's given you a wonderful opportunity. Seize it and make it your own, she replied, her eyes filled with tears of joy. William could still not entirely believe his luck. He was the poor son of a seamstress, and now he had the chance of a very different life. I'll make you proud, mother, I promise, William said. His thoughts now turned to everything he had to look forward to. Chapter 3 London, England, 1815 Anton was waiting for her by the door of the tower. Would she make it? Letitia glanced behind her, knowing the baron was in pursuit. It was dark. She could hear an owl hooting in the trees above, a slither of moonlight piercing the darkness ahead. All of a sudden she stumbled, letting out a cry as a hand grabbed her. Let me go, she cried, struggling to free herself. My darling, it's, it's me, it's Anton. You're safe now, Anton said, and Lavinia gasped in relief. Tu veux, tu voulais, tu voudras, tu voudrais, veuille. Repeat after me, Anne. Tu veux, tu voulais, tu voudras, tu voudrais, veuille, Miss Guthrie said. And Anne Miller looked up from her book in surprise. I, oh, tu, vous, eh, tu veux less, she said. And her governess tutted in exasperation. Haven't you been listening to a word I've been saying? Haven't you been learning your tenses just now? I set you the exercise half an hour ago, Miss Guthrie said, as Anne glanced down at the open book in front of her. To the eye of the governess, Anne was studying a textbook of French grammar tables, but secreted in the pages was another book, a romance about a woman named Letitia, who was to marry a wicked baron, only to be rescued by a handsome knight and spirited off into the forest where they would live happily ever after. Anne allowed the offending text to slip onto her lap, and held up the textbook for her governess to see. I've been studying hard. It's just... I find it difficult, that's all, she replied. In truth, Anne found it boring, and she did not understand why she should spend her time learning French. She had no intention of ever visiting France, nor did she know anyone on whom she could practice what Miss Guthrie was attempting to teach her. Anne was far happier buried in the pages of a romantic novel or practicing music at the pianoforte. Music brought joy, whilst French brought only frustration and failure. Her governess gave her a withering look. It should come naturally to you, Anne. Haven't we studied the French language long enough? she asked. Miss Guthrie had been Anne's governess since she was ten years old. A formidable spinster, Miss Guthrie was prim and proper in all things. Her hair was always tied in a neat bun, her dress was trimmed with lace and she was never without a shawl. But at the age of nineteen, Anne was beginning to question why she needed a governess at all. Oh, but you know I've made no progress, Miss Guthrie. I'm a terrible student. I just want to play the pianoforte, Anne complained. She was an intelligent young woman, but easily bored, and French was the most boring subject of all. Miss Guthrie tutted again and shook her head. And that's the problem, Anne. You've always got your head in the clouds. You're always dreaming of some romance. But life isn't like that. No one's going to come and whisk you off like a princess in a fairy tale, the governess said, rising to her feet and closing her copy of the textbook with such force as to cause a cloud of dust to rise and make her sneeze. The lesson was taking place in the library of Anne's father's London townhouse. Anne was the daughter of the Earl of Blakely, and the family divided their time between London and the country. But Anne preferred the city. There was nothing to do in the countryside, and whilst she found her lessons with Miss Guthrie interminably dull, she could at least look forward to some excitement following them. But why can't it be? Why can't life be as exciting as in a book? Anne complained. She was always reading romantic novels and imagining herself as the heroine. Like Letitia, she longed to run away on some far-flung adventure, 
accompanied by a handsome prince, or any member of the aristocracy for that matter. She picked up the book from her lap, slipping it into her pocket as she rose from the table. That's enough for today. But please, Anne, don't idle your day away with your nose in one of those terrible penny novels. They're not good for your mind, Miss Guthrie said, and with a curt nod, she left the room. Anne smiled to herself. She could not imagine her governess enjoying the adventures of Letitia and Anton. She would be scandalised by them, even as Anne now retreated to a far corner of the library to finish reading Letitia's story. Anne was a vociferous reader, and by the time the luncheon gong sounded, the two characters had found their happily ever after. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. Car tu as pris aujourd'hui, Anne? Her father asked her at luncheon that afternoon. Anne looked up from her soup and shrugged. I didn't learn anything particularly, father. I don't see why I need to keep learning French. You're hardly going to expect me to marry a Frenchman, are you? She replied. The Earl rolled his eyes. Anne and her father had never seen eye to eye. The Earl had wanted a son, and whilst there was no doubt as to his love for his only daughter, his only child, he had never really sought to understand her. There was a considerable age difference between them, the Earl having married Anne's mother when he himself was quite past his prime, and now he looked old and tired. Anne tried her best to be a dutiful daughter, but there were times she felt an exasperation towards her father, one she could not easily disguise. But a young lady should speak French, her mother, the Countess, said. Anne glanced across the table at her mother. She was very pretty, and Anne had inherited her large brown eyes and sleek long auburn hair. But why, mother? What reason do I have to speak French? Anne persisted. To this question her mother did not have a ready answer and now the Earl summoned the footman to clear, calling for the second course to be brought. Anne's thoughts were now elsewhere, in the bookshop on Piccadilly, where she bought her penny novels, and to which she intended to pay a visit that very afternoon. Lady Flinch is coming to tea today, Anne. I hope you haven't forgotten, the Countess said as a Charlotte Russe was brought in for pudding. Anne had forgotten and she made no attempt to disguise her disappointment at the news of her godmother's intended visit. Lady Flincher was interested in one thing and one thing only, Anne's marital prospects. It was all she ever talked about, a symptom of having no children of her own. It was she who had planted the suggestion of a match for Anne with the son of a northern duke into Anne's mother's mind, and since that day the talk had been of nothing else. Oh, no. Anne exclaimed, sighing, even as her mother tutted. You make it sound like a chore. I understand she's written to the Duchess of Lancaster again. We can soon arrange for the two of you to meet. I quite like the idea of journeying north. They say Lancashire has fine moorland and beautiful vistas, the Countess said. Anne could summon little enthusiasm for fine vistas and moorland, and even less enthusiasm at the prospect of marriage to a man she had never met, nor had any desire to meet. The dukedom of Lancaster was a noble and ancient one, but Anne had heard of the reputation of the duke's son, a lazy, rakish sort, to whom the prospect of marriage made her shudder. I'm sure it's a marvellous place, but not the sort of place I want to spend the rest of my life, Anne replied. We've had this conversation before, Anne, on many occasions. It's high time you started thinking sensibly about your future. Do you want to become an old spinster living at your father's expense? the Earl demanded, tossing aside his napkin angrily. At the tender age of nineteen, Anne believed she still had some years to go before such an accolade could apply to her. Nevertheless, she knew her father was keen to see her married, and it seemed he was not particularly concerned as to whom she married, as long as she married someone. No, father, but nor do I want to be miserable and trapped in a marriage I detest. Anne replied, rising from her place as her mother sighed. Oh, Anne, you can't always live your life in the pages of a penny novel, she exclaimed, for her mother, too, knew of Anne's fondness for the written word, and it had caused some considerable exasperation on her part. I can try, mother, Anne replied. 
and before the argument could escalate, she had left the dining room and was hurrying towards the hallway. The scene at luncheon was typical. Anne often argued with her parents, though that was not to say there was an animosity between them. But what they wanted for her, out of love for her, and what she wanted for herself, out love for herself, were two different things, often at odds. Anne was not yet ready to marry, and certainly she was not about to marry a man she had never met, and whose reputation dubiously preceded him. Oh, my lady, I didn't realise you were going out, Anne's maid Helen said, as Anne was checking her bonnet in the hallway mirror. She was wearing a white dress that day, and the blue of the bonnet, and the blue of the shawl she had chosen to match it, looked exceedingly pretty. I'm going to the bookshop, Helen. You won't tell anyone, will you? she said, and her maid smiled. Helen could always be relied on to keep a secret. I won't say anything, my lady. I have to go out myself. Mrs Kilner hasn't got enough bread for the sandwiches for the tea for Lady Flincher. I said I'd go to the market and buy some, Helen said. Anne smiled, a sudden thought occurring to her. I'll buy the bread, she said. The maid looked at Anne in surprise. It was a surprising thing to say. Young ladies did not normally visit markets to buy loaves of bread for the cook. You, my lady? But you don't have to, although I've got so much to do. There are things to mend before the Charlton Lodge Ball, and I've not even got out half of your summer clothes, Helen said. But Anne shook her head. It'll be fun. I'll buy the bread. I'll be back before you know it, she said and before Helen could object, Anne had hurried out of the house, cautious not to be seen by anyone as she went. She was glad of the fresh air, and glad to be doing something other than conjugating French verbs. The day was bright and breezy, and the sky blue as she hurried below the shadow of St Paul's Cathedral towards Piccadilly. The streets were busy, and Anne enjoyed the sense of adventure she felt at being out unchaperoned and alone. I wonder if Mr. Pullman has another book with the Baron in it. He's bound to have another young lady in his sights, Anne thought to herself, for she had found the ending of the last novel somewhat disappointing. The Baron had simply disappeared, never to be seen again, and Anne was eager to know what had become of him. Anne was often given over to daydreaming. She liked to imagine herself amidst the pages of the books she read, talking to the characters, taking sides, and playing her part in the story. Her own life was so predictable, and she feared her parents intended to make it like the lives of so many of her contemporaries. Women like her followed a strict course through life. They learned French, they got married, they had children, and that was that. But Anne had always wanted something more, even as she was uncertain what that something more might be. Goodness me, my lady, back so soon, Mr Pullman, the proprietor of Pullman's book Emporium on Piccadilly, said as Anne walked through the familiar doors. The smell was always the same, like a library, comfortingly dusty, and the proprietor, too, never seemed to age. He smiled at Anne, who gazed around the shelves, knowing she had already read so much of what was there. I couldn't put it down, but I was disappointed in the Baron. He just disappeared. I wanted some kind of justice for poor Letitia. She was whisked off to the forest by Anton. But what about the Baron? He'll only do it to some other poor creature, Anne said, feeling indignant on behalf of the heroine to whom she would gladly have given advice and felt something of an affinity. The proprietor smiled. I believe the writer has a new volume, my lady, he said, and turning to the counter he signalled to a small boy to run for the book, which was produced momentarily. Anne took it smiling as she opened the pages to see the Baron's name attached to a new heroine, this time with the name of Matilda. Oh, how wonderful! I'll take it. There's no need to wrap it. I'll start it straight away when I get home, she exclaimed, taking out her purse and handing Mr Pullman the two-penny price. He smiled at her and thanked her. I've never known a young lady read so vociferously, he said, and Anne blushed. My parents don't approve of it, of course, and my governess would have me reading French textbooks and Latin primers, but I love to imagine myself in the pages of such books. It's a delight, she said, 
and Mr. Pullman nodded. I understand, my lady. I hope you enjoy the book, he said, and bidding her good day, he opened the door for her, and Anne stepped out into the hustle and bustle of Piccadilly. The market she intended to visit was not far from her father's townhouse, held on the square in front of St. Paul's Cathedral. Anne liked to visit it, wending her way between the stalls and examining the goods for sale. Usually she was accompanied by Helen, but now she was on her own, and she paused to look at silk scarves, wooden carvings, ornaments and jewellery, the stalls all laid out to tempt and draw the eye. Something for the lady? A pair of gloves, perhaps, or a silk purse, perhaps? One of the stallholders said, offering up an ugly-looking creation to Anne, who shook her head. It reminded her of the saying about a sow's ear, and she walked on, looking for a bakery stall. One loaf should be enough. I doubt Lady Flintshire will eat a great number of sandwiches, she thought to herself. And spying a bakery stall below the steps of the cathedral, she hurried towards it. A loaf of bread, miss? Only the finest bread baked this very day, the stallholder said, holding out a loaf. Anne nodded. Yes, one loaf, please. How much is it? A penny, she said, but the stallholder shook his head. A penny for such quality? I think not. A shilling, miss, he replied, and Anne looked at him in astonishment. A shilling for a loaf of bread? she exclaimed, even as the stallholder nodded. A shilling, miss, that's what it's worth. If you don't like it, you don't have to take it, he replied. Anne was indignant, but it was the only loaf left. She rummaged in her purse, hoping she could gather together enough coins to make a shilling. She wondered what Helen would have done in her place. Surely a shilling was far too much, and if she had spent the housekeeping money in such a way, the cook might have accused her of stealing. She did not want to get Helen into trouble, and she suddenly felt somewhat out of her depth. But as she was about to hand over the money, a voice behind her interrupted. Excuse me, you're charging the young lady here a shilling for a loaf of bread, but I saw you selling them for a few pennies earlier on. And turning, Anne was surprised to find a young man coming to her rescue. Chapter 4 There now, you're all ready, William's mother said, straightening his new overcoat and looking him up and down with satisfaction. They were standing outside Burnley Abbey, and a carriage was waiting to take William to London. The Duke and Duchess were standing close by, and the carriage driver had strapped William's trunk to the back of the carriage. His mother had tears in her eyes, and William was wondering if he was doing the right thing. He wanted desperately to make a name for himself and to prove himself worthy of the trust his godfather had placed in him. But the thought of leaving everything familiar behind him was daunting, and now he took a deep breath, eager to know he was doing the right thing. I'll write to you, mother, I promise, and I hope I can make you proud, William said, embracing his mother, who began to sob. The Duchess stepped forward and put her arm around her. Come now, Teresa. He needs to be on his way, she said. The Duke, too, stepped forward, holding out his hand to William and smiling. You've lodgings at the Spaniards Inn. It's a respectable sort of place. I've stayed there before. Spare no expense in settling yourself in. Charge anything you need to me, including new clothes. I want you to have every advantage of a gentleman, the Duke said. He had already paid for William's new overcoat and a trunk and other items necessary for the journey. William was excited but daunted too, and the thought of leaving his mother pained him terribly. You've been so very good to me, sir. I promise I'll do all I can to live up to your expectations of me, William said. The Duke shook his by the hand. I know you will, William. You always have done. And don't worry about your mother. We'll take good care of her, I promise, he said. The Duchess, too, bid William goodbye, and he kissed his mother promising he would write to her as soon as he arrived in London. Climbing into the carriage, William could still hardly believe he was setting off for London with such possibility and opportunity before him. I'm so proud of you, William, and your father would have been too, his mother said. William was glad to hear these words, and he kissed his mother again, before climbing into the carriage and pulling down the window to wave to them. Goodbye and thank you, 
he called out, as the carriage driver geed on the horses, and the carriage pulled away. As they passed along the front of the house, William could see Maximilian standing at the library window watching his departure. He nodded to him, but Maximilian's expression was blank, and William knew his godfather's heir would not be sorry to see the back of him. Nor I of him, William thought to himself. But now was not the time to dwell on the past, or to have regrets about what had been. William's future lay ahead, and he could not have been more excited as to the prospect. The bells of St Paul's Cathedral were ringing out a full peal as the carriage pulled up outside the Spaniards' Inn. William had spent the past hour or so gazing out of the carriage window, marvelling at the unfolding sights of the city around him. They had passed along grand avenues and bustling streets, past the great buildings of state and along the river, finally arriving in the shadow of the cathedral. The journey had taken several days, but at last William was in London, and a world of opportunity lay before him. He had grown up on the country estate of the Duke of Lancaster, and the hustle and bustle of the city was quite something to behold. Everywhere he looked, William saw people, and he found himself amidst a great market, where sellers plied for trade, their shouts echoing as the bells rang out above. Hot chestnuts roasted fresh! One man was calling out, whilst others sold milk, bread, cakes, meat and fish. Sprats, eels, cockles and whelks, a woman was shouting, and as William clambered down from the carriage, several children came running up to him. Penny to carry your trunk, sir, penny to carry your trunk, they cried out in a chorus of unison. The carriage driver shooed them away, even as William felt quite pleased to be addressed as sir. Here in London he could be the man he had always dreamed of being a gentleman with good prospects and treated with respect. He was no longer the son of a seamstress, but the sort of man to be called Sir, and in his new clothes, and with his letter of recommendation in his coat pocket, William felt proud of himself and all he had worked so hard to achieve. Is this the inn? William asked, looking up at the establishment before him, a fine-looking coaching house, with a painted sign and gable ends. It is, sir. His grace always stays here when he comes to London, the carriage driver said. William thanked him, and wishing him a safe journey back to Lancashire, who took up his cases and stepped through the door of the inn, finding himself in a taproom, where a long counter ran along one side, and several respectable-looking gentlemen sat dining at a table at the far end. Can I help you, young sir? A man behind the counter, whom William assumed to be the landlord, said. He was a large man with a ruddy face and beard but with kindly expression, and William nodded, stepping forward and clearing his throat. My name's William Baker. I believe I've rooms here for the coming weeks at the expense of the Duke of Lancaster, he said, and the landlord nodded. I thought you might be the young man I'm expecting. Yes, I've got your room already, and you're to dine here too. Will you see your room now? he asked. It was just after midday and William was keen to step out into the city immediately, but he agreed to see his room, and a kitchen boy was called to carry his trunk. How easily that could have been me, he thought to himself as the kitchen boy followed the landlord up the stairs. The room, or rooms, for there was a sitting room too, were well appointed and comfortably furnished. They looked out over the river, and William nodded, looking around him approvingly at what would be his home for the coming months. Whatever you need, just ask. I'll be only too pleased to help you, the landlord said, as the kitchen boy put down William's trunk. William's godfather had told him to be generous in his thanks to those who served him, and he handed the boy a penny, and the landlord a shilling. Thank you, William replied, glad to have arrived in London, and found everything as the Duke had promised. Having changed out of his travelling clothes, William stepped out of the inn and into the hustle and bustle of the market. The bells of St Paul's were still ringing out their merry peal, and William stepped into the cathedral, marvelling at the cavernous interior, with its dome, pillars and marbled floor. The choir was practising for evensong, and William sat for a while to listen to them, caught up in the beauty of the music, and feeling astonished at all he had already seen and experienced. I can hardly believe I'm here. What marvels lie in store! 
he thought to himself, watching as the choir filed out along the nave. William had promised to write to his mother as soon as he arrived in London, but he also wanted to send her something, a gift to celebrate his arrival. Stepping out of the cathedral, he stood on the steps, surveying the myriad of stalls laid out below. William had never seen so many things for sale, and he smiled to himself at the thought of having so much to choose from. His mother would be amazed if only she could see what he himself was seeing now. Silks and scarves, embroidered or plain, something for a lady, for a suitor. The finest Persian silks, a woman called out as William passed a stall piled high with fabrics in every colour and shade imaginable. Fresh milk, cream, butter and cheese, the finest in all of London, another woman called out. William was caught up in the sights, sounds and smells of the market. He bought a hot meat pie from a stall and paused to examine another selling leather-bound notebooks and fine quills and ink. Something to write your diary with, sir. You could be the next Mr. Peeps, the proprietor said, holding out a black-bound notebook. Thank you, but no, William said, gazing around him and feeling overawed by the sight of so many things for sale. The crowds jostled, and William knew he had to take care against pickpockets. His godfather had warned him as much, and now he checked his lapels, fearful he might already have succumbed to a theft. But his money was still there, and having eaten the pie, mutton in a thick gravy, William moved on along the stalls, eager to find something his mother would like. A bracelet, sir, a necklace, something for a lady, is it? A woman at a jewellery stall said. The items were gaudy and not to William's taste. Besides, he had never seen his mother wear jewellery. It was not something she had ever been able to afford, and William shook his head, still looking around him, when an altercation at a bakery stall caught his attention. A shilling for a loaf of bread? That's ridiculous. You can't possibly expect anyone to pay that. A shrill voice, indignant with rage, exclaimed. William looked across with interest as a tall, elegant young lady wearing a yellow dress and with a blue shawl wrapped around her shoulders remonstrated with the baker. She was exceedingly pretty, with soft, dimpled cheeks and blonde hair tied up in a bun underneath a blue bonnet to match her shawl. The stallholder was holding the loaf of bread out to her with an imploring look on his face. But I've got a family to feed. It's a shilling. A woman like you in fancy clothes and bonnet can afford a shilling for a loaf of bread, he replied with an angry look on his face. But they say it's mainly plaster of Paris in those loaves. Chalk dust and salt, she exclaimed. The baker glared at her. This is the finest bread between here and Greenwich. I was up at four o'clock this morning baking it. It's a shilling and that's final, he said. William stepped forward to intervene. A loaf of bread was not worth a shilling, even if it had been baked by the regent's own baker himself. Excuse me, you're charging the young lady here a shilling for a loaf of bread. But I saw you selling them for a few pennies earlier on, William said. He had not seen anything of the sort, but he knew the price of bread, and the loaf the baker was holding was worth a few pennies at most. The woman turned to him and smiled. Oh, is that so? she said, turning back to the baker with an angry look on her face. The baker too looked perturbed, and he faltered, glaring angrily at William who raised his eyebrows, not willing to allow the man the upper hand. A few pennies, that's all it's worth. Or should we ask the customs and excise officers to see what's in your bags of flour? Chalk dust, is it? William asked. The finest wheat, the baker retorted, and William laughed. It would have to be to charge a shilling for a loaf, woven with golden thread too, he said. The baker knew he was beaten, and the young woman held out two pennies as he handed the loaf over to her. Thank you, the woman said, as they turned away from the stall. William blushed, pulling out a handkerchief to mop his brow. He had not intended to step in, but he had seen she was in difficulty and had wanted to help. He shouldn't have tried to sell you a loaf of bread at such an extortionate price. A shilling? You could buy a dozen loaves and still have change, William replied. The woman smiled at him. I must confess, I'm not used to buying bread. I'm not used to buying anything. But thank you. 
You've been most kind. I shouldn't keep you any longer, she said. William would gladly have been kept in her company for longer, but he was unsure of what to say in order to continue the conversation. He found her to be a delightful creature, and so very different from the sort of women he had known in Lancashire. She was beautiful, and had an air about her he found endearing. How glad he was to have helped her. It's quite all right. I've only just arrived in London. I don't yet know my way around, he said. Again, the woman smiled. Where have you come from? she asked. From Lancashire. I'm here to secure employment, perhaps with a legal firm, he said. The woman looked at him as though she did not really know anything about employment or legal firms. William wondered who she was and realised he had not yet introduced himself and could hardly expect her to introduce herself to him. Then I wish you well, Lancashire. How interesting, she said, nodding to him. I'm William Baker, William said, holding out his hand. Anne Miller, she said, and it was she who now held out her hand for William to take. William smiled at her, taking her hand in his and wondering again how to prolong the conversation. She was a curious creature, and he wondered who she was. A lady's maid, perhaps, though her naivety at the baker's stall suggested she herself might be a lady of some standing. But if she was, why was she buying her own bread? A pleasure to meet you, he replied. Likewise. But I really should be going. I'm grateful to you, though I wonder if the bread will prove worth the struggle. Well, good day to you, she said, and nodding to William, she hurried off into the crowd. William watched her go, filled with curiosity as to who she was and where she had come from. Turning, he caught the gaze of the baker, who scowled at him. She was going to pay it too, he said, and spat on the cobblestones. I'm only glad she didn't, William replied, as now he returned to his search for a gift for his mother. He settled on a woollen shawl, one his mother could wrap around herself during the long winter months when snow lay on the ground back home in Lancashire, and feeling pleased with his purchase, William returned to the Spaniard's Inn. But as he pushed his way through the crowds, where shouts and cries filled the air and the peal of the cathedral bells rang out, William could not help but think of his encounter with Anne and wondered if there might be a way of discovering more about her. Chapter 5 He'll be all right, Teresa. I know he will, Miriam said, as they stood watching William's carriage drive away. Teresa turned to her and nodded, giving Miriam a weak smile. There were tears in her eyes, and Miriam could well imagine the pain Teresa must be feeling at seeing her only son set out into the world on this new adventure. I'll miss him, but I'm so grateful to you both for what you've done for him. I really am she said, and Miriam and Ralph glanced at one another. Well, it was the least we could do, Ralph replied. They said goodbye to Teresa, and now Ralph suggested they might walk together through the parkland. It was a beautiful day, and everywhere Miriam looked, new life was emerging in the gardens, soon to be filled with budding blooms and blossom. He was certainly pleased to go, but I know he'll miss Teresa too, Miriam said as she and Ralph walked hand in hand through the woodland surrounding Burnley Abbey. Ralph smiled. Miriam knew he enjoyed helping his nephew, the nephew who did not know Ralph was his uncle. It gave Ralph pleasure to do so, and he had vowed to always honour his brother's legacy in this way. A letter of introduction and an allowance was but a small thing, but it had clearly meant so much to the one who had received it. I'm glad I could help him. It's what Max would have wanted, I know it, Ralph replied. Even after twenty years, Miriam knew how much Ralph missed his brother. He was never meant to be the Duke of Lancaster. The inheritance had come on him unexpectedly and under such tragic circumstances. Ralph often spoke of his brother, and Miriam knew he saw his brother in William and wanted to do all he could to help him. I'm sure he'll work just as hard in London as he did here with Professor Murray, Miriam said for she was always astonished at William's learning, and all he had already achieved in the first flush of manhood. I've no doubt about it. That's why I wanted to send him to London. He'll certainly make more of it than Maximilian would do. 
Ralph replied, shaking his head. Miriam sighed. William was everything their own son was not. She despaired of Maximilian at times. He did nothing to his own benefit and lived only in the shadow of his inheritance, always taking it for granted. He was lax in his studies, unmotivated and uncaring when it came to diligence in those things he ought to be learning. His days were spent in idle pursuits, or worse, nothingness. He was idle and would stay in bed until luncheon, rising only to eat, before spending the afternoon and evening indulging in vain pleasures. What are we to do about Maximilian, Ralph? It was possible to dismiss his idleness as growing pains before, but not any longer. If he doesn't make an effort soon, well, he'll never amount to anything more than his inheritance, Miriam said, despairing of her son, in contrast to William. But that's his problem, isn't it? William seizes the opportunities afforded him. He wants to better himself from his lowly position. Maximilian looks down on William from the lofty heights. He doesn't need to soar any higher, Ralph replied. They had reached the edge of the woodland now, and before them lay the meadows, replete with early spring flowers, blowing gently in the breeze. Burnley Abbey lay behind, its sandstone walls catching the sunlight with a pleasant glow. It had been Miriam's home for twenty years. She loved the abbey and all the memories it held. Like Ralph, she would not change a moment they had spent together, and looking back she could only feel glad as to how the events surrounding William's birth had played out. She and Ralph still visited Briar Heights on occasion, the house in which the Duke had hidden with Teresa in the days of her pregnancy. It was part of the estate now, bought to preserve its wild and lonely setting, the perfect place for the solitude they so often craved. I'm sure he'll find his place. Perhaps London would be good for him too, Miriam ventured, though she could not imagine her son jumping at the opportunity, as William had done. Ralph shook his head. We'll see. Come now, let's walk past the graves. I'd like to visit my brothers, Ralph said. Miriam nodded. They often visited the family graves and Miriam would cut flowers to lay there in memory of her brother-in-law and more recently, the Dowager Duchess, Ralph's mother. She had died five years previously and was buried alongside the son she had mourned every day since his passing. And tell him about William's good fortune? Miriam asked, as they walked arm in arm towards the family burial plot in the churchyard of St. James's, the church of the estate. The graves were well tended, and the headstone, though worn, still clearly displayed the lettering of twenty years previously. Maximilian Oakley, Vyeth, Duke of Lancaster, 1774-1794. Rest in peace, it read, and Miriam and Ralph now paused before the grave their heads bowed in reverent silence. I wonder what he'd be like if he was here now, twenty years later, Ralph said, turning to Miriam, who smiled. Things would be very different for us all. We wouldn't be married for a start, she said, and her husband nodded. I know that. It's just one can't help wondering, that's all, he said, but Miriam shook her head. Don't start going down rabbit holes, Ralph. What if this? What if that? It doesn't help anyone, I don't think. We exist as we are, and we live with what we have. Your brother died, you remained. That's all there is to it. Who are we to ask why? She said, and Ralph sighed. You're right. I'm just... imagining what isn't. I don't mean it, though. I wouldn't change things. You know I wouldn't, he said, and Miriam slipped her hand into his. I know you wouldn't. We've all learned to live with the way things are. That's all there is to it, she said. They walked away from the graves, taking the path back towards the abbey. The gardens had grown and matured considerably in the years since their marriage, and they paused amidst the rose bushes, where buds were forming, soon to bloom and burst forth with their scent. You've been happy, haven't you? Ralph said, turning to Miriam, who smiled. You know I have. What's brought this on, Ralph? You've been brooding all day. Is it because William's gone away? Miriam said, taking his hand in hers. Oh, I'm being foolish, Miriam. I want to do what's right for William. And I know I have. But I worry about Maximilian, too. 
we always knew the question of inheritance would come. There's the barony for William, and the dukedom for our son. Not that William knows anything about it. It just feels, well, as though we've reached the point where the vase shatters. We've got to tell them the truth, haven't we? He said, shaking his head. Twenty years previously, Miriam's marriage to Ralph had saved her own father from financial ruin. The Duke had bought Miriam's father's barony and intended it for William. When her father had died, Ralph had taken the title for himself, intending to pass it to William when the time came. That time had come, but to tell the truth would mean the shattering of so many untruths, and neither Ralph nor Miriam nor Teresa were ready for that. Let him establish himself in London, Ralph. Don't be hasty. And as for Maximilian, well, perhaps seeing William make something of himself might spur him into action. Come now, we should find him. He's been on his own all morning, Miriam said, beckoning Ralph to follow her. A great deal had changed at Burnley Abbey over the years. Servants had come and gone, and the old guard, under the housekeeper Mrs Mason, had largely been replaced. All except Mr Gregson, the butler who appeared ageless as he opened the door for them, bowing curtly, as a footman stood waiting to take their coats. Is Maximilian in the library, Gregson? Miriam asked, and the butler nodded. Yes, my lady, but I don't think he's reading, the butler said, clearing his throat and looking disapproving. What use is there in reading when one can idle away one's time doing nothing? Ralph said with a withering tone as he marched across the hallway. Miriam followed, casting a glance back at the butler, who remained standing stiffly at the door. Even the servants are talking about Maximilian, she whispered, catching Ralph up as he strode towards the library door. The library at Burnley Abbey was impressive, and the Duke often received requests for access from scholars and interested readers. Miriam had tried to interest her son in learning, and Professor Murray had been stalwart in his attempts to impart an interest in study to his charge, but all to no avail. Yes, and it has to stop. I won't allow him to become a laughingstock, Ralph said as they reached the library door. From inside, Miriam heard the odd sound of a dull thud, and then another, and another. Whatever could he be doing? she asked, as Ralph sighed. I don't know, but I think we're about to see, he said, and opening the door, they entered the library. To Miriam's astonishment, and by the look on his face, Ralph's obvious anger, they found their son engaged in a game of quoits, tossing the rings over stacks of books arranged at intervals on the library floor. At that moment, he was balanced precariously on a Queen Anne chair, leaning forward, and about to toss a quoit towards the furthest pile. Maximilian, come down from there, Miriam exclaimed, as their son turned to greet them. I'm practising my aim, mother, he replied, and he tossed the quoit with some inaccuracy so as to land it, not on the pile of books, but on the library table, where it sent a pile of periodicals scattering left to right. What's the meaning of this, Maximilian? How dare you use my library for such idle pursuits, Ralph exclaimed, but their son only rolled his eyes and climbed wearily down from the chair. Really, father, it'll be my library one day. Why won't you let me have a little fun? I've been terribly bored today. I thought I could liven things up a little, he said, grinning, as he proceeded to pick up the discarded quoits lying across the floor. But these are valuable books, Maximilian. Haven't you got a care for anything? Look at all these piles. I'm sure you don't even know which shelves you've taken them from, do you? Ralph said, tutting and shaking his head. I took some from over there, some from here. Besides, does it really matter if botany gets mixed up with agriculture? No one reads any of these books anyway, the boy said as he began to replace the books on the shelves at random. But, oh, what's the point in trying to talk to you, Maximilian? You don't care, do you? You don't listen, Ralph said, raising his hands in indignant exasperation. Miriam sighed. She knew Ralph despaired of their son but Maximilian did nothing to help himself. He lived in his own world of idleness, and it was not surprising to find himself engaged in such a pursuit. He had few friends, and those he did have were as idle as he. Maximilian, why don't you try reading some of these books? You might learn something from them, 
Hasn't Professor Murray encouraged you to do so? You've got to start taking some responsibility now you're grown up. Thinking of what a future wife would say if she saw you behaving in this way, Miriam said. Professor Murray had been engaged as tutor to their son for several years, but in that time Maximilian had made little progress with his studies, and the professor had admitted to being somewhat frustrated by the future duke's lack of effort. He doesn't care anything for history, and his command of French is non-existent, Professor Murray had told Miriam when she had asked him for a report on her son's progress. But it was not only Professor Murray's opinion Miriam feared for. She had been approached by a well-to-do woman in the South, a Lady Muriel Flincher, who had a goddaughter of marrying age. There was the prospect of an introduction, and Miriam hoped it might prove a possibility for Maximilian to make a match. It could be the only way to save his reputation, even as the thought of an arranged marriage was far from ideal, at least in Miriam's eyes. He might encourage it, mother, but I'm not interested in doing so. Why would I want to read any of these books? Can't I use them to practice my quoit throwing instead? And as for a future wife, well, she can throw quoits too for all I care, Maximilian said, scowling at Miriam, who sighed. No, you can't, Ralph exclaimed, and he grabbed hold of the boy's arm and pulled him roughly towards him. Miriam hated to see them fight, but she knew how disappointed our Alf was in their son, the son he had hoped would prove a worthy heir. What's wrong, father? Can't I have a little fun? I'm stuck here all the time. There's no excitement, none at all, Maximilian complained as Ralph clasped him by the shoulders. Why can't you be more like William? he demanded with an exasperated tone in his voice. Miriam knew this was the wrong thing to say. Maximilian hated to be compared to William. The two boys had played together when they were young, but Maximilian had treated William terribly, lording it over him, and telling William he was only the son of a seamstress and destined to be nothing more than a bellboy or a labourer. William had retorted by calling Maximilian stupid, and the two boys had barely spoken since. Because I've no desire to be anything like the son of a pensioned off maid. He's just a commoner, father. I don't understand what either of you see in him. He might be your godson. But he's nothing to me, their son said, rolling his eyes. Ralph gritted his teeth, but Miriam raised her eyebrows warningly. There was no reason why Maximilian should think any differently about William than precisely what he had said. He did not know they were cousins, nor did he know of William's claim to the title and dukedom. William, too, knew nothing of their connection, and it must have seemed strange to him, too, to be godson to a duke and duchess. You idle your days away, Maximilian. You do nothing to better yourself or increase your knowledge. The servants are talking about you, others are talking about you. You make me embarrassed, Ralph said. Miriam was glad he had not said ashamed, but she knew her husband was thinking just that. The Duke was ashamed of his son, and the more he grew into a man, the more readily he was compared to William. Maximilian's response was rebellion and it was a rebellion Miriam feared the consequences of. And why would I care about that, father? Aren't I your heir, whatever anyone else says? I'm bored, and I don't care about Professor Murray's Greek poems, or being like that bellboy you're always lavishing your attentions on. Has he gone yet? I don't know what you see him. But whatever it is, I don't care to share in it. I won't be like him, because I don't want to be, Maximilian said. And with that, he stormed out of the library, slamming the door so violently behind him as to cause several of the piles of books to topple over. Miriam shook her head, stooping to pick them up, whilst Ralph muttered under his breath. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of him, he said with a frustrated tone. I know, Ralph, but we must make allowances, Miriam replied, even as she felt unsure what either of them could do, and wishing their own son could be more like Teresa's. Chapter 6 William was in high spirits as he returned to the Spaniards' Inn. He was pleased with the present he had bought for his mother, and glad to have been of assistance to the young lady whose image was imprinted on his mind. She was ever so beautiful, he thought to himself, smiling at the thought of the baker's indignance. A shilling for a loaf of bread was extortionate, and William was glad he had intervened to prevent her from falling into such a deception. 
but he felt a fool for not having pursued the acquaintance further. She had been charming, pretty, and intriguing. But in a city like this, how would I ever find her again? William asked himself, fearing he had missed his chance. The inn was busy, and William pushed his way forward to the counter, signalling for the innkeeper, who came over to him with a smile on his face. I trust you didn't get lost in the big city, sir, he said, and William shook his head. I manage quite well, I think, he replied, for his first foray alone had resulted in success. Something to eat, perhaps. There was a man asking after you earlier. He gave no name, the landlord said. William was surprised. He knew no one in London. That was the purpose of his godfather's letter of introduction. But before he could reply, a voice behind him spoke. Ah, young man, I understand you've just arrived in London. Might I buy you a drink? the man said. And William turned in surprise to find an older man, well-dressed with white hair, and a smile on his face holding out his hand. William had never seen him before in his life, and he was somewhat taken aback by the fact of the man's familiarity. I... forgive me, sir. I believe you may be mistaking me for someone else, William said, but the man shook his head. William Baker, or am I mistaken? he asked. Now William really was taken aback, and he stared at the man in astonishment. That's right. I'm William Baker, but I'm afraid I don't know you, and if I should, I can only apologise, he said. The man smiled. Forgive me, William. My name's Kirkpatrick, Digby Kirkpatrick, the man said. William was still none the wiser, but he knew it was polite to shake the man's hand, even as the name was unfamiliar. He'd never heard of anyone called Digby Kirkpatrick. I see. And you're visiting London, are you, sir? William asked, as his new companion now signalled the landlord to bring them drinks and steered William towards a table at the far end of the taproom. He seemed to have a permanent smile on his face and looked at William with a familiarity William could not return. He was trying desperately to think of where he might have seen the man before and why he should now be in the very inn where William himself was staying. I reside permanently in the capital, but forgive me. Now we're sitting down and can enjoy some refreshment. Let me explain a little about myself, the man said, as the landlord came over with their drinks. I feel I owe you an apology, sir, for not knowing who you are, William said, for he was feeling decidedly rude at continuing to draw a blank as to the man's identity. There's really no reason you should know me. I'm an associate of Professor Murray, your dear old tutor. I knew you were coming to London and I thought I'd look you up. After a life spent in rural Lancashire, a big city like this could feel rather daunting. I've taken it on myself to be your guide and advisor whilst you're here. I place myself entirely at your disposal, the man said, affecting a flourish of his hand as he gave a curt bow while still seated. A sense of relief came over William, as now he realised the connection between them. Professor Murray had associates all over the country, and he was forever writing letters to them. Digby Kirkpatrick was clearly one such associate, and William would be only too glad to allow the gentleman to do as he had offered. London was daunting, and if William was to find his feet, he would need all the help he could get. That's very kind of you, sir, William said, but the man shook his head. Nonsense, and you must call me Digby. I'm only too happy to help you. Have you got your letter of recommendation? he asked, and William nodded. The man seemed awfully well informed, but William knew Professor Murray had been excited at the prospect of William's journey to London, and it had been awfully kind of him to inform his acquaintance and ask him to help. He took out the letter from his godfather, unfolding it to reveal the crest and seal of the Duke of Lancaster. Digby took it, nodding his head as he read through it. Yes, yes, this will do very well. You'll find yourself with introductions to every firm in London with this, he said, and William smiled. My godfather was very kind. He suggested I come to London, and he made all the arrangements for me too. I'm to begin searching an apprenticeship, perhaps with a firm of lawyers or brokers, William replied. He felt proud of his godfather's expectation and was determined to live up to it. Your godfather, yes, the Duke of Lancaster? 
What an auspicious connection for a young man. You've been very fortunate, Digby said, smiling at William as he handed back the folded letter. William placed it safely in his pocket, and nodding he took a sip of his drink, a pale ale with a pleasant aftertaste. He's always shown a considerable interest in my welfare. It's because of him I found myself under the tutelage of Professor Murray. I might have gone to Oxford or Cambridge. But I don't seek a position in the church, not now at least, and London seemed to offer far better prospects, William said, smiling at Digby, who nodded. No, you'd be wasted in the church, unless they made you archbishop immediately. But a man determined to achieve his own success can make his fortune here in the Golden Mile, where the streets are paved with gold, Digby said, raising his glass in a toast. There was an eccentricity to him, one William found endearing. He reminded William of Professor Murray himself, and William was only too glad to accept Digby's company for the evening. But what brought you to London? William asked, for he realised he had spoken a great deal about himself, but knew very little about the Professor's friend. Oh, I've been here, some twenty years now. I'm a tutor myself though my charge is growing up, and I fear I won't be of use to him much longer. That's why I feel it is my duty to assist you, William. I can be of some service to you, I'm sure. If you need a guide, I'm he. If you need social invitations, I have modest connections. If you require advice or information, I can furnish you with it in abundance. Use me as you will, he said. And again he made a flourish with his hand and gave a curt bow. William smiled, but he was grateful, and the two of them now toasted the beginnings of a fruitful relationship. To Professor Murray, William said, raising his glass. To dear old Willibrand, we were at Oxford together. But he was always far cleverer than I, Digby said, shaking his head and laughing. I'm sure you both have your respective talents. But tell me, if I am to ask for your advice, where might I inquire first in my search for an apprenticeship? William asked. He knew this was to be his first challenge. Now he had arrived in London and found his lodgings. The letter in his pocket was a key. His godfather had described it in just those terms. A key to unlock doors they would bar to you, William. But with my name to your association, you'll find yourself made welcome and given opportunity, the Duke had said, as he had pressed the letter of recommendation into William's hands. Ah, well, any number of places. But this is the Golden Mile, William. In the shadow of St Paul's you'll find brokers and lawyers in abundance. We could try taverners or brookfields if bookkeeping and finance are you intention, or Smythes and Roberts if you favour law. I'll accompany you if you wish me to. I know all the firms, Digby said, and William could hardly believe the good fortune he had stumbled on. I wouldn't want to take up too much of your time, sir, William said for he feared he was making an imposition of himself, but Digby waved his hand dismissively. Not at all, not at all. I'm delighted to meet you and make your acquaintance. My only charges amount to nothing. They're a considerable disappointment, in fact. But in you, I see potential and the possibility of great things. Let me help you, William, for I wish for nothing more than to see you succeed, Digby replied. William was flattered by the man's remarks and grateful to Professor Murray for making their introduction. He felt certain Digby would be a useful companion in the coming days and weeks, and now they toasted their hope for success. I wonder, too, if, well, you might help me with introductions of a more personal nature, William said, for having drank several tankards of pale ale, he was becoming somewhat familiar with his new companion. Digby smiled. A personal nature? Do you mean young ladies? he asked, and William blushed, finding his thoughts unexpectedly turned to Anne. But he did not only mean young ladies, but acquaintances in general. William wanted to make friends. He had struggled to do so in Lancashire. The village boys considered him a toff, a cut above the rest because of his aristocratic connections, whilst the likes of Maximilian and other aristocratic youngsters looked down on him for not being like them at birth. William was neither one nor the other, and he had found solace in books, rather than the companionship of others. I mean, friends, that's all. I want to make friends with others, 
and London seems the perfect place to do so, don't you think? William replied. And haven't you already made a friend in me? Digby asked. William nodded, smiling at his new companion and raising his tankard of ale. I certainly have, and I'm very grateful too, he replied. Digby clinked his own tankard to William's in a toast. I'll certainly make some introductions for you, not just in the world of business. You'll soon find yourself well established, and I'm sure you'll make your mother very proud, he said. You know so much about me. Professor Murray must have told you a great deal, William said, for he was still surprised as to Digby's interest in him and all the things he knew about him from just the professor's correspondence. I've made it my business to know you, William. You're a fine young man, or so the professor tells me. I know I can help you, and I'll only be glad to do so, Digby replied. They sat a while longer, and William told his new friend all about his life in Lancashire before coming to London. Digby seemed particularly interested in the Duke and Duchess, and William was curious as to why he should wish to know so much about two distant aristocrats. They have a son, Maximilian, but he and I, well, we've never really got on, William admitted. I see, and did you know the Dowager at all? Digby asked, pushing another drink towards William, who was now feeling decidedly light-headed. A little, yes. She was always kind to my mother. But she died several years ago, William replied. And your mother? She was a maid at the Abbey, was she? Digby asked. William was now quite taken aback. Professor Murray had surely not communicated such detail, even in a thorough letter concerning William's own biography. How did you know that? he asked, and Digby smiled. Oh, forgive me. I spent some time in Lancashire, it was a long time ago, but I assumed as much, your mother having a cottage on the estate, he said, and William nodded. The cottages were for workers and his mother had been given hers for service in the house as a maid, many years previously, before William was even born. Ah, I see, so, you know Burnley Abbey a little? he asked, feeling a little confused, and Digby nodded. Oh, yes, I know it really quite well, and I've made it my business to continue to know it over the years. A fine house indeed, Digby replied. William was glad to find they had so much in common. He loved the Abbey and the two of them talked long into the night, sharing stories, as William told Digby all about himself. I'm really so very glad to have met you, sir, he said, as later on he bid his new friend and companion good night. As am I, William, as am I. I'll call on you in the morning, and we can begin the search for your new employment, Digby said, and with a final flourish and bow, he bid William good night. You've certainly made a friend in your new companion, the landlord said, as he showed William up to bed by the light of an oil lamp. And I'm glad of it, William replied, for he felt certain Digby would be an asset in his search for a job, and in his desire to become a gentleman. Chapter 7 There we are, Mrs Kilner, one loaf of bread, Anne said holding out the loaf she had bought at the market with a look of pride on her face. The cook looked at her in bemusement. I wasn't expecting you to come down here, my lady. Is it just the one loaf? she asked as the two kitchen maids giggled with one another in the corner. Anne was not a frequent visitor to the kitchens, but she did not understand what she had done wrong, nor why the cook was not showering her with praise for bringing the loaf of bread to her. It was not every day Anne went to the market to buy bread, if ever, even as she now realised she should have given the loaf to Helen. Oh, Helen went upstairs. I've brought it down for her. But it's just some sandwiches, isn't it, for Lady Flincher and my mother? Boudoir sandwiches don't require much bread, surely. We'd never fit into our corsets otherwise, Anne said, causing the two kitchen maids to giggle uncontrollably. The cook glared at them, turning to Anne with a forced smile on her face. My lady, it's not just the boudoir sandwiches I'm making with the bread, which I usually get from Mr Stamper on the corner of Poultry Street, but I've got the servant's tea to make too. The footmen like a wedge of bread and dripping on the side, and the bellboys all have sandwiches too. Never mind, I'm sure I can make it stretch, she said, taking the loaf from Anne, who felt suddenly foolish. 
If it had not been for the young man in the market, Anne would surely have paid a shilling for the loaf of bread, a loaf she had thought would suffice, and which had not done. How grateful she was to William for helping her, even as she realised her naivety. I'm sorry, Mrs Kilner, I just wanted to help, Anne said, and the cook gave her a forced smile. And it was very kind of you, my lady, I'm sure, she replied. Anne made her way upstairs, finding Helen in her bedroom hanging dresses. I can't do anything right, Anne complained, and her maid looked at her sympathetically. You know what Mrs Kilner's like, my lady. It's her way or no way. But it won't be long before Lady Flincher arrives. Would you like me to look out a different dress for you to wear? She asked, but Anne shook her head. Whatever dress she wore, and however much she hoped against it, Anne knew for certain how Lady Flincher's visit would unfold. Immediate pleasantries would quickly be cast aside in favour of questions surrounding marriage. Lady Flincher had surely only invited herself to tea for the express purpose of relaying information as to the Duke of Lancaster's son. This task accomplished, she would then proceed to make clear her intentions as to the arrangements she was prepared to make in order to further the match. It was always the same. Progress was thankfully slow, but there was always progress. No, I'll just wear this. She's not coming to see me, only talk at me, Anne replied. Helen smiled but said nothing more, and Anne now waited for the inevitable call at Lady Flincher's arrival. It came half an hour later in the form of a footman, informing Anne her mother and Lady Flincher were waiting for her in the drawing room. This was not an invitation, but a summons, and Anne checked her appearance in the looking glass before making her way downstairs. Burnley Abbey looks so beautiful in the springtime. Of course it was the dowager who was my dear friend, but the current duchess is a charm or so I'm told, Lady Flincher was saying as Anne entered the drawing room. Anne's mother looked up. She was reaching for one of the sandwiches now daintily displayed on a cake stand, the bread sliced thinner than Anne had ever seen before. Oh, Anne, there you are. Come in and sit next to Lady Flincher, she said. Anne's godmother looked her up and down, her eyes narrowing. A blue shawl. It doesn't suit you very well, dear. But sit down, I've had a letter from the Duchess of Lancaster, she said, clearing her throat and unfolding a piece of paper she was clearly dying to read aloud. I'm sure I can't wait to hear what she has to say, Anne said, as her godmother began to read. My dear Lady Flincher, thank you for your kind words concerning Lady Anne. I must say I'm ever so eager to meet her, as is Maximilian. Distance separates us, and we must consider the practicalities of our coming to London or you to Lancashire. But fear not, the summer season offers ample opportunity for Maximilian and Anne to meet. I remain yours, Miriam, Duchess of Lancaster, etc., Lady Flincher read. Isn't it exciting, Anne? An introduction to the heir of a dukedom, Anne's mother said, smiling at her, even as Anne remained sullen. She had been introduced to enough men to know what was expected of her. At her coming out, she had been paraded amidst London society and introduced to most every eligible young man in the capital. An endless round of idle chatter, the sharing of the same information and the ever-present question of future engagement. Thus far, none of the men she had met had proved themselves worthy of a second meeting and having learned something of the young heir's reputation. Anne did not have high hopes for this encounter either. But towards it, her mother and godmother appeared to be making considerable efforts, and Anne feared this introduction would not be quite so easy to extract herself from as the others. I'm sure I'm very excited, mother, Anne said, adopting her most monochrome tone. Her godmother tutted. I've gone to considerable lengths to arrange this match, Anne. It's not every day a suitor appears in one's lap she said, helping herself to one of the sandwiches from the cake stand. Anne smiled to herself, thinking back to her encounter with the young man in the market. His name was William, and he had been charming. She wondered what he had thought of her, a naive young woman, entirely out of her depth, bartering with the stallholder. But does one really have to go all the way to Lancashire to find one? Anne replied, thinking back to the strange coincidence of William's place of birth. She was not averse to the idea of marriage, quite the opposite, in fact. 
Her days were spent buried in the pages of romantic novels, dreaming of her own rescuer. But so far, in her encounters with me, Anne had found only disappointments as opposed to men like Anton. Even the Baron would be a welcome distraction. The men she had encountered were all the same, ambitious, rakish and entirely lacking in charm and manners. Too many of them considered marriage a right and looked on women as theirs to do with as they pleased. Listen to her, Jemima. She doesn't know what she's talking about. The son and heir of a dukedom, one of the oldest and noblest dukedoms in the country, wishes to make her acquaintance, supported by his mother and father, and she remains indifferent to it, Lady Flincher exclaimed, shaking her head. Anne's godmother could be a formidable woman, perhaps the reason she herself had never married. And now Anne glanced at her mother, who gave glare at her. It's not that I'm not grateful, but I'm just not certain about him, that's all, Anne said, only expressing the truth as to her view of the situation. No one's ever certain in these circumstances. One can't be, but the prospects are excellent. Anne, Duchess of Lancashire, it's quite a title, Lady Flincher said. There was little point in arguing. Anne knew she would be introduced to the Duke's heir, whether she liked it or not. Resistance would only lead to further argument, better to make a bad impression than to outrightly refuse. Anne thought of Letitia and the dozens of other heroines she had read about in the pages of her penny novels. Such women always had ways and means of securing the match they desired and avoiding an unfortunate ending. It was always the same, for no novel ever ended unhappily for the heroine. Anne feared real life would not be quite so forgiving, and whilst she might be able to refuse the attentions of Duke of Lancaster's son, the matter would only be harder next time, and the time after that. A woman like Anne had to marry. She had no choice, for this was not a penny novel and Anne was no heroine. You'll meet him, Anne, and then we'll discuss it. There's no reason why we can't go up to Lancashire. We can stay with the Denbys at Pendlebury, the Countess said. Didn't they have an awful witch trial at Pendlebury? Anne said, and her mother looked at her askance. I don't think that's quite an appropriate topic for conversation, Anne, she said, and Anne fell silent. The talk of marriage continued, and by the time Lady Flincher had left, Anne could be forgiven for thinking she was already engaged to be married. I'll write to the Duchess and invite her and the boy to come to London. Far better than us going there. I dread to think what society consists of in such a far-flung province. Better the balls, dinners and soirees of the capital than bridge, square dances and idle gossip in the country, Lady Flincher said as she took her leave. I'm sure we can come to some arrangement, Anne's mother said, and she and Anne wished Anne's godmother a safe journey home. As the door of the drawing room closed, Anne breathed a sigh of relief, turning to her mother with a look of dejection. Why do you support her endeavours? she asked, believing the word endeavour was preferable to interfering if she was to win her mother to her cause. The Countess looked at her and sighed too. And why don't you, Anne? Don't you want to get married? Your father desires it for you, as do I. Your godmother's been very kind in arranging the match, she said. Introduction, Anne corrected her. In her mind, this was not a match, merely an introduction, one she could remove herself from if she wished. Her mother tutted. You can't hide from it forever, Anne. You can't remain a spinster forever, she said as one of the maids now came to clear away the tea things. But can't I remain a spinster a little longer? Anne asked. She could not help but think the inevitability of marriage had come too soon. She had not yet lived, or so she thought. The heroines in her novels were all of them, women of independent spirits, fighting back against the very rigidity Anne now found herself trapped within. Letitia would never have stood for an arranged marriage, she had fled from the Baron because of that very possibility. Not much longer, Anne, I assure you, her mother replied, and shaking her head, she left the drawing room. Anne glared at her retreating figure, but as soon as the door was closed, she hurried to the chair on which Lady Flincher had been sitting and drew out the novel she had bought that afternoon from Mr. Pullman. 
She had hidden beneath the cushion, and it had given her some delight to think of her godmother sitting on such a scandalous work of literature. Anne now settled herself down on the chair and opened the volume to the first page. Her hands were trembling, and she felt quite excited at the prospect of learning what was to become of the Baron, whose wicked ways surely deserved their comeuppance. Miss Matilda Goodwin was no ordinary woman, Anne read, and at these words she sighed. They never are, she said out loud, wishing her own life might one day prove to be out of the ordinary, even as she doubted her hopes would ever come true. Chapter 8 William had been busy in the week following his arrival in London. He had made himself known at a dozen different law firms and brokers, all of whom had looked favourably on his letter of introduction from his godfather. To his surprise and gratitude, Digby had been entirely true to his word, accompanying William on all his excursions around the city and making himself helpful at every turn. I really don't know what I'd have done without you, Digby, William said, as they sat in the taproom of the Spaniards Inn, eating mutton stew and drinking pale ale. I've no doubt my efforts will be rewarded, young master, Digby replied. He had taken to calling William young master in the previous days, and had repeatedly promised him he would make a gentleman of him. There was so much for William to learn and remember. He wanted to live up to the trust placed in him by his godfather, and he had written to the Duke to tell him of his good fortune in meeting Digby. I'll be forever grateful, I really will, William said, for he had received several offers of apprenticeship from several notable firms and had the pick of positions. If a friend can't help a friend, what's the world coming to? I'll have the landlord bring us another drink. Digby said, signalling to the landlord who nodded. But despite his success in matters of business, William remained uncertain as to where his future lay. He had decisions to make, and he knew he could not remain at the Spaniards' Inn forever. He would need lodgings, furnishings, a manservant, and all the necessities of a gentleman if he was to continue living in the capital, for that was certainly his intention now he had a taste for it. But I'm torn as to what to do and which offer to accept, William said, despairing at the thought of making the wrong decision. You don't have to decide immediately. Let them come to you, let them offer you more. Never accept the first offer you receive, William. Be prepared to negotiate, Digby said. William was learning to trust his advice. In all matters, William had felt himself led along the right path by his new adviser, who reminded him a great deal of Professor Murray. Digby's advice was measured and thoughtful. He never once forced the matter, but William accepted his words for their wisdom, and he was grateful to Digby for his patience in William's fear of making the wrong choices. But I've got to decide one way or another. And there's all the rest too. What to do about lodgings and a manservant. I need new clothes, and I'm yet to meet anyone or forge any permanent connections. Except with you, of course, and that was merely by chance, William said. It still amazed him to think of the good fortune he had enjoyed in meeting Digby as he had done so. His new adviser had been on the lookout for him, or so he had said, and had promised to remain at his side until William was properly settled in his new home. It'll come, William, but you can't spend your whole time worrying about the future. Live a little in present. Didn't the Duke tell you to enjoy yourself a little? He asked. William smiled. His godfather had been insistent on it, and he had given William an allowance for that express purpose. See what the capital has to offer, William. But be prudent. Not all pursuits are of equal dignity, the Duke had said, and there had followed a warning about vice and its poison. But William had no intention of seeking vice. He was content with his current situation, and would not have known where to seek pleasures the Duke would not have approved of. He did, yes. But I... well, I'm not sure how to do so, William admitted. Do you fence? Digby asked. William was surprised to be asked such a question. He knew nothing of fencing, apart from having seen Maximilian practising it in the long gallery at Burnley Abbey. Fencing was a pursuit of a gentleman, and not for the likes of a boy like William. I don't know, I know little of it, William admitted, but Digby only smiled. It matters not. You can learn. 
If you can fence, you'll find yourself open to all manner of invitations. It's a noble pursuit, a sport of kings, and one I'm sure you'll take to, he said. William smiled. He was willing to try, even as he feared he would show little by way of skill at the pursuit. But it seems so extraordinary. I don't have a sword or whatever it's called, William said, realising his own ignorance in the matter. In the course of the week spent with Digby, William had found himself ignorant of many things. Digby was constantly explaining things, the correct etiquette for this or that, the way to dress, what to eat, and a myriad of things William had never before considered. Despite his aristocratic connections, there could be no escaping from his childhood roots. William was born the son of a seamstress, and since his arrival in London, his lack of a correct upbringing had been painfully obvious. His mother was not to blame for this, but William knew he would never be a natural gentleman. A foil, an epée and a sabre, those are your weapons of choice, Digby said, rising to his feet and beckoning William to follow. But are we to fence now? he asked, thinking it quite incredible they should step out of the taproom and challenge one another to a duel. Why not? I can teach you. It'll do you good. As I say, a man who can fence is privy to all manner of social invitations. You might even find yourself invited to court, Digby said. The thought was too incredible for words. But William followed Digby outside into the yard behind the inn where, to his immense surprise, Digby had all the necessaries for a duel. But did you expect us to fence? Is that why you brought all this with you? William said, and Digby smiled. I told you, William, I'll make a gentleman of you. I promise as much to Professor Murray, Digby said, as he set about unpacking a box with chest pads and the weapons, whilst William watched in fascination. He was reminded to write to Professor Murray and thank him for his introduction to Digby. But now his new friend turned to him, handing him the padding and instructing him on how to dress himself. One doesn't wound, does one? William asked, for he feared he might inadvertently be taking part in a blood sport. In the past, he had watched Maximilian and his friends sparring with one another, but not close enough to see what actually occurred at a strike. No, it's only the tip. A touch is what's necessary. It grew out of military training, of course. One doesn't want to be injured in training for war, but one needs to know one has correct poise, posture and strike. Fencing trains the swordsman for all of that, but it's become a sport in its own right, Digby replied, pulling down a mesh mask over his face, as now he indicated for William to stand opposite him. William adopted the position he was told to, and now Digby postured himself, the hand with his weapon held out and his other hand raised behind him, his legs apart. Do I defend? William asked, raising his own weapon in a somewhat clumsy gesture. On guard! Digby exclaimed, and he lunged forward, touching William on the chest with the tip of his sword, even before William could react against him. Oh, is that... I didn't realise, William said, as Digby raised his mask and smiled at him. He was far older than William, older than his godfather, the Duke, but strongly built and agile too. You need to defend yourself. Don't allow me to strike you. Keep your guard up, anticipate my movements, he said, as now he replaced his mask and raised his sword again. William did the same, and with the on guard, he defended himself against Digby's attack. To his surprise, he found himself somewhat skilled in the endeavour and deflected Digby's strike, lunging forward and pointing the tip of his weapon to Digby's shoulder. Is that a hit? William asked, and Digby nodded. Yes, and an excellent one at that, he replied. William was beginning to enjoy himself, and he pictured himself sparring with other gentlemen, making friends, or even enemies, through the tip of his weapon. Shall we go again? William asked, and Digby nodded. With pleasure, yes, he replied and now he replaced his mask, adopting the position William emulated and raising his weapon. En guard! William cried out, and he lunged forward as Digby defended himself. The yard at the back of the Spaniards' Inn opened onto a thoroughfare at one side, leading up to St Paul's. 
a steady stream of people was passing by, some of whom looked into the yard with curiosity at the sight of William and Digby engaged in their duel. But as William defended himself, he was surprised to see a figure he recognised pass by. It was the woman from the market, the one he had saved from paying a shilling for a loaf of bread. He recognised her immediately, though now she was accompanied by another woman, the two of them deep in conversation. Got you this time? Digby exclaimed, touching William's chest with the tip of his weapon. But William was not listening, as now his gaze was entirely taken up by the sight of the woman, Anne, walking off into the distance. I've got to speak to her, he exclaimed, for it seemed her appearance was meant to be, and a sign he could not ignore. William had thought the woman to be lost in the vast metropolis, and yet here she was, right in front of his eyes. He could not lose the opportunity to speak to her, and hurrying out of the yard, he called to her from a distance. Anne, he shouted as Digby rushed up behind him. Whatever are you doing, William? he asked, for William had made no mention of his encounter in the market on the day of his arrival. I've got to speak to her, William replied, as Anne turned to him in surprise and smiled with a look of recognition on her face. Chapter 9 O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen, the canon said, pronouncing the words in a deep, churchman-like voice, which echoed up into the dome of the cathedral above. Anne yawned. She liked to hear the choir sing the psalms, but as for the rest of the service of Evensong, she was inclined to find it somewhat dull. Helen had accompanied her to the cathedral that afternoon, and they had sat through an interminably long sermon on a finer exegetical point of the book of Deuteronomy. Thank goodness it's over. I thought he was going to fall asleep himself, never mind the rest of us, Anne said as the organ now thundered the voluntary and the cathedral choir and clergy processed down the nave. Didn't the choir sing beautifully, though, my lady? Helen said, and Anne nodded. It's a taste of heaven, I think, she replied, and slipping her arm into Helen's, the two of them made their way across the vast marble floor towards the open doors of the cathedral. The clergy were standing there to greet them and Anne nodded her thanks to the canon, who gave a gracious smile. The cathedral itself was incomparable. It was one of Anne's favourite places, where heaven and earth met together, and her dreams seemed somehow nearer. She had been reading her new book all day and had been glad to see the Baron pitted against the hero in a final battle, the two of them teetering at the top of a high waterfall whilst Matilda watched in desperation below. As to what happened, Anne had left that for later, and she was looking forward to returning home and finishing her book. Shall we walk along the river, my lady? It's a beautiful day, Helen said. Anne nodded. She was glad of Helen's company, and now the two of them made their way down the cathedral steps and through the market in the direction of the thoroughfare leading down to the river below. The bakery stall was in its usual place and Anne blushed as they walked past, recalling her encounter with the baker and her rescue by the charming young man. If only more were like him, she thought to herself, sighing at the prospect of what her mother and godmother had in store. There had been more talk of Maximilian in the previous days, though it seemed the only quality he possessed lay in the unfortunate circumstances of the expectation of his father's death, hardly an attraction. You can at least meet him, Anne, her mother had said, and Anne had agreed to as much. She was willing to be surprised. There were times when the heroines in her stories were surprised by a man with a roguish reputation, though he had usually been away in some far-flung land, fighting bravely, rather than enacting his rakish ways around a northern county. Anne had a friend, Isabel, daughter of the Duke of Crawshaw, and who had spent a season in London several years ago. She lived not far from Burnley Abbey with her parents, and had written to Anne in the most disparaging terms about Maximilian. 
He is completely spoiled, and he thinks it is his right to dance with any woman he chooses, and without regards to their feelings, she had written, along with a great deal else. With this in mind, Anne's sentiments towards the heir of the dukedom were not favourable, and she considered him to be more like the baron in her current novel than the knight in the shining armour. I'm thinking of writing a novel myself, Helen. What do you think? Anne asked as the two of them walked down the thoroughfare leading to the boulevard along the riverside. Helen looked at her in surprise. I'm not sure your mother would approve, my lady, she said, and Anne laughed. When does she ever approve? It just occurred to me. I read enough of these sorts of books, and my head's always spinning with ideas of romance. Why not write about it, she said. Anne already had an idea for a story. She would set it on an island, where a woman, washed up there as a child in a shipwreck, lived with the island's inhabitants. One day, a ship would arrive, captained by a handsome man. As for the rest, Anne felt certain it would work itself out. But she was keen to put Quill to paper and begin. Well, if you're sure, my lady, Helen said. Anne was about to respond, but to her surprise, she now heard her name being called from behind and turning she was astonished to see the young man from the market, the one who had saved her from the embarrassment of the bread stall. Anne, he called out, waving to her and smiling. Anne blushed. She had not told Helen of her encounter with the gentleman, not of her foolishness over the price of bread. My lady, Helen whispered, as the gentleman whom Anne knew was called William came hurrying up to her. He was followed by an older man, whom Anne assumed to be his father or uncle. The two of them were dressed very oddly, as though for fencing, and indeed William was holding a sabre in his right hand. Oh, good day, sir, what an unexpected pleasure, Anne exclaimed, for it was a pleasure to see William again. She had thought about him a great deal since their previous encounter in the market, though she had never expected to see him again. For a moment, they looked at one another, with the blushes of youth, I... I never expected to see you again, he said, visibly delighted to have done so. But do you know one another? the older man said. Ah, forgive me, yes, this is Miss Anne Miller, and this is Mr Digby Kirkpatrick, a good friend of mine. Miss Miller and I met by chance in the market. I'm relieved to see you unburdened by a loaf of bread today, he said, and Anne laughed. No, I think I'll leave such things to my maid from now on. This is my maid, Helen, Anne said, turning to the maid, who looked at William in surprise. Not Miss Miller, my lady, she whispered, and Anne blushed. She had not introduced herself in formal terms at the market. It had not seemed quite proper to do so, even as there was no shame in her title or position. She was the daughter of an earl, a member of high society. And now William looked at her in embarrassment as though he felt foolish for not having realised. Oh, forgive me, I didn't realise, William said. Anne had no intention of making him feel embarrassed. There were times when she herself felt embarrassed as to the privileges of her rank and class. Their moment of encounter in the market had been a liberating experience, without airs or graces, even as Anne had known her parents would not approve. A lady was chaperoned, and without a chaperone, Anne should not have made the acquaintance of the man standing before her. But in William, Anne had sensed no rakish intention. He was a delight, and she was glad to meet him again. Oh, it's quite all right, you weren't to know. I shouldn't have been there on my own, Anne replied, glancing at Helen, who raised her eyebrows. Well, my lady, we shouldn't dawdle idly in the street, Helen said. Anne felt torn. She wanted to know more about William and now a sudden thought occurred to her. Oh, yes. We can't take up any more of your valuable time, Mr Baker. But I wonder, will you be attending the ball at Charlton Lodge next Friday evening? Anne asked. She knew it was not the done thing to do. A woman did not inquire as to whether a man was attending a ball. But their meeting again had been fortuitous, and Anne was keen to ensure it would not be their last. She liked William though she could not say why, for they barely knew one another. But in the previous days since their encounter at the market, her thoughts had dwelled on him, even as she had thought herself foolish for hoping to see him again. 
William looked at her in surprise as though he had no idea what she was talking about. I, he began, but it was his companion who interrupted him. He'll certainly be there, my lady. We both will, he replied, much to Anne's delight. William was somewhat taken aback. He had never heard of Charlton Lodge, nor of any ball due to take place there. Despite his aristocratic connections, William really knew very little of such events, and he had certainly never attended such a formal occasion. I, well, he stammered, even as Anne clapped her hands together in delight. Oh, that's wonderful. I've been looking forward to it for so long. I don't normally enjoy such occasions, but it's different at Charlton Lodge. The sweeping views across the river, the delightful gardens, and the music. Oh, it's quite sublime. We'll dance, she exclaimed. William did not have the heart to disabuse her. He had never danced in his life, except for the exuberant country dances at Christmas in the village and the May Day celebrations where a fiddler would play a tune on an old instrument and the young men and women would dance around the maypole on the village green. But as for formal dances, in rows and squares, following set and strict patterns, William knew nothing. He did not even have something to wear, if he had known what to wear, that is. But Digby's answer had been emphatic, and the look on Anne's face was enough for William to know she would be terribly disappointed if he now refused. Well, yes, I'm sure, he said, smiling at Anne even as his heart sank. He could not bring himself to tell her the truth, though he felt certain she would soon know if it. In aristocratic circles there was a hierarchy, and everyone knew everyone else. It would take only a brief glance in the pages of the new peerage to ascertain there was no entry concerning the connections of a William Baker. William was the godson of a duke, but that counted for nothing when it came to noble birthright. The daughter of an earl was different. She could not just fraternise with a commoner, despite her obvious intentions to do so. Better to tell the truth now, William thought to himself, and reluctantly he was about to admit his lowly credentials, for fear of being found out later, when Digby interrupted. We're honoured by your invitation, Lady Miller, and we'll be only too delighted to join you at the ball at Charlton Lodge. It's William's first time in London. He's the son of a prominent and wealthy man come to the capital to finish his education as a gentleman, Digby said. William's eyes grew wide and fearful. It was not true he was the son of nobody. His father had been a soldier killed in Corsica when his mother was carrying him, just a few months before William's birth. He had been raised by his mother in a cottage in the woods. If it were not for his godfather, William would have nothing, and he could not expect to keep up such a pretense at falsity. But the look on Anne's face was one of rapture and delight, and the thought of spoiling her thoughts of him was too dreadful to contemplate. Goodness me, how I admire you. All I do is... Well, not a great deal, Anne said, and William feared his friend had embarrassed her. Oh, but it's not like that, he stammered. The boy's only being modest, my lady. He's already got interest from several firms, brokers, lawyers. He may even enter politics. Imagine it, you could be speaking to the next prime minister, Digby said. William blushed. He was none of those things, and now he began to wonder if he ever would be. Digby was certainly generous with the facts. All of these things were a possibility. But William did not like to think of gaining Anne's interest under false pretenses. The letter of recommendation, the clothes, the lodgings, the allowance, all of it gave an impression of something he was not. At heart, William was the son of a seamstress and former maid. He was not a gentleman, even as he was trying so hard to be so. It felt wrong to lie to Anne but her smile and the look of admiration on her face were enough to make William hold back from telling her the truth. How extraordinary to have come all the way from Lancashire to London. I have some connections. Well, it doesn't matter, does it? I've never been to Lancashire. I've never really been out of London, except to visit our estate in Hampshire. It's so very brave of you. And how marvellous to have a mentor in you, Mr Kirkpatrick. Are you a man of business yourself? But you must be. Anne said, and Digby nodded. I am, my lady. I've tutored many young men in the art of gentlemanly ways. Tell me, do you know Lancashire at all? Digby asked. A sudden look of discomfort came over Anne's face, 
and she shook her head, pulling out her handkerchief, as though to cover her expression. Forgive me. I thought I was going to sneeze. No, I don't, not particularly. Not at all, in fact. But I'm sure it's a delightful place. Is the society much to speak of? she asked. William's eyes grew wide and fearful. He knew nothing of Lancashire society, save for the sight of his godfather receiving grand ladies at the abbey, or walking with imperious-looking gentlemen in the grounds. Well, there's Burnley Abbey, of course, the Duke and Duchess, William replied. Ah, yes, they have a son, don't they? Anne replied. William nodded, though he had no wish to extol the non-existent virtues of Maximilian. That's right, yes, Maximilian, William replied, glad to have given an answer to the question, even as he knew nothing of any other society in the county. And the Millers at Derwent Howe. Lady Catherine came to London last year for the season. She was very pleasant. And perhaps you'll know my friend Isabel too, the daughter of the Duke of Crawshaw, Anne said. William nodded, praying there would be no further questions asked. He had heard these names but he knew nothing of the people attached to them. The aristocracy was a different world from the one he inhabited, and no amount of tailoring could alter the fact of William's lowly birth. Yes, fine company, he said, glancing at Digby, who nodded. Well, I'm sure we can't take up any more of Lady Miller's valuable time, Digby said, and he nodded to Anne, whose maid also offered a similar sentiment. We don't want to be late home, my lady she said, and Anne nodded. Yes, well, it's been a delight to encounter you again, Mr. Baker. I do look forward very much to seeing you at Charlton Lodge at the ball, she said. William smiled at her. She was different from other aristocratic ladies, though in truth he did not know many aristocratic ladies. Those he had observed had appeared distant and aloof, riding in their carriages with haughty expressions on their faces. William had certainly not observed any bartering for bread in the marketplace, and that was perhaps why he had felt such an affinity to Anne. She was just like him. As do I, William replied, suddenly realising how ridiculous he must look in his fencing garbs. Well, good day to you, Anne said, and William bowed. We were fencing, I won't be dressed like this at the ball, he stammered, and Anne smiled. I'm sure not, Mr. Baker she replied, and nodding to him she turned with her maid, the two of them making their way sedately down the lane towards the river. William watched them, go, mesmerised by the sight of such beauty and charm. She was a remarkable woman, and how grateful William was for having had the chance to meet her again. He could not take his eyes off her retreating figure, and it was only when Digby cleared his throat William was brought back to his senses. What a charming young lady, he said, and William nodded. Isn't she just but... Why did you say those things to her, about my father, I mean, William said. Digby had presumably meant his words to be of benefit, but William feared they would have the opposite effect when the truth was known. He was not yet a gentleman, not yet employed, not yet independent. He was nothing, though clothed in an illusion. Because the details don't matter, William. If you like her, get to know her. It's simple enough, Digby replied. He had not quite answered the question, though William was grateful to his new adviser for having stepped in his moment of uncertainty. But the tale was now told. There could be no reneging on the deceit. Even as William felt somewhat embarrassed as to what he had done in the name of an introduction. But she thinks of me as something I'm not, William replied. Digby gave him a sympathetic look and smiled. But who's to say who your father is? You told me yourself he's dead, God rest his soul. When the time comes, she'll merely think she misheard. And as for your being a gentleman, well, you've already received offers, haven't you? Your godfather gives you an allowance and you live accordingly. By the time she knows different, you'll already be in employment. You'll be just what you described, Digby replied. When put like that, it seemed reasonable and William nodded, still feeling somewhat out of his depth. But I know nothing about dancing or balls or how to behave, he said, beginning to doubt himself. And these are things you can learn, William, 
Didn't I promise to help you? Digby said. William nodded. Digby had helped him a great deal, and there was no doubt the ball would be an excellent introduction to London society. It was just what he had wanted, except William was uncertain as to how he had been portrayed. Would Anne now introduce him as a wealthy prospector, come to London with the backing of power and reputation? In his mind, William was nothing but the son of a seamstress, and whilst he was proud of his roots, he did not believe the rest of London society would be as sympathetic to him as Anne had been. You did, yes, and I'm ever so grateful to you for that, but I fear, I fear I'll make a fool of myself, he said. But Digby shook his head. Nonsense, William. You've already made an excellent first impression. Come now, we'll return to our fencing, and then perhaps a lesson in dancing, he said. And putting his hand on William's shoulder, he led him back into the yard behind the inn, a comforting reassurance, even as William remained doubtful as to what was to come. Chapter 10 Despite his fears as to what he had agreed to and what he had found himself involved in, William was pleased at the prospect of attending the ball at Charlton Lodge the following week. In the coming days, his mind had often wandered to thoughts of Anne and the evening they would share. He pictured elegant dresses and fashionable ladies and heard the sound of the tinkle of crystal and glass and the music drifting on the air. In his mind's eye, William could see Anne, Lady Miller, wearing a beautiful gown, and he imagined taking her in his arms, the two of them twirling around a ballroom beneath the flickering candlelight of a chandelier. How do you do? Yes, very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to meet you. What brings you to London? Are you here for the season? Yes, I've come here to... William said, his words faltering as he stood in front of the mirror in his bedroom at the Spaniards Inn. He had been practising what to say, or rather what not to say, at the ball. And whilst he was more than capable of introducing himself, he found what came next a struggle. They'll ask about my father and mother. They'll assume there's a fortune in the colonies. Sugar, probably. But I don't know anything about anything, William exclaimed to himself, sighing and shaking his head. He felt like a fraud. He was a fraud or so he told himself repeatedly. William did not have the confidence of others, and certainly not that of Digby, who had already allayed his fears a dozen times. You'll be quite all right, and I'll be there too, won't I? He had said, whenever William had expressed doubts. With a sigh, he adjusted his necktie in the mirror, another gentlemanly trapping he was only just getting used to, and made his way down to the taproom. It was evening, and he and Digby had spent the day presenting themselves at various firms of brokers and solicitors. It was Digby who had taken it on himself to make the introductions, presenting the Duke's letter with a flourish to which every clerk should appear at the door. Mr. William Baker, godson of the Duke of Lancaster, he would say, and the clerk would scurry off to fetch someone more worthy of dealing with such a figure of importance. But in every encounter, William felt a fraud. He was, to use words of his mother's, mutton dressed as lamb, and his encounter with Anne had only proved that further. I'm having doubts about the ball, William said, as he came to sit down with Digby in their usual corner. The table had been laid for dinner, and the landlord brought a dish of boiled beef and vegetables to the dinner, putting it down and giving a curt bow. William was one of his best customers, and along with Digby, William had already spent a considerable portion of his godfather's generosity at the inn. I'll bring a pie next, sirs, a game pie, the landlord said after Digby had ordered two tankards of ale. Nonsense, William. You're not having second thoughts at all. You doubt yourself far too much, Digby said, shaking his head. But I fear I'll be exposed for what I am, William said. But Digby refused to listen. He insisted on calling William a gentleman in all things and would not hear it, said he was anything but what he purported to be. Have some faith in your own abilities, William. Would your godfather have sent you to London if he believed you to be a failure? Not at all, I assure you. We've already practised some of the dances and you can sit out for those you don't know, Digby replied. But William was still unconvinced. His sole motivation for going through with the matter was Anne 
He was thinking about her more and more, both with a sense of guilt at having given the wrong impression to her, and with a sense of excitement and expectation at the chance of seeing her again. But no matter how he dressed it up, William knew he had lied, and that lie would only grow bigger as their acquaintance continued. Oh, but I'm bound to get it wrong. I don't know how to dance, not like that. One step, two step, twirl and round, William said, repeating the moves Digby had taught him. It had been rather like fencing, and whilst William had taken to the sport well enough, his dancing left much to be desired. You'll see everyone else do it too, just follow them. You'll be quite all right, Digby insisted, as the landlord now returned with their drinks, and the kitchen boy brought the game pie to the table. But William remained doubtful. He was doubtful about a lot of things. In Lancashire, he had been given every possible opportunity by his godfather, but in London, it seemed everyone was attracted by the possibility of fortune and determined to make a success of themselves. Back home, William had stood out, but here he was simply one of the crowd. I suppose so, it's just, well, I don't know, it all seems rather... I'm just not meant to be this, William said. Digby raised his eyebrows. You've as much right as anyone to make a success of themselves, William. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Come now, we've got a fine dinner before us. Let's not allow it to go to waste, he said. William nodded. Whatever doubts he raised, Digby had an answer, and there was no doubt he believed in William, even as William doubted himself. But whilst dances could be learned and social graces practised, there was one thing, of a practical nature, William was lacking. But what about money? he said. William's godfather had been generous in the allowance he had given William for his board and lodgings. He had paid for William's clothes and provided him with transportation. But such kindness came with expectation. William was expected to begin work, but it was Digby who had insisted they keep looking, rather than immediately accepting one of the previous offers made. Appearance was one thing, but money was scarce and one could not expect to go to a ball without personal means. Digby smiled, his eyes narrowing, and he leaned forward with a knowing look in his eyes. Don't worry about money, William, he said, glancing from left to right lest they be overheard. William was confused. Money was a worry, and if he did not begin some form of meaningful employment soon, his prospects would quickly diminish. I don't understand. Why shouldn't I worry about money? he asked. Because making money doesn't have to be difficult, not if you know the right way to go about it, Digby replied. William had long been an observer of wealth in his relations with the Duke and Duchess, but wealth itself was unfamiliar to him. Making money required a job, whilst having money was usually the happy chance of inheritance, as it was for his godfather. The circumstances of birth dictated so much of what was to come, and while some were born to affluence, others, like William, were born into struggle. He had observed this struggle as a child, for his mother had always had to work hard for the things they had. If it had not been for the patronage of the Duke, William's prospects would have been just the same as any other boy of his age, and making money would have remained a difficult task. But I haven't made a penny since arriving here, though I've certainly made some useful introductions, William said. Digby smiled, reaching into his pocket and drawing out a clenched fist. William looked at him curiously. He smiled broadly, holding it above the table. What do you think I've got here, William? he said, and William shook his head. I don't know, he replied, wondering what it was the tutor was holding. Digby opened his hand, and to William's surprise a pair of dice dropped onto the table, rolling with a clatter and coming to rest on two sixes. Dice, Digby said, as though the sight of them was self-explanatory. Dice? But what are we meant to do with them? William asked, even as he feared the answer. What do you think, William? Gambling, he said, and William's heart sank. William knew what gambling could do to a person. It was a dangerous pursuit, one with many risks attached. His mother had warned him about it, for she had known several men in the village afflicted with an unfortunate taste for rolling dice, playing cards and placing bets. 
No, that's not a solution, he exclaimed, but Digby shook his head. It is if you win, and you will, William. I know you will, he said. This, in itself, was a gamble, and one William did not think would pay off. He knew nothing about playing dice, or cards, or whatever else one might place a wager on. Money could be lost, as well as won, and the thought of doing so filled William with dread. His godfather had trusted him with an allowance, and it was not for William to use that money for gambling. Digby, I don't think so. It's not a good idea, he said. But his mentor smiled and picked up the dice and rolled them again. They landed on double six and William raised his eyebrows. Digby, no, he said, but Digby laughed. You wouldn't use the weighted dice every time, but you could ensure victory as and when you wished, he replied. But William was emphatic. He was not about to cheat and he was surprised to think of Digby stooping so low as to suggest it. His new friend had presented himself as a model to emulate, and William now wondered as to why he would be so determined to see William succeed, even at the cost of something underhand and dishonourable. There were times when William felt almost scared by Digby. There was something about him, something not entirely as his first impressions had given. I won't use weighted dice, Digby. I won't he said, and Digby nodded. I was only teasing you, William. Terrible things, these. No, I was only showing you them as a warning. Others might not be so honest, but you're an intelligent young man, a man of business, a gentleman. You don't need to cheat to win. I can teach you how to play dice, cards, any game, and I can tell the sort of wages you'll succeed in. You could make far more money than you would as an apprentice, Digby said. William sighed. He felt uncertain as to Digby's idea. His godfather had sent him to London to secure an apprenticeship. He was to make a gentleman of himself, and if it was discovered he was gambling, his mother and godfather would be shocked. But I could lose far more of it too. You know that, William said, shaking his head. The dice were still lying on the table, their faces on the lucky double six. There was a sense of possibility, even as William tried hard to resist. He needed money and the first days of an apprentice's wage could not hope to provide the necessities he would need if he was to continue the illusion of gentlemanly wealth. Anne believed he was something he was not, and whilst William knew it was wrong to deceive her, he wondered if he might also prolong his own enjoyment of the illusion too. He enjoyed being a gentleman, and Digby had assured him he was well suited to it too. But you won't, that's the point, isn't it? We'll make sure you don't. It's easy when you know how. Digby replied, with an encouraging tone. But how? William asked, for he had not realised Digby's prowess in such matters. His new friend had not mentioned gambling, but nor had he mentioned fencing at their first meeting either, and he had proved himself adept at that. William trusted Digby. He was a friend of Professor Murray, and had done much to ensure William found his way in this new and sometimes overwhelming city. Observation, William. That's the key in so many pursuits. Take fencing, for example. Brute strength might win in a bout of swordsmanship, but the fencer knows when to strike, when to hold back, when to place himself on the defensive and the offensive. It's all a matter of observation. It's the same with cards or rolling dice. Observe your opponent. Does he take risks? Is he cautious? Or does he attempt to surprise you? Digby replied. William nodded. He could see the sense in that. But as for ever having played such games or risked any money in such pursuits, he remained naive. His mother had never taught him cards, and William wondered if his father had ever played such games to pass the long days abroad with the military. I suppose so. But where does one practice such things? William replied, for he had the feeling Digby would not take no for an answer. Glancing around him, he saw one or two others rolling dice and playing cards, but they were doing so for pennies and matchsticks, hardly what was required of William. Digby smiled as though he knew what William was thinking. Not here, that's for certain. No, we'll go to one of the gentlemen's clubs. You can observe the proceedings, then make your wager, small at first but a few victories, and you'll soon increase the stakes, Digby replied. 
William felt uncomfortable at this thought, but he was torn between sense and sensibilities. Reason suggested he was a fool to wager what little money he had on such risk. Whilst his heart yearned to impress Anne and continue the impression of wealth and suitability, he, or rather Digby, had given. A gentleman's club, but I've never set foot in such a place, William said. The plan seemed to be spiralling out of control, but Digby shook his head and smiled. And what does that matter? You've got your godfather's letter of recommendation. Why not use it? he said. William felt uncertain. It was one thing to use it for its intended purpose, but if the Duke discovered his name was being used as an entry to gambling and drinking, William would surely find himself in trouble. I'm not sure about that, William said, but Digby shook his head. Doesn't a gentleman use whatever happens to be at his disposal to further his advantage? he asked. William sighed. He had seen such behaviour already, young men seeking preferment, unafraid to push themselves forward. He had witnessed it only that morning. A boy, no older than himself, had talked his way into the offices of a broker they were visiting, insisting his uncle was the ambassador to India and demanding an interview on that very basis. He was given one, and as William and Digby had emerged from the broker's office, the boy was being offered a job. You're right, I suppose. William replied, and Digby smiled. You know I'm right, William, and what's more, I'm going to make sure you win. Think of the impression you'll make on Miss, I mean, Lady Miller, he said, smiling at William, who nodded. It would be worth it to impress Anne, or so it seemed. William really did not know what would impress her, but she was surely used to finery and expected those with whom she mingled to be of a certain standing. William wanted to be that gentleman, and despite his misgivings, he now agreed to Digby's plan. Very well, if you'll teach me, I'll do it, he replied, and his mentor smiled. You won't regret it, William. I promise you, he replied. And it seemed the matter was settled. But in his mind, William still felt torn between loyalty to what was expected of him and the desire to impress the woman who had so captivated his heart. It was a foolish folly, he knew that, and yet the feelings persisted. She was beautiful, charming, witty, intelligent, a delight, and William could not stop thinking about her. Let the illusion last a little longer, he thought to himself as he lay in bed that night, thinking of Anne and all they might share together, if William truly was a gentleman. Chapter 11 Fetch me the new peerage, Helen, if you please. I want to look for him in there. Isn't it exciting? Anne said, as soon as she had taken off her bonnet and shawl in the hallway. As they had walked by the riverside that day, Anne had thought of nothing else but William and the chance encounter outside the inn. She felt certain the hand of Providence had provided, and now she was determined to discover all she could about the man she would next encounter at the Charlton Lodge Ball. It seemed a strange place for a gentleman to be staying, my lady. Doesn't he have a London house if his father's so wealthy? Helen asked. Anne rolled her eyes. She knew Helen's opinion. Her maid had made her disapproval of Anne meeting a stranger in the market quite clear. But William was no longer a stranger. They had met on two occasions now and Anne dismissed her concerns with a wave of her hand. Nonsense. Lots of gentlemen stay in inns. Not everyone has a London townhouse. Not if they're from Lancashire. I'm sure his father's not in London enough to warrant one. They're economical, I'm sure, she said, entering the drawing room and settling herself in a chair by the window. Helen retrieved the copy of the new peerage from the library, and Anne clapped her hands together in delight, excited to learn with whom the family of the bakers might be associated. Whilst William had made no claims to nobility, she felt certain a wealthy father would be listed and was bound to have aristocratic connections. Is there anything there, my lady? Helen asked, and Anne looked up at her, narrowing her eyes. Don't be so hopeful there won't be, Helen, she said, and her maid smiled. I just wonder, my lady, is he really suitable? And your parents, haven't they already made a decision regarding your marriage? Helen replied. 
As far as Annie was concerned, this was a minor detail. She had made her feelings concerning Maximilian very clear, and she hoped her parents would take heed. Her godmother would complain, but she would soon find another enterprise to concern herself with, and Anne felt certain she would not be held ransom to a vague suggestion of marriage to the son of the Duke of Lancaster. It's strange they're both from Lancashire, Anne said, not entirely answering her maid's question, as now she searched under B for Baker. I'm sure, my lady, but I don't think Lord Maximilian will move in quite the same circles as Mr. Baker, Helen said. Anne ignored her. She did not care what circles William moved in. He was different from other men. There were no airs and graces about, and no sense of him being anything other than he was. He had come to her aid at the market, and now she felt excited at the prospect of him accompanying her to the ball. Badbury, Baclachal, Baker, ah, yes, here we are, Lord Sotheby Baker of East Grinstead, married the Countess Fortescue of Ebrington, Gloucestershire. Isu, Lady Mary Baker, Viscount Timothy Baker, Anne read, nodding approvingly. But that's surely just a coincidence, my lady. It doesn't prove a connection to Mr. William Baker, Helen said. Anne's face fell. She had hoped to find William's name listed amongst the associates or his father in some esteemed position, but there was no mention of either of them. Helen was right. The bakers of East Grinstead surely had nothing to do with the gentleman accompanying her to the Charlton Lodge Ball. Well, yes, I suppose so, but it doesn't matter. These things are never up to date. Mother was looking for someone only the other day. Lord Cinderby of Blythe. It listed him as being dead, but we'd only seen him the day before at a dinner. She wanted to write and thank him for his kindness in keeping us company when father was discussing business, Anne replied, as though this justified the fact of William's absence. New money, I suppose, my lady, Helen said, shaking her head, as she removed the offending volume from the table Anne had been examining it on. You just don't like him, Helen, Anne retorted, folding her arms sulkily. Anne did not understand why anyone could dislike William. He was charming, sweet, and kind. He had done nothing but behave honourably and with good intention towards her. It pained Anne to think her maid and closest confidant should think ill of a man for whom her own affections were growing ever stronger. It's not that I don't like him, my lady, but we don't know him, do we? And I doubt your parents will approve, she replied. Of that they could at least agree. Anne knew precisely what her parents would say. They would do the same as she had done, consult the new peerage and find their connections lacking. It's not a suitable match, Anne, they would say, and Anne would be forced to continue considering the attentions of Maximilian as desirable. But she did not find them desirable, nor did she intend to be told whom she should marry. And with a sense of defiance about her, Anne went down to dinner that evening, intending to make clear her intentions. It was times like these she wished she had a sister to confide in, someone who could share her frustrations over what was expected of them. But Anne was an only child, and as she entered the drawing room for Sherry, she found her parents deep in conversation. We'll speak about it later, the Earl said, looking up as Anne entered the room. What are we going to speak about? she asked, taking a glass of Sherry from the tray the footman proffered her. Tell her now, Beverly. She'll be pleased, I'm sure. Anne's father said, and Anne looked inquisitively at her mother, who sighed. Sit down, Anne, she said, beckoning Anne to join her on the chaise lounge. Anne was immediately suspicious. It was never her mother's practice to discuss a matter. Discussion implied choice, and Anne was never given a choice. What was about to happen was the imparting of a decision, one made on her behalf. Anne knew it, even before her mother spoke. If it's about the heir to the Lancaster dukedom, she began. That's precisely what it's about, Anne. But you'll be pleased to know we've made a decision on that matter, her mother said. Anne looked at her in surprise. The decision had surely been made and it would certainly not do to renege on it. Anne could only imagine the look on her godmother's face if it were to be so. What matter? I thought the matter was settled, Anne replied. 
Her parents exchange glances. Well, nothing was truly decided, no, her father said. In all matters, Anne's father remained somewhat aloof. He was kind to a point, but had never been the sort of man to delight in familial matters, and he had always made clear his sorrow at having no male heir. You mean you're calling it off? Anne exclaimed, a sudden shiver of delight running through her. It was a marvellous news, and despite the obstacles she knew would be created by the introduction of her parents to William Baker, a glimmer of hope was now presented. It seemed pertinent to do so, her father said, and Anne leapt to her feet, hurrying over to her father and throwing her arms around him. Thank you, father. The thought of moving all the way to Lancashire for a man I didn't care to meet, let alone love, it was too dreadful to comprehend, Anne said, her mind already racing with possibility. Well, we'll keep the possibility open, but for now. Well, it's better this way, the Earl said. But I can't move to Lancashire, Mother. Please, it's much better this way, Anne replied, for there was at least a glimmer of hope in this new suggestion. Her mother smiled and nodded. Which is what your father and I thought too. It was hardly fair on you, Anne. You've grown up in London, your friends are here, and to send you away like that, it wasn't fair, her mother said. Anne was failing to hide her obvious excitement, and she was about to tell her parents all about her encounter with William when her father interjected. Which is why we've made more suitable arrangements, he said. Anne turned to him in surprise. What sort of arrangements? she asked, and the Earl cleared his throat. Lord Peter Ulverston, a fine man and with an excellent head for business. I intend to make an introduction for you. He's coming here tomorrow afternoon. You'll meet him then he said, as Anne stared at him in disbelief. They say, the better the devil you know. But in this case, Anne was certain she was faced with a choice between two men of similarly unfortunate reputations. Lord Peter Ulverston was well known as a rake and a womanizer. He had scandalised society on several occasions, though his connections to well-placed aristocrats, Anne's father included, meant he rarely found himself punished for long. But I... I don't want to meet him, Anne exclaimed, and her father tutted. Think sensibly, Anne. Wouldn't you rather make a match here in London? Your father knows his lordship well, and if he thinks the match a suitable one, the countess said, but Anne shook her head. And what about me? What am I to make of the match? She exclaimed, for it seemed to Anne as though she had been thrown from the frying pan into the fire. He's coming tomorrow, her father said, as though that was the end of the conversation. And if I refuse to see him, Anne replied. You won't, the Earl said, just as the gong sounded for dinner. It seemed Anne had no right to protest, though she ate her dinner that evening in resolute silence, determined to make her parents understand her displeasure in being handed between suitors at whim. After the coffee had been served, Anne went straight to bed, resolute in her determination not to marry Lord Peter Ulverston or any man her parents deemed suitable. I won't do it, Helen, I won't, Anne said, folding her arms as she sat at her dressing table. Her reflection was one of sadness, even as she knew her flirtations with William had been a folly. A woman of her own position had very few choices. She had no right to choose her own husband, and her father's exercising of that right was not to be challenged. Perhaps he'll change his ways, my lady, Helen said, but Anne shook her head. I doubt it. Not for me he won't, she said and it was in the throes of despair she went to bed that night, feeling certain she would have no choice but to marry the man she already despised. You can't keep this up any longer, Anne, the Countess said, as Anne sat in silence by the window in the drawing room the following day. She had eaten her breakfast in silence and refused to reply to any questions, either from her mother or her father. The Earl had grown so angry as to storm out of the dining room, muttering about foolish girls. But the Countess had taken a more conciliatory line, and was now trying to persuade Anne as to the suitability of Lord Peter Ulverston, who was due to call on them that very hour. I know of his reputation, Anne, but people change, don't they? Are we to be held captive by our past in all things? Her mother said. Annie shook her head. 
then at least allow him the chance to call on you. Speak to him, discover what he's like, her mother continued. How many chances does a man deserve? I know what he's like. I know just what he's like, Anne thought to herself. There had been the incident with Lady Georgiana Painswick in the shrubbery at the Rotunda, then the scandal of Duchess Man's maid. Trouble followed Lord Ulverston, and it was trouble Anne had no desire to involve herself in. Her first thought that morning had been of William, and she wondered what he would think of her if he saw her on the arm of a man like that at the ball at Charlton Lodge. He'll want nothing to do with me, that's for certain, she thought to herself, sighing and shaking her head. Please, Anne, for me, won't you do just this one thing? Make a good impression, the Countess pleaded, and now Anne relented, even as her anger spilled over. You know I love you, Mother but am to do this one thing for the rest of my life? You're asking me to consider marriage to a man with a dubious reputation, and who will no doubt continue in his rakish ways even after our vows are pronounced, Anne replied. Her mother was somewhat taken aback, either by Anne's relenting of silence or her disparaging words about Lord Peter. Well, your father speaks very highly of him, the Countess replied. Anne rolled her eyes. Her father spoke highly of anyone with whom he had conducted successful business. That with Lord Peter had involved the importing of brandy from the continent, and substantial profits had been made on both sides. I'm sure he does, but that doesn't make much difference to me, mother. I'm the one he expects to marry him. At least I had time to get used to the idea of Maximilian. But this is all very quick. And what if I've made a decision elsewhere? she asked. Her mother's eyes grew wide with the implication but before she could reply, the door was opened, and Lord Peter Ulverston was announced. He was, as Anne remembered him, a short man, with a long nose, curled black hair, and a rotund figure, squeezed into an ill-fitting frock coat and tails. He gave a curt bow, stepping forward and holding out his hand. Lady Anne, how pleased I am to see you again, he said, as Anne took his hand and forced a smile to her face. I'm sure it's my pleasure, Lord Peter, she said, glancing at her mother, who now instructed tea to be brought, and offered Lord Peter a seat by the hearth. What followed was less a mutual exchange of pleasantries, and instead an exercise in self-congratulation. Lord Peter explained the many and varied ways in which he was admirably suited to be Anne's suitor, and Anne listened without opportunity to interrupt. When the diatribe was concluded, Anne's mother smiled, thanking Lord Peter for his words, and imploring Anne to say something about herself. Oh, I don't think there's much to say, is there? she replied. Oh, nonsense, Anne. You could tell Lord Peter about your interest in music, the Countess replied. I like to listen to music, but I much prefer reading, Anne replied. Lord Peter looked at her and smiled. Ah, yes. Your father told me about your reading. It seems an idle pursuit to me. Why waste one's time in the pages of a book? Isn't it better to live one's own life rather than spending time in the lives of others? He said, his tone one of smug superiority. Anne returned his gaze defiantly. On the contrary, I think it far better to learn from others rather than assuming oneself to always be right, she replied. Lord Peter cleared his throat, nodding as he now rose to his feet. Well, I'd better be going. I've got some business to see to. I'm glad we've had this meeting, Lady Anne. I'll see you at Charlton Lodge, won't I? He said. Anne had feared he would say this. She had avoided the topic of the ball in the hope he would not make the connection, but now she could only smile and nod. You will, she said, and Lord Peter took his leave of them. As the drawing-room door closed, Anne let out a heavy sigh. He was everything she had thought him to be, and more. There was nothing about Lord Peter Ulverston she found redeeming. He was just as his reputation suggested, and now she glanced at her mother who had an unsettled expression on her face. Well, at least he's closer than Lancashire, she said, and Anne rolled her eyes. Chapter Twelve and doubles make a win, that's a full flush, 
Digby said, peering over William's shoulder as he placed the cards on the table. The other men looked at him angrily, tossing their own cards onto the table and folding their arms. That's me out, one of them said, and the others expressed similar sentiments as Digby reached over and scooped the not inconsiderable winnings across the table. William was surprised. He had not expected to find any talent at cards, but that evening, under Digby's tutelage, he had won four out of five games and pocketed ten pounds, more money than he had ever seen in his life. Won't you gentlemen play again? Digby asked, but William's opponents shook their heads. Not against him, they muttered, and Digby smiled, glancing at William, who felt embarrassed. Well, it seems you've rather outdone yourself, William, he said, as William rose from the table. He had not found the game difficult to master. It was easy enough to guess the cards in the other men's hands, compare them to his own and apply the rules. There was some luck, of course, in the hand, but a skill too. One William found himself naturally inclined towards. I just followed the rules of the game. I had some lucky hands, I suppose, William replied, as Digby led him back to their usual corner. As I knew you would. This was a good place to practice. You've won some money, but it's small fish compared to what we might catch elsewhere, Digby said, smiling at William, who shook his head. He had been reluctant to indulge Digby's suggestion. Gambling was not something his mother or godfather would approve of. He had won some money, and that was that. Digby had already made mention of the gentleman's club. But winning small amounts in a tavern was one thing, and the thought of pretending to be a gentleman in a place like Boodle's or White's was quite another. But I've got enough money now, haven't I? Isn't it pertinent to cease whilst I'm on the up? William asked, for he felt certain his luck would run out, even as he had had been surprised as to his own abilities. But Digby shook his head and laughed. No, William, not at all. You've proved your abilities, haven't you? There was no trouble in your winning now and there'll be no trouble in your winning again. We'll go to Boodle's this evening, Digby said. There was no question about it, and William felt he could not say no. Digby had been a friend and mentor to him ever since his arrival in London, and the money William had won would be useful. He thought about the forthcoming ball and seeing Anne again. With the money in his pocket, he could afford new clothes, and the necessities of the evening, a carriage to take them there a fine bottle of claret, and an excellent supper afterwards. William knew his mother would disapprove, and his godfather would be angry with him, but his heart was torn, and he wanted so very much to create the right impression with Anne. If I won a lot of money, I wouldn't need to explain anything to her, he told himself, as he and Digby set out for Boodle's Club later that day. William had never been to a gentleman's club before. In truth, he did not know what occurred at such establishments, though he knew them to be places where the aristocracy and ambitious gentlemen gathered. Will they even let us in, Digby? he asked, as the carriage pulled up outside a handsome building built in white marble with large windows and a flight of steps leading up to doors, where a liveried steward stood stiffly to receive guests. Digby smiled. Don't you have your letter of recommendation? he asked. William nodded. Once again he felt guilty at using his godfather's name in such a way, but Digby was right. The name of the Duke of Lancaster would be enough to gain them entry. Yes, I suppose there's no harm in it, he said, and Digby smiled. No harm at all. Come now, the tables await, as do the gentlemen's pocketbooks, he said, climbing out of the carriage. William followed, somewhat reluctantly, though he was intrigued by the possibility of what might occur. The gentlemen of Boodle's club were rich, and if William took a risk, the rewards could be considerable. He had with him his winning from the Spaniards Inn that afternoon, and he would use this as his initial wager. Do you have membership, gentlemen? the steward asked, looking William and Digby up and down with an imperious expression. Not membership, no. But I understand association can also gain entry, Digby said. The steward narrowed his eyes. It rather depends on the association, sir, he replied. William's heart was beating fast and he drew the letter of recommendation from his pocket, 
presenting it to the steward, who unfolded it and began to read. I think you'll find everything in order, Digby said, and the steward bowed. Certainly, sirs, right this way, he said, showing them through the door into a large hallway, with a wide carpeted staircase rising before them. Good day, gentlemen. Is it the dining room you require? Another steward inquired, but Digby shook his head. No, we'll go straight up to the reading room. Are they playing tonight? he asked. The steward nodded, glancing at William with a knowing look. Lord Carlisle, Lord Ponsonby, the Earl of Strathclyde, and Mr Justice Peel, and Prince Yorgi Cavragon, they're in the card room now. I believe they're looking for a sixth, he said, taking William's coat. Then it's a sixth they'll have, Digby replied as he ushered William up the stairs. William felt terribly nervous. He had only learned to play cards the day before, and now he was to sit down amongst the aristocracy and do so for large sums of money. It was one thing to play drinkers in a tavern, but this was something else. Are you sure about this? William whispered, as Digby led him up the stairs. They're no different from the others, William. They've just got more money. Use a note of credit to begin with. Say fifty pounds, Digby replied. William's eyes grew wide. Fifty pounds was more money than his mother earned in a whole year in her work as a seamstress. It was an obscene amount of money, and he shook his head, protesting, even as Digby caught his arm and marched forcibly forward. But what if I lose? I can't pay it, he whispered, as now they entered a large book-lined room where several dozen men were sitting in armchairs, reading periodicals or talking in low voices. An archway led through to an anteroom, where a roaring fire burned in the hearth, and a large plush-covered table stood in the centre, around which five men were sitting preparing for a game of cards. Just go and sit down with them, act with confidence, put down a note of credit and do precisely what you did this afternoon. Count the cards, predict their moves. You're cleverer than them all, I assure you, Digby replied. William did not share his confidence. The men were formidable-looking, older, with white hair and stern expressions on their faces. Well, isn't anyone else going to join us? One of them called out, and the other gentlemen in the reading room shook their heads. Cowards, that's the problem, another of the men at the table said. We can't play without a sixth, unless one of us drops out to make a four. But that's hardly fair, is it? Another of the men said. Digby pushed William forward and now he found himself standing before the five men who looked up at him with disdain. Yes, one of them asked. I, I'd like to join, William replied, knowing there could be no going back. The men looked at one another and one of them laughed. But you're only a puppy, wet behind the ears. Who are you? he demanded. William felt terribly nervous, but he drew a deep breath, fixing the man with a defiant expression. I'm William Baker. I've come to London to make my fortune. I want to play. I'll stand credit of fifty pounds, he said. The men looked at one another, and all of them laughed. What nonsense, one of them said, but it was Digby who now interjected. I can vouch for him. This young gentleman can make good on what he promises, and I assure you he's a match for you, he said. William's hands were trembling, and he thrust them into his pockets as the men looked at one another doubtfully. And who might you be, sir? one of them asked. Digby Kirkpatrick, recently returned from Italy, where I was tutor to the son of an Italian nobleman. I know William to be true to his word. Let him play, you'll see, Digby said. The men smiled and shook their heads. Let him throw his money away if he wishes, one of them said, indicating the empty chair at the table. William sat down, and a steward brought paper and ink for him to write his note of credit and sign. The others placed similar wages on the table, and if he won, William knew he would have a small fortune such as he had never imagined. In the time it took to win a game of cards, he could amass more money than if he had worked for months as an apprentice. But William knew the risk, too, and as the first hand was dealt, he contemplated what losing would mean. Two jacks, two threes, a four and a queen. One of the men, who had been introduced as Mr Justice Peel, said laying down his hand. 
the others followed suit. William had been observing them. The Russian, Prince Kavragan, was a risk-taker, whilst the Earl of Strathclyde kept his cards close to his chest. Lord Carlisle and Lord Ponsonby were cautious, but William felt certain they held superior hands. A queen, a king, a jack, and a ten, the rest low, the prince said, laying down his hand. The others glanced nervously at one another. All low, Lord Carlisle said, and others said the same. Only William was left, and now he realised he had the winning hand. It had been easy, too easy. Luck had favoured him at first, but skill had brought reward, and now he placed his cards on the table as the other men stared at him in astonishment. Two aces, two kings, two queens, two jacks, the rest high, he said, spreading out the cards. Prince Cavragon banged his fist down angrily on the table. He wins, he exclaimed, and William reached out and pulled the pile of wages towards him. His own note of credit was worthless, of course, but the rest of the money totaled almost five hundred pounds. William had often heard his mother speak of the income of certain people in the village, and he knew this to be a remarkable sum of money. He can play cards, or so it seems, Lord Carlyle said, shaking his head. But I'm sure your good sirs won't stop there, will you? Digby interjected. He had been standing behind William for the duration of the game, watching his every move. I'm out, I'm afraid, Lord Carlyle said, for William's unexpected victory appeared to have unsettled him. As am I, the Earl of Strathclyde said, pushing back his chair and rising to his feet. But Prince Kavragan laughed, taking out his pocketbook and placing large number of notes onto the table. A hundred pounds each, he said, fixing William with a daring look. Lord Ponsonby too added to the amount, as did Mr Justice Peel. William would gladly have taken his winnings and left, but Digby his hand on his shoulder and nodded. You've already won almost five hundred pounds. Wagering a hundred, that's money you didn't have anyway. Why not do so, he whispered. Again, William felt he had no choice but to agree, and nodding he pushed the wager to the centre of the table. The extraordinary victory and its fallout of the young gentleman had attracted the attention of others, and a small crowd had gathered in the anteroom to witness what happened next. Drinks were called for, and with the wagers placed, the hands were dealt. William took up his cards, realising he had a poor hand, and calculating the odds of what the others held up too. One of them has two aces, and one has two jacks. I've got the tens, but I'd risk no one else having two of those, William thought to himself. His strategy was simple, and as they played he continued to calculate the odds as to who held which hand. It was not difficult for him, even as others would surely have struggled with the same task. An ace, a king, two tens, Prince Cavragon said, smiling as he put down his hand. William glanced at the others. One of them was bluffing. He had observed Mr Justice Peel to be, despite the office he held, a liar, claiming cards when he did not possess them. That was the point of the game, to deceive. But the judge appeared to reveal it in his actions, whereas Prince Cavragon was far harder to read. I've only got lows and a ten, Lord Ponsonby said, and Prince Cavragon smiled. You're bluffing, he said, glancing at William, who smiled. Actually, I'm not, he said, and laying down his cards, he revealed two aces, two queens, and no less than three kings. No one else could now win, and Mr Justice Peel threw his hand down with an angry exclamation. He's cheated, he said, pointing angrily at William, who shook his head. Don't be such a bad sport, I've been watching him the whole time, as have others. How could he possibly have cheated? he asked, and the judge snarled. Well, he's... he stammered, but there was no doubt as to William's victory. He had won the card game fairly, and now he took the wages from the centre of the table, smiling to himself as he counted his winnings. In all, William had won almost a thousand pounds that evening enough to live in considerable comfort for a year, let alone play the gentleman at the Charlton Lodge Ball. We thank you, gentlemen, for your kind hospitality, Digby said, 
placing his hand on William's shoulder. William nodded. He was astounded by his victory, even as he wondered what it would mean for the future. Are we to assume the name of William Baker won't be one to forget? Lord Carlyle asked, and Digby nodded. Quite right. Don't forget it, for I'm sure you'll part with more of your money, thanks to William's skill, he replied. And beckoning William to follow him, the two of them left the room as an uproar now ensued. On the stairs, William caught Digby's arm, astonished and yet angry at what had just occurred. What if my godfather finds out? Those men are bound to know him, he exclaimed. But Digby merely waved his hand dismissively. It hardly matters, does it? Do you think your godfather expects you to live the life of a cloistered nun in London? No, William, he knows what it's like to live the life of a gentleman. I've no doubt he's sat around that table himself often enough, winning and losing, he replied. William sighed. He was worried about the consequences, even as he could not help but think of the advantages his new skill conveyed. There would be no need of an apprenticeship if his luck at the card tables continued. I suppose. I did do rather well, William said, and Digby smiled. You did exceptionally well and now we'll celebrate, he replied, calling for the steward and ordering dinner be served to them in the dining room immediately. Chapter 13 with the money from his winnings, William was able to buy an entire set of new clothes, including tails and evening wear, for the forthcoming ball. Digby encouraged him to spend lavishly, and they spent the following day in Mayfair, visiting the most fashionable outfitters, where money brought them both finery and attention. An excellent cut, sir. We can make a few swift alterations, but it suits you very well, one of the tailors was saying, as William stood on a stool in the centre of the shop, being measured. He had never worn tails before. He had never had occasion to do so. But he had seen his godfather do so on several occasions and had always dreamed of doing so himself. Now his opportunity had come. But still he felt somewhat out of place, uncertain of himself, even as he wanted only to appear like all the rest. It's a little tight, he said, but the tailor merely waved his hand. Far better a little tight than a gentleman's breeches falling around his ankles during a dance, he replied. The tailor's right, William. A little tightness makes all the difference, Digby said. As in all things, Digby was offering advice. He insisted on accompanying William wherever he went and had himself bought a new set of tails from the outfitter at William's expense. Very well, a little tightness then, William replied even as he felt thoroughly uncomfortable in such formal attire. Shall I send it to your lodgings? the tailor asked. Yes, send everything there. We need it in time for the Charlton Lodge Ball, Digby replied. The tailor nodded. He seemed impressed, noting down the fact in large letters in his ledger. Goodness me, the Charlton Lodge Ball. It's very difficult to get an invitation to such an occasion, he said, and Digby smiled. It all depends on who you know, he replied. As they left the shop, William felt curious. He did not know how such occasions worked, and had realised they were not yet in possession of an invitation to the ball, even as they had told Anne they would be there. Don't we need to be invited? I don't even know the host, he said. But Digby only smiled and shook his head. It's all in hand, William, he replied. But William was not convinced. Anne had assumed him to be a gentleman with connections, even aristocratic ones. But being the godson of a duke counted for little. He was still a commoner, and despite his winnings it was not possible to buy one's way into such prestigious circles. The accident of birth was what mattered the most, and a penniless earl was still worth far more than a commoner with a fortune. But we don't have an introduction or anything like that. We don't know anyone. I don't, at least, he persisted. Digby paused, turning to him and smiling. You worry too much, William. These events are large, and invitations are extended in all different directions. If we arrive with a confident air about us, we'll be made welcome, he said. 
Then we're to go uninvited, William asked, for he could only imagine what would be the case if they did so and were discovered. But again, Digby shook his head. That's not what I said. We'll have an invitation, even if it doesn't come from the hosts themselves. Fear not. It'll be quite all right, he said, pausing to look into the window of another tailor's shop, where elegant velvet smoking jackets were displayed in the window. William sighed. He did not share Digby's confidence, but in all things, his new friend and mentor had been right, and William had no reason not to trust him. Besides, it was not the ball William wished to attend. He had little interest in dancing, and the thought of making polite conversation with those attending filled him with dread. The sole object of his thoughts was Anne, and the more he thought about her, the more he wanted to see her again. She had captivated him, and he thought of little else from waking to sleeping. She probably won't even remember me, he told himself, as they returned to the Spaniard's arms that evening. William was curious as to where their invitation would come from, and whether they would even gain entry to the ball, let alone the chance to greet Anne. She would be surrounded by eligible gentlemen, all of them far more eligible than William at least. He felt torn, wanting desperately to see her, and yet fearing she would reject him. Are you all right, William? You've been brooding into your tankard all night. What's the matter? You've discovered a talent at cards won a small fortune, and have much to look forward to, Digby said, coming to sit next to William at a table in the tap room that evening. It's just... Well, do you think she remembers me? Lady Anne, I mean, William said. He had thought of little else but her since the day of their encounter at the market, and again in the yard of the inn. But women like her were introduced to countless others, and surely... She had given him little thought since that moment. Digby smiled. I'm sure she does, William. I saw the way she looked at you the other day. It was she who suggested your coming to the ball, he said. William nodded, but his doubts remained, even as he hoped Digby's words were true. He had wanted so very much to make a good impression, even as he felt uncertain he was capable of doing so. Back in Lancashire there had been visits to country fairs, picnics by the river, the May Day celebrations, and all the other gatherings and pursuits of country life. William had courted, but there had been nothing serious, and he knew nothing of what it meant to fall in love. And without a father figure, the ways of the world were confusing, though his godfather and Professor Murray had always been kind to him. But wasn't she just being polite? Isn't that what women of her rank and class do? William asked fearing he had misread the signs or made an assumption as to Anne's behaviour towards him. Nonsense, William. You doubt yourself too much. Haven't I taught you anything about your own abilities? Digby replied. William nodded. If it had not been for his new friend and mentor, William would have been a fish out of water. He knew nothing of London and its ways, and he had found the experience of his new life quite overwhelming. But Digby had been his guide in all matters and William could only feel grateful towards him for his kindness and understanding. You've been very good to me, William admitted, and his friend smiled. Then trust me, William. I'm sure you've nothing to worry about. She was quite taken with you. I could see it, even if you couldn't, he said, and William nodded. Digby's words reminded him why he was doing as he was doing. This was all for Anne, or so he told himself. Anne was the reason for William's out-of-character behaviour. He had gambled, he had fenced, he had spent money lavishly and all for her, or so it seemed. Am I to make a fool of myself, he wondered, but there could be no going back now. The day of the ball was fast approaching, and William had already set forth on the course laid out for him. He had money, fine clothes, and was seen as a gentleman, albeit one with unknown connections. This was his chance and despite the difficulties, he was determined to prove himself. But could anything really come of it? After the ball, I mean. What then? What am I to do then? William said for again he knew nothing of what was expected of him. But Digby merely smiled and shook his head. You're thinking far too much ahead, William. Enjoy the moment. 
you've got money in your pocket, fine clothes on your back, and the prospect of dancing with a beautiful young lady. What more do you want? Digby said, and William smiled. His mentor was right. In that moment there was nothing else he could want, and despite his misgivings, William felt an overwhelming desire to see Anne again, a desire so strong it could overcome his reason and make him do things he might later regret. Chapter 14 Your father's given you the money. He wants you to look pretty for Lord Peter at the ball, Anne's mother said, handing Anne a purse. Anne looked at it in surprise. Her father was not usually so generous, though knew Anne it was more to do with impressions than kindness. Her father wanted her to marry Lord Peter, even as she had given him a decidedly unfriendly welcome when he had come to visit her. But I don't want a new dress. I've got plenty of dresses, Anne replied, looking up from the snug in which she was sitting, her favourite place to read in the corner of the drawing room. To her great disappointment, the Baron had not received quite the comeuppance she had hoped for in the novel she had just finished reading. After the struggle above the waterfall, he and the hero had fallen into the pool below, and the hero had been too busy struggling out of the water in search of the heroine to both much about the Baron. Anne had resolved to write a far more satisfactory novel herself, one in which the Baron-like character would be suitably punished. A villain should always be punished. That was how these things worked, or so she told herself. But it's the Charlton Lodge ball, Anne. You've got to have a new dress. You can't wear just anything, her mother replied, in tone suggestive of an obvious conclusion. Anne sighed. She knew there was no point in arguing. Her mother was only conveying what her father had obviously told him to, and taking the purse, she rose to her feet reluctantly. Do I really get to choose, mother? Or will you come with me and choose for me? she asked. The countess smiled. No, Anne, you can choose your own dress. I won't stand in the way of that, she replied. This was a small mercy, and Anne was at least glad to think she had some choices in her life, if only in terms of haberdashery. It was not long before she and Helen were riding in a carriage towards Mayfair to pay a visit to Anne's favoured modiste. What colour dress might you choose, my lady? Helen asked, as they pulled up outside Zagrebes, a fashionable emporium frequented by society ladies. Purple, I think. I've not had a purple dress before, Anne replied, thinking of the associations the colour had with magic and charm. Purple was often the colour worn by the heroines in her penny novels. She was not thinking about Lord Peter. His impression of her made no difference, but instead, she was thinking of William, and had noticed him pull out a purple handkerchief on their first encounter in the marketplace. It was a small detail, but it gave her pleasure to think on it, and now she stepped down from the carriage, intending to use her father's money to buy the dress she wanted, and not that of anyone else's desire. Good morning, Lady Miller. Is it for the Charlton Lodge Ball? Miss Zagreb, the proprietress, asked, as Anne and Helen entered the shop. Miss Zagreb was a voluptuous woman, dressed in a flowing red silk gown with a large fascinator on her head, made of peacock feathers. She had provided many dresses for Anne over the years, and now she ushered her into the inner sanctum of the shop, where dozens of different dresses were hung, waiting to be tried. That's right, Miss Zagreby. I'm sure I'm not the first lady to come on such an errand, Anne replied, and the modista smiled. No, my lady, you're certainly not. And what colour might you seek? she asked. The dresses around the room were arranged by colour and shade, so that red gave way to orange, then to yellow and green, into blue, indigo and violet, the colours of the rainbow. It was a pleasing arrangement, and Anne pointed to the end of the spectrum, keen to try anything with a purple hue. Indigo, I think, or violet, perhaps, she said as Miss Zagreba pulled several of the dresses from the racks. These were merely samples, and the modista boasted an impressive number of assistants who stitched and sewed long into the night to satisfy the demands of her demanding customers. Anne would choose the colour and style, and Miss Zagreb would do the rest. 
Yes, I think those colours would work on you, and your measurements haven't changed since last time, the modiste said, looking Anne up and down. This was a compliment. Miss Zagreb could tell a lady's measurements just by looking at her. She knew the measurements of every aristocratic young lady in town, knowledge she prided herself on possessing. Anne smiled. She did not particularly enjoy choosing dresses. In the pages of her novels, the women were always effortless in their fashion, perhaps because the books were written by men who knew nothing of such things. A heroine was always impeccably dressed and without any effort or difficulty on her part. Real life was different, and Anne knew well enough the struggle to look her best. What do you suggest, Miss Zagreb? Anne asked, for she knew the modiste liked to be asked her opinion on matters of fashion. Miss Zagreb held up several offerings, narrowing her eyes and tutting. No, no, these won't do. They're not right, let me see, she said, talking as much to herself as to Anne, who glanced at Helen, hoping her maid would reassure her as to the choice she would make. I rather like... purple. The different shades, Anne said, thinking again of William's handkerchief. I do like the purple, my lady. It certainly suits you, she said and Anne nodded. I like it too. I like this one, she said, just as Miss Zagreba tossed a particularly pretty dress aside. The modiste looked at her in surprise. You like this one, my lady, she asked, with a tone of scepticism, as she retrieved the dress from the pile. Anne did like the dress. It was modest, with lace trim at the sleeves and a high neckline. The colour was a deep purple, quite like William's handkerchief, and Anne could picture herself wearing it at the Charlton Lodge Ball, the skirts loose enough for dancing, though not long enough so as to be trampled on. I do, yes. I'd like to try it on, if I may, Anne replied. The modiste nodded, and Anne and Helen were ushered into the changing area, where a large plush curtain in red velvet was drawn across, and Miss Zagreba returned to the front of the shop. She's such a snob, my lady, Helen whispered, for it was well known Miss Zagreba liked to be the one to make the final decision over what the women who came to her wore, even if they themselves did not realise it. I want to wear something I like, not something meant to impress the likes of Lord Peter, Anne replied, though it was not Lord Peter she wanted to impress. She had noticed William's purple handkerchief and had wanted to choose a dress he would notice, if he was even there. She feared he might simply disappear, for she had heard nothing from him, or of him in the days since their encounter outside the inn. Anne was curious about William, an apparent gentleman with prestigious connections, and yet he was known to no one in society, as far as she could gather. It'll need a little alteration, my lady. But it looks very fine on you, Helen said, as Anne admired herself in the mirror of the changing area twirling the skirts back and forth and nodding in agreement. Then we'll take it, she said, as Helen drew back the curtain. Miss Zagreb was waiting at the front of the shop, whilst an assistant was hurrying back and forth with the discarded dresses, hanging them back onto the rainbow-shaded racks. She looked Anne up and down, nodding curtly. Are you certain about this, Lady Miller? she asked, as though the matter was one of life and death. Anne nodded. I am Miss Zagreb. I'll take it, thank you. Will you make the necessary alterations and have it sent to my father's townhouse, she said. Miss Zagreb nodded. As you wish, my lady, she replied, and Anne nodded. She's so pompous. You'd think she was doing us a favour by deigning to sell one of her precious dresses, Anne said, as she and Helen left the modiste a few moments later. She's always been like that, my lady. Helen replied, shaking her head. Well, at least I've chosen my dress. Do you think it'll meet with approval? Anne asked. She knew it was a leading question, and Helen looked at her in surprise. The approval of whom, my lady? Your mother and father? Lord Peter Ulverston? Or someone else? She asked, and Anne blushed. I think you know, she said, for she did not want to embarrass herself even as she could not stop thinking about William and her hope of seeing him again.
Her thoughts about him had become more pronounced in recent days. He represented an alternative, and more than that, a choice. It was William, not Lord Maximilian Oakley, or Lord Peter Ulverston, or any of her mother and father's preferences. She wanted, and she hoped he would want her, too. William represented possibility, the possibility of making her own decisions, and it was a possibility Anne was determined to seize. Don't put all your eggs in one basket, my lady. You've only met him twice, Helen replied as they climbed into their waiting carriage. Don't put a dampener on things, Helen, Anne replied. I'm only thinking practically, my lady. I'd hate to see you upset. It's those penny novels you read. They give such a false sense of what's true, the maid said, shaking her head. Anne sighed. Helen was right. In the pages of the books she read, it was always so easy. The man and woman met, they fell in love, and that was that. There was never any foil to the proposal, and no question of a happy outcome. But real life was different, and Anne wondered if she would ever see William again, let alone in her purple dress. Well, we can only hope, but come now, I need some new gloves, the elbow length sort. I couldn't bear another moment with Miss Zagreb, I want to choose my own. Let's go to the Bewdale Arcade, Anne said. The Bewdale Arcade was a fashionable set of shops, built between two streets in what had once been an alleyway. Now it was transformed with marble and lights and covered by a glass roof, reminiscent of the Parisian arcades, with their endless rows of shops and fashionable outlets. We could visit Putin's, my lady. There's not a finer glover in all the city, Helen said, and the matter was settled. Their carriage pulled up outside the entrance to the arcade, where a liveried steward stood to ensure only the right sort of person was admitted to the hallowed precincts. As they passed, he gave a curt bow and tipped his hat, smiling at them as they stepped into the marbled interior beneath the glass walkway. All manner of exquisite goods could be purchased in the arcade, shoes and confectionery, millinery and lace, dainty cakes and biscuits, dresses and ball gowns. The window displays were a feast for the eyes, and Anne and Helen marvelled at everything they saw. Look at these fascinators, Helen. I've never seen such exotic plumage, Anne said, as they looked into one of the windows, where brightly coloured feathers festooned the display. And look there, my lady, the hats, Helen said, pointing across the marbled floor to another window beyond, where dozens of hats, some with brims wider than any doorway, were displayed. But as Anne turned, she was startled and delighted by the sight of none other than William Baker himself. He was standing alone in front of a gentleman's outfitters, inspecting a display of silk waistcoats in the window. Look, it's Mr. Baker, Anne exclaimed, a shiver of expectant delight running through her. It seemed strange to find him alone. Where was his companion? The man, Digby Kirkpatrick, had introduced himself as some sort of mentor, and Anne was curious as to why William should be alone. Surely he had a valet or manservant to accompany him under such circumstances. For a moment she watched him, uncertain of what to do. The sight of him made her heart beat fast, and she was all of a flutter at the thought of speaking to him. Shall we approach him, my lady? Helen asked. Anne detested being chaperoned, even as she knew it was an unavoidable burden. In her penny novels, the heroines so often did precisely what they pleased, with no regard for social convention. But social convention mattered, certainly to Anne's mother, and she had already taken a considerable risk in visiting the market alone to buy the loaf of bread. I want to, yes, Anne whispered, even as she was uncertain what to say. Don't startle the poor man, my lady, Helen said, even as Anne was lost in thought as to how to approach him. Good morning, Mr. Baker. William. No, that sounds too formal, but then it should be. Mr. Baker, I... I'm glad to see you again. No, I'm happy to see you again. Delighted. We were just passing, but we weren't, were we? Are you shopping? Why else would you be gazing into a shop window? I see you've chosen something to wear for the ball but gentlemen don't need to choose. They wear the same things, albeit in slightly different permutations. 
Mr. Baker, how nice to see you. Anne thought to herself, trying to decide what to say, even as she knew she could not stand gawping at William indefinitely. If William turned around, he would see her watching him, and as much as it delighted her to do so, Anne knew he would think her rather odd to be doing so. Taking a deep breath, she approached, not wishing to startle him, as he continued to gaze at the display of waistcoats. How am I to choose between the cuts? I've never worn a... Oh, my goodness, William exclaimed as Anne touched him gently on the elbow. He turned to her in surprise, and she smiled at him, blushing at having interrupted his musings. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. We were just shopping for a pair of gloves. For the Charlton Lodge Ball, our invitations arrived yesterday, Anne said, and William smiled. Ah, yes, I was just doing the same he said, glancing back at the window display. Anne was surprised. Whilst women were expected to wear a different dress for just about any occasion, and woe betide them if they did not, a gentleman would dress in precisely the same way whatever the occasion. A frock coat and tails purchased when a young man entered society could, with the care of a good valet, last a lifetime. Did William not possess such items himself? Something new to wear, she asked, and he nodded. Ah, yes, there's not much call for waistcoats and finery in Lancashire, and we're far more provincial up there. One comes to London and, well, the choice, he said. Anne felt embarrassed. She had made an assumption about him. In London society, there was no question of new dresses, gloves, hats, anything desired. But in the provinces, things were surely different, and now she pointed to a purple waistcoat with red trim. I like that one. My own dress is the same colour. We've just come from Miss Zagrebe's, Anne replied. The purple waistcoat was the most expensive in the window, but cost was not something Anne ever had to consider. She had little concept of money. Her father would pay for anything she needed, and whilst her tastes were modest, extravagance was well within her grasp. William looked at the waistcoat and nodded. Yes, it's very nice, he said and Anne smiled. Oh, do buy it then. We'll match if you do. Wouldn't that be marvellous, she said, imagining the look on Lord Peter's face at the sight of them together. In this, Anne knew she was playing a dangerous game. The possibility of scandal was always present. The matchmaking between her and Lord Peter would already be known of in society, and she would be expected to appear on his arm at the Charlton Lodge Ball, the happy and expectant bride-to-be. To be seen with William would be a talking point, scandalous even, though Anne did not care. She wanted to be seen with William if he wanted to be seen with her. I, well, yes, if you like it, he said, glancing at the waistcoat with its expensive price tag hanging from the lapel. I adore it, she exclaimed. I must say I do like the colour purple, William said and Anne felt pleased to have remembered this small detail about him. I like it too. I saw your handkerchief the other day. That's why I chose the dress, you see, she said, hoping he would not think her too forward. But William only smiled. What a wonderful memory you've got, he said, and for a moment they stood looking at one another, their gaze locked, each of them caught up in the happiness of their chance encounter. We mustn't keep Mr. Baker for too long, my lady. I'm sure he's got important matters to attend to, Helen said, and Anne was brought back to her senses with a startle. Oh, yes, forgive me. Are you meeting your friend? she asked, but William shook his head. No, he's rather busy today. I'll see him tonight at the inn. I'd better get on with my shopping, but I'm so looking forward to seeing you again at Charlton Lodge, he said, and Anne blushed. As am I, and, well, you might hear things about me, my connection to a certain Lord Peter Ulverston. But you mustn't think. Well, it's not what others might say, she said. He looked at her curiously, even as Helen took Anne by the arm. Come along, my lady, the gloves, she whispered. William gave a curt bow, smiling at Anne, as she and Helen hurried off across the marble floor. Anne kept glancing back, finding William watching her go, his expression one of rapture, or so it seemed. 
Anne's mind was filled with thoughts of her encounter. Had she said the right things? He had been charming, even as she had caught him by surprise. The way he looked at her. He's quite charming, isn't he? But, oh, I don't know, it's all very odd, isn't it? No valet, living at an inn with that man, he's rather curious, too. And yet, he's so different from the others. You don't know, though, do you? You hardly know him. He's like a character in one of my novels. One only knows what the writer wants to tell. That's the problem, I suppose. I wish there weren't so many rules. I wish I wasn't caught up with Lord Peter, Anne thought to herself, still glancing over her shoulder as Helen pulled her away. Why did you drag me away like that, Helen? Anne hissed as they rounded a corner in the arcade. Because you were being looked at, my lady. A gaggle of women to one side were whispering behind their fans, and Lady Allcroft was amongst them. She knows your mother well, Helen whispered, as they turned to look in the window of a confectioner. Anne sighed. She knew she had taken a risk in speaking to William as she had done. The ability of such women to disseminate gossip was unparalleled, and Anne knew her maid had only been trying to help by pulling her away. She herself had not noticed the women watching her. So caught up had she been in William's gaze, and now she imagined what it would be like to dance together at the ball, even as the spectacle was certain to cause a scandal amongst those same women who had just been watching them. Am I forever to be prevented from finding happiness? Anne asked as they entered the glove shop a few moments later. I hope not, my lady, but it wouldn't do to seize on the first opportunity presented, Helen replied. But despite her maid's wise words, Anne could not rid herself of thoughts of William and what was now their third chance encounter. What would happen when they found themselves together at the ball, and would it be an encounter to serve for something more? Chapter 15 That'll be twenty shillings, sir, the tailor said as he handed William the wrapped waistcoat. William swallowed hard, unable to believe the cost of what was essentially a piece of fabric stitched and buttoned. Nevertheless, he paid for it, thanking the tailor and stepping out into the arcade, glancing from left to right in the hope of catching sight of Anne once again. But she was gone, and only a group of women, gossiping behind their fans by the window of a millinery shop, remained. What would my mother say? William thought to himself imagining what such a sum of money would mean to so many people like her. But William had been caught up in the fantasy of possibility represented by the purple waistcoat. Anne had told him she liked it, and he had been flattered by the thought of her having selected her own dress on the basis of the colour of his handkerchief, even as he wondered if that was really the reason. Nevertheless, she had been kind to say it, and he was only too glad to think they would make a matching pair at the ball. I suppose I'll wear it again, he told himself, trying to justify the expense, even as he felt guilty for those things he had succumbed to in order to make the impression he intended. Gambling, expensive clothes, false impressions, none of it was the reason his godfather had sent William to London. That day, he had been supposed to call at a firm of solicitors in Westminster, but the lure of the shops had prevented him, and with the money he had won at Boodle's, William had been eager to make preparations for the ball. Buy something noticeable. You need to stand out amongst the others, Digby had said, and the purple waistcoat would certainly do that. William bought some shoes along with a cravat, also in purple, before wandering through the arcade, looking in the windows and marvelling at the sights around him. London was a far cry from Lancashire, with its provincial ways, and it seemed anything was possible in the capital of dreams. William's thoughts were preoccupied by Anne. He could only imagine how beautiful she would look at the Charlton Lodge Ball, but something she had said had unsettled him. She had spoken of receiving an invitation, and as far as William knew, he and Digby had received no such invitation themselves. It would be a fine thing to find ourselves thrown out of the ball before the first dance, William thought to himself, for there were certain to be chances who attempted to enter without invitation and who were summarily ejected. This thought continued to trouble him for the rest of the day. He had learned to dance, bought the finest clothes, and set himself up, at least in the eyes of others, as a gentleman. 
but if no invitation was forthcoming, the situation was surely hopeless. How embarrassing it would be to find themselves ejected. William would never be able to look Anne in the eye again. He found doing so difficult enough as it was and was fearful of being discovered for who he truly was. I'm just a pauper with aristocratic connections. I've lied to her, or at least not been truthful. The money I've made. It's all a falsity, William told himself, for he was beginning to doubt the certainty of what Digby had promised. He found his friend and mentor in the taproom of the Spaniards Inn. Digby had been away on business that day, to where and with whom William was not privy, and now he greeted him warmly as William came to sit down next to him. I've ordered you a drink. Did you get everything you wanted? The arcade is quite impressive, isn't it? Digby said, as the landlord brought over a tankard of Ailey. William nodded. He'd been impressed by the places Digby had recommended and had found everything he needed amidst the marbled grandeur of the arcade. I did, though the cost of a waistcoat, William began, but Digby dismissed him with a laugh and wave of his hand. Fine tailoring costs money, William. You can't go to the Charlton Lodge Ball in just anything, can you? Digby replied, looking at William pointedly. William shook his head. He knew his new mentor was right, even as he still felt a fraud for his intentions. No, but I met Lady Miller today. She mentioned an invitation. Do we have an invitation? William asked. Digby's eyes narrowed. Ah, yes, I wondered when you'd ask me that. I wasn't going to bother you with it otherwise. You're right. We do need an invitation, but it's all in hand. I've managed to acquire one. At least, I will do tonight, he replied, and William looked at him curiously. I don't understand. How can you acquire one? William asked. Digby was, by all accounts, a respectable man, well connected in the capital and with a good reputation. But there were things about him William found curious. His knowledge of gambling and fencing, his unexplained business dealings, and the fact of his connection to the aristocracy. William was certain there was more to Digby than he knew, though as to what that meant, William was uncertain. It was all very curious, and the mention of the invitation only served to arouse that curiosity further. Through as printing press, that's how, Digby replied, and William's eyes grew wide with fearful astonishment. A forgery, he exclaimed, and Digby gave him an angry look. Don't say it so loudly, William. Yes, a forgery, but it wouldn't be the first time. It's very simple. I know a man with a printing press. He can print anything he turns his mind to. It won't be difficult, I assure you, Digby replied. William was sceptical. The clothes, the money, the gentlemanly ways, all of it was a forgery in one way or another. But this would be the ultimate act of deception. William would not even be at the Charlton Lodge Ball on merit. He would be there as a result of forgery, and the thought of it turned his stomach. It's wrong, Digby. What would my godfather say? William demanded, shaking his head. Digby looked at him for a moment before shaking his head and sighing. I doubt he'd be too worried about deception, he replied. William did not understand his words, though he could only imagine the disappointment on his godfather's face if the truth was revealed. William had been sent to London to make an honest man of himself, not to become something he was not. He wouldn't like it, Digby. Neither would my mother, William replied, adamant he would have no part in it. Very well. If you don't want to see Lady Miller again, that's up to you, isn't it? Digby replied. William's heart sank. Anne was the reason for it all. It was because of her he had gone along with the deception, with the gambling, with the expense. He had already waded deep into the waters of trickery and emerged as something he was not. His sole purpose had been to impress her, even as he was now having second thoughts as to how far into the deception he had sunk. But I... I do, William replied, for he could think of nothing else but seeing Anne again and was desperate to do so. Then swallow your pride, my friend. Doesn't everyone help themselves along a little? A leg up, that sort of thing. There'll be plenty of people there unworthy of an invitation. All we're doing is ensuring... Well, certainty, he said, 
smiling at William in that persuasive manner he so often adopted. I suppose so. It's just, well, isn't it all rather underhand? William replied. And do you think those gentlemen in Boodle's Club wouldn't have behaved in an underhand manner if they could have done? They'd have taken every penny they had if you weren't so clever as to beat them at their own game. No, William, we can't let ourselves be trampled on. Take advantage of the situation. It's the only way, Digby said, finishing his drink and rising to his feet. But where are we going? William asked as his friend beckoned him to follow. To see a man with a printing press, of course, Digby replied as an unpleasant smile came over his face. It was dark by the river, rows of warehouses stretching out along the waterside amidst a maze of narrow streets and alleyways. William glanced nervously around him, following Digby, who turned this way and that past the grubby windows of an inn, where the sounds of a fight could be heard coming from within and up a flight of steps to a large door with a small lamp burning above it. They had walked for about a mile into a part of the city William had never been to before. It felt dangerous, and William could not imagine how Digby had come to find connections in such a salubrious place. Is this it? William asked as Digby knocked three times in sharp succession at the door. This is it, Digby replied as a cover was pulled back and a pair of eyes glowered out. Yes, a man's voice came from inside. The larks come out in May, Digby said, much to William's surprise. The cover was pulled back and bolts creaked, the door opening to allow them entry. Digby, I... William began, but his friend raised his hand. Let me do the talking, William, he said as the two of them stepped over the threshold. William found himself in a narrow hallway with a flight of steps leading up in front and doors to right and left. It was lit by candlelight, and now he caught a glimpse of the man who had opened the door. He was short, wizened, with hardly any hair, and narrow, sunken eyes, illuminated in the light of the lamp he was holding in his hand. Monsieur Bataille will see you, though why he's concerning himself with you. I don't know, the man said. We go back some years, Digby replied, and the man shook his head. This way then, he said, and he led them up the stairs to a landing and through a large door at the far end. William was confused. The house, if it was a house, and was unfurnished, and seemed entirely secretive. There was no one else around, and the man, who had not introduced himself, knocked loudly at door. Come in a voice thick with a French accent replied. The door was opened, and William and Digby were ushered into a large room, comfortably furnished with chairs and a table, and where a printing press stood in the far corner and a fire burned in the hearth. Sitting in one of the chairs was a man who sprang to his feet and greeted Digby warmly. Denzel, my old friend, it's been years, Digby said as the two men embraced. Too many years, my friend, too many, and now we find ourselves brought together again. I was surprised when I heard your name, but glad too. We old friends must stick together, he said, patting Digby on the back. In my letter, I told you of my friend, William Baker, Digby said, and William stepped forward to introduce himself. Denzel smiled. He was a tall, thin man with black hair and an unpleasant smile. He looked William up and down and nodded. Ah, yes, of course, young Mr. Baker, or should I say your lordship, he replied, grinning at William, who looked at him in confusion. I... I don't understand, William replied, and Digby laughed. Denzel owns a printing press, William. He's going to print the invitations, one or two other things too. We'll give you all the credentials you need. I thought we'd make you the son of a Marquess. We can invent the history easily enough and tell Lady Miller you were only being modest in your previous introductions, Digby said. William shook his head. It was one thing to pretend as to wealth and influence, but quite another to descend into the depths of a lie, the ramifications of which could be immense. No, I don't want a title. I can't pretend to be something I'm not, William replied. Why not? Plenty of others do. You'd be surprised how many people come to me wanting to be something they're not. Denzel replied, beckoning William and Digby towards the printing press. Make the Honourable William Baker, that'll do. I believe you've seen a sample of the invitation already, 
Digby said, and Denzel nodded. I've printed half a dozen. You're not the only ones who wanted them. But it comes at a price, Digby. Even for you, the Frenchman replied. Digby glanced at William. This was the moment of truth. There could be no going back. But William had already made himself into something he was not. The invitation was just window dressing. And with a sigh, he nodded. Had it not been for Anne, William would have never agreed. But the thought of her, of seeing her again, of knowing her affections for him, spurned him on. Very well, I'll pay whatever it costs, he said. And Denzel smiled. Let's set to work then, he replied, taking a set of ink blocks and placing them into the press. He worked quickly and efficiently, so it was not long before the first attempt at production was made, and the Frenchman held up a sample for them to see, the machine having clattered down the stamp onto a piece of stiff parchment. Marvellous! Digby exclaimed as William peered over his shoulder. The Lord and Lady Peel request the pleasure of the company of the Honourable William Baker at a summer ball to be held at Charlton Lodge, etc. William read, marvelling at the sight of his own name, printed with such poise and precision. He imagined Anne's name in its place, an official invitation, rather than a lie. His hands trembled as he reached out to take the piece of parchment, holding it up to examine it. There were slight smudges and minor imperfections, but these could surely be corrected. It's remarkable, he said, and Denzel smiled. Why, yes, I pride myself on my forgeries. When one can fool the Bank of England, a steward at a ball shouldn't be too much of a problem, he replied, laughing, even as William knew the deed was done and there could be no going back. This is all for Anne, he told himself, hoping it would be worth the risk he was taking and the possibility of scandal. Chapter 16 We could try putting your hair up, my lady. It's becoming quite fashionable, Helen said as Anne sat in front of the mirror in her bedroom, gazing at her reflection. It was the night of the ball, and Anne had spent the afternoon getting ready. The purple dress from Miss Zagrebo had arrived that morning and was every bit as pretty as Anne had hoped. It fitted perfectly, and only her hair remained left to see to. Fashionable. Am I to set fashions now? Anne replied, laughing at the prospect of being noticed in such a way. Helen smiled and shook her head. There's nothing wrong with taking up a fashion, my lady. Not when it's so popular. You've got such beautiful hair. Wearing it up would show your cheeks and neckline, Helen replied. Anne thought of the heroines in her books. They were always so pretty, so perfect in their looks and mannerisms. On a windswept moor, on the bow of a ship, at the top of a tall tower in a medieval castle, they always looked their best. Anne considered herself to be quite plain, though others would not hear of it, and she had been called pretty on many occasions. She liked her hair, long, sleek and auburn, and was uncertain whether she wanted to follow fashion as Helen suggested. Will it make him notice me, do you think? Anne asked, for she was thinking of William and wondering what he would think of her when he saw her. Her maid looked at her reflection and smiled. I don't know, my lady, but it can't hurt, can it? she asked. It can if it attracts the attentions of Lord Peter, Anne replied, for she had no intention of making her father's preference think she had made an effort for him. That very day, Lord Peter had sent a dozen red roses to the house, and Anne feared he would stop at nothing to mark her dance card in its entirety. Would William even get a chance to speak to her, let alone dance with her? Please, my lady, let me try and make something of your hair, Helen said, and Anne smiled. Very well, but I hope it has the desired effect, she replied. Helen beamed at her, and it was not long before Anne's hair was tied up in a bun, styled as was the fashion of the day. There, my lady, what do you think? Helen asked stepping back to admire her handiwork. The effect was certainly different, and Anne had to admit she rather liked it. But what would William think? This was the question she was preoccupied with, and not just concerning her hair. They had met on three separate occasions, but Anne really knew very little about him, and he about her. This was the moment of anticipation, of excitement, 
at what might be rather than what was. Whenever she thought of him, his handsome looks, his kindly demeanour, his smile and wit, Anne's heart fluttered. She wanted desperately to see him again, even as she felt terribly anxious as to what their meeting would bring. I think it's a delight, Helen, thank you, Anne replied, and the maid smiled. I just want everything to be perfect for you, my lady, she said, as Anne rose to her feet, and Helen sprayed her with scent from a large atomizer, the perfume filling the with heady floral notes. That's very kind of you, Helen. I've not enjoyed these occasions in the past, but tonight, well, I'm so very much looking forward to seeing him, she said, thinking wistfully of William and all he represented. If only her parents could be persuaded to see her obvious affections for him. He was the perfect gentleman and would surely be viewed as a suitable match. He already had business interests in the city, and shopping in the Budale Arcade surely meant he had wealth. A man did not have to have a title to be worthy of marriage in aristocratic circles, though William would have to prove himself more than a titled opponent. Nevertheless, Anne felt certain he could do so, and she was looking forward to introducing him to her parents and planting the seed of possibility in their minds. And I'm sure he's looking forward to seeing you too, my lady. But you mustn't be disappointed if, well, things aren't entirely as you want them to be. What if Lord Peter makes trouble for you? Helen asked. Anne sighed. Helen was nothing if not practical. But she was right. The distinct possibility of confrontation remained. If Lord Peter took offence against William's attentions, or Anne's attentions towards William, trouble would surely follow. Well, I haven't done anything to give the suggestion to Lord Peter. It's my father's fault if he thinks he's in with a chance of gaining my hand. Anne replied. Thank you for watching. Before we continue into the story, do us a favor. Hit the subscribe button this way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. That much was true. She had sent no note of thanks for the dozen red roses, nor had she offered a warm welcome to her father's business associate when he had called at the house. While Stan would never been openly rude, there were ways and means of making her feelings felt. She had learned that, at least, from the pages of her penny novels. Be careful, my lady. You know what the tongue can be like, Helen replied. But Anne did not wish to think about it. She wanted to think about happy things. And now she took Helen's hands in hers, whirling her about the room as though they were caught up in a waltz. La, 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 dee, 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 la, 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 she hummed as Helen laughed. Oh, my lady, stop it. You'll bring me out in a hot flush, Helen exclaimed, just as the door opened, and Anne's mother appeared, holding a jewellery box in her hand. She looked at the scene before her and laughed, even as Helen stepped back in embarrassment and lowered her head. Helen and I were just dancing, mother. I feel so happy, Anne replied, even as she knew Helen did not share her sentiment. Her mother smiled at her. She was not a harsh woman, and Anne knew she had her best interests at heart, even as sometimes they clashed with Anne's own intentions. Well, I'm glad to see you're feeling happy at the prospect of the ball. I was rather worried you weren't looking forward to it. Lord Peter's obviously changed your mind, the Countess said. Anne was not about to disabuse her mother of this thought, even as it was entirely incorrect. It was not the prospect of seeing Lord Peter she found exciting. Far from it, but the possibility of snatching even a few moments with William. That was her hope, and she had pinned all her happiness on the possibility of realising it. Oh no, it's... I'm looking forward to it. Helen's even done my hair for me. It's a new style, she said, and her mother nodded. Yes. Well, I'm not sure about a new style, Anne. But if you like it, then so be it, she said for the Countess did not entirely approve of new styles. It's what they're wearing in Paris, my lady, Helen ventured, looking up, still with an embarrassed expression on her face. Yes, and a lot of them aren't wearing their heads anymore in Paris. That's what happens when fashions change. We must hope and pray such revolutionary fashion doesn't visit itself entirely on us here, mustn't we? Anne's mother replied. Yes, my lady, Helen replied. 
Oh, don't be so harsh on Helen, mother. She just wants me to look nice for... Lord Peter, Anne said, and her mother smiled. And that's just what I want too, Anne. That's why I've brought you these she said, holding out the jewellery box for Anne, who opened it to reveal an exquisite pair of pearl earrings, inlaid in silver, sitting amidst red plush. They were beautiful, and Anne's eyes grew wide with astonishment. Oh, mother, aren't they just... a delight, she said, taking one carefully in her hand to examine it. The craftsmanship was remarkable, and there was no doubting their value either. They were my mother's, and I'd like you to have them. I think you'll look very pretty wearing them, the Countess said as Anne tried them on. They matched her purple dress, and having hair tied up allowed the earrings to be visible too. Anne admired herself in the mirror, the earrings reflecting the late afternoon sunshine coming through the window. Am I really to have them, Mother? It's so kind of you, Anne said, and she embraced the Countess and kissed her on the cheek, even as she felt a pang of guilt at accepting the earrings on false pretenses. Anne's father had paid for her new dress, gloves, shoes, shawl and fascinator, but the earrings were a personal gift, one of true sentimentality from mother to daughter. It brought a tear to Anne's eye to think of her mother's kindness. They were so often at odds, but Anne knew her mother loved her dearly, despite their oft differences in opinion. I want you to have them, Anne. My mother gave them to me on my wedding day, and now I want you to have them on the eve of possibility to come. I do hope you'll do the sensible thing. Lord Peter's a good man, and there's no shame in allowing your father to guide you towards the right match, the Countess said. But I'm to be the one who decides, aren't I, mother? Anne asked. Her mother looked at her and nodded. It's for us all to decide together, Anne, she replied and Anne forced a smile to her face. Then I'm sure it'll all work out just fine. But shouldn't we be going, Mother? We don't want to be the last to arrive, Anne said, just as a distant clock in the hallways below struck the hour. Good heavens, you're right. I must fetch my shawl. Gwen, do you have my shawl? The Countess called out, hurrying from the room and calling to her maid, as Helen looked up and smiled. They're beautiful earrings, my lady. They look just right with your dress, she said, as Anne admired herself in the mirror once again. It was very kind of my mother, wasn't it? I just hope... Well, I hope she can forgive me when the time comes, Anne replied. She feared her mother's anger and that of her father. They had gone to such efforts to secure a match, first with Lord Maximilian and now with Lord Peter but Anne only wanted to make up her own mind in the matter, and to secure a match not for personal gain, but for love. Don't rush into anything, my lady. Remember, you don't know this man, not at all. He might turn out to be entirely different from what you imagine. He might not be, well, the man for you, Helen said, shaking her head. But Anne would not entertain the thought, even as she knew its possibility was all too true infatuation. That was what she felt. She knew William only by chance and without any form of proper introduction. He could be something far different from her impression. And whilst her feelings for him were clear, she knew they were born of a desire for something other than what she already had. But I've got to try, haven't I? I've got to see if he can be, she replied, and Helen gave her a weak smile. I don't know, my lady. Perhaps, but be careful, she said. Anne thought of the heroines in her books. Were they careful? They took risks and would often throw caution to the wind for the sake of love. Nothing held them back. They did precisely what they pleased. There was never mention of a chaperone or societal expectation. The women in the pages of these stories always got what they wanted. Such was the order of things. I'm tired of always being careful, Helen. I don't want to be careful any more. Don't you think... Well, this was meant to be, Anne asked, wanting to find some kind of justification for her behaviour, as bizarre as it might seem. Her encounter with William in the market had been a coincidence, but meeting him twice since then had surely been fated. It's a little early for that, isn't it, my lady? You need to meet him first, get to know him. 
you might find yourself disappointed, Helen said. But Anne had heard enough. She would make her own decision as far as William was concerned, and for now she felt certain he was everything she wanted him to be. A gentleman, a romantic hope, a man she could throw her troubles onto and find a balm in stormy seas. Taking up her shawl, she bid Helen good night, as her mother called out to her from the landing. I don't know what time we'll be back, Helen. There's no need to stay awake. I'll see you in the morning, and I hope I'll have something exciting to tell you, she said, smiling at Helen, who shook her head and sighed. You look beautiful, my lady. Don't let any man upset you, she replied. The Countess was waiting for Helen as she emerged from her bedroom, and Helen smiled at her mother, who offered her arm, the two of them making their way down the stairs together. Anne's father was waiting in the hallway, dressed in his frock coat and tails. This outfit feels tighter every time I wear it. Come now, we should be on our way, he said, as the butler hurried to open the door. A carriage was waiting for them, and Anne smiled to herself at the thought of what the evening would bring. Remember, Anne, you're to dance first with Lord Peter, then a second time at least, the Countess said, as they settled back in the carriage compartment. Yes, Mother, I know, but I can dance with others too, can't I? Anne replied, for she did not want to fight over the matter, even as her mother seemed intent on laying down the rules for the evening. If Lord Peter permits it, yes her mother said, and Anne rolled her eyes. I don't normally enjoy these occasions, she said, and the Earl laughed. Well, they're expected of you, Anne. We all have our crosses to bear. It's hardly an imposition, is it? You dance, you partake of the refreshments, you mingle, you talk, you smile, hardly a chore, he said, and Anne blushed. Her father was right. It was hardly a taxing task. Because, well, I knew you'd want me to dance with Lord Peter she said, hoping to deflect her father's criticism. He smiled at her and nodded as the carriage drove on. But as they approached Charlton Lodge, Anne felt increasingly nervous, knowing all too well the possibility of scandal lying ahead, even as she was only too willing to embrace it. Chapter 17 Can you help me, Digby? I don't know how to attach these, William admitted struggling with a pair of cufflinks. He had never worn the clothes now laid out in front of him and had no idea as to the proper order or way of dressing. He remembered his godfather once making mention of his valet. If it wasn't for Richards, I'd have all my clothes on inside out and back to front, he had once said, and William now understood what his godfather had meant. Holding out his arms, Digby attached the cufflinks to William's shirt sleeves angling them so the stud faced out. They had spent much of the afternoon getting ready, having visited a barber's shop for a haircut and hot shave earlier in the day. There now, you look very smart, William, like a proper gentleman, Digby said, as he helped William into the purple waistcoat. It fitted perfectly and looked exceedingly fine, so that William could not help but smile at the impression the looking glass gave. It does look rather fine, doesn't it? he said, imagining the look on Anne's face when she saw him. Why did you choose purple? Digby asked, and William smiled. Oh, because Lady Miller's dress is the same colour, he said, and Digby laughed. Is that the only reason? Purple carries all manner of connotations, William, a regal colour, redolent of the Roman Empire. Purple was always the most costly of dyes, Digby said. William had not thought about it like this. He simply liked the colour and was glad to think of himself matching with Anne. If anything, purple was a colour associated with mourning and he recalled entering the Catholic chapel in Burnley during Lent and seeing the altar festooned in purple cloths. Well, I'm sure you'll make quite the pairing at the ball tonight. Are you nervous? he asked. William was nervous, exceedingly so. But the moment of truth had arrived and there could be no going back. He had practised his dancing, dressed in his finery, and had the fake invitation in his pocket. For all intents and purposes, William was a gentleman, and it was as a gentleman he would now step out into the breach and to whatever fate awaited him. 
I just hope I don't make a fool of myself, William replied. It had been easy to say yes to Anne's suggestion he attended the ball at Charlton Lodge. But now the time had come, William's mind was filled with doubts. He knew nothing of the society he was entering, nor of how they would treat him. Like at Boodle's Club, William would be an unknown entity, looked on as both a possibility and a question mark. I'll be at your side the whole time, William. Haven't I proved myself a mentor to you since your arrival in London? Would I let you down in your hour of need? Digby asked. William shook his head. Digby certainly had some odd ways about him and there had been times when William had felt uncomfortable as to the way his new friend led him. He was still uncertain as to Digby's connection with the forger and the thought of continuing his attempts at gambling were unnerving. But there could be no doubting Digby's intentions, or so it seemed, and William was glad to have him at his side now. No, you wouldn't. I know that. But am I ready? Do I have everything I need? William asked. He wished his mother could have seen him now dressed in such finery. She would have been amazed, as would the Duke of Lancaster. William smiled to think himself as equal to Maximilian, and he wondered what his godfather's heir was doing that very moment. Not preparing to dance with a beautiful woman, I'm certain, William told himself as he checked his appearance in the looking glance one final time. You couldn't be more ready, William. You look the very part of a gentleman. I commend you, Digby said, and William smiled. I don't know what I did to deserve a friend like you, Digby. You've done so much for me and I hardly feel able to repay you in any meaningful way, William replied. Digby was selfless, and time and again he had proved himself to be the most excellent of friends. Now Digby shook his head and smiled. You owe me nothing, William. Can't a man take pleasure in seeing himself reflected in another? I look at you and I see myself thirty years ago, setting out into the world filled with hope and expectation but I had to make my own way. It wasn't easy, and I'm only too glad to share something of my own wisdom with you. I see great things in you, William, and all that begins tonight, Digby replied, as he took a brush and brushed the shoulders of William's waistcoat. They were ready now, each of them dressed in their finery, and they made their way down to the taproom, where the landlord looked them up and down with an impressive look on his face. No finer gentleman do we ever see here, he said, giving them both a curt bow. The Charlton Lodge ball beckons us, landlord, Digby said. Several drinkers turned to look at them, and William felt suddenly self-conscious. This was not how he usually dressed or behaved, if ever. He was the son of a seamstress, hailing from Lancashire. Had it not been for his godfather, William would have had nothing but the clothes he stood up in, and the simple job of a manservant or farm labourer. To be dressed in finery, to be on his way to a ball, to dance with a woman of high society. Digby, I'm not sure about this. It might not be the right thing to do, William said, but Digby placed his hand on William's shoulder with a reassuring look on his face. Don't let doubts hold you back, William. You've as much right to be there as they have. You're a gentleman. You're dressed as one. You're as rich as one. Doesn't that make you a gentleman? He asked. William was uncertain what did make a gentleman a gentleman. There appeared to be no specific rules governing the matter, even as it was clear who was and who was not one. As for himself, William was uncertain. He wanted to be a gentleman and had given the distinct impression of being one too. He nodded, allowing Digby to reassure him. It's just, I don't want to say the wrong thing, or give the wrong impression, he said, as Digby led him from the taproom out onto the street, where a carriage was waiting to take them to Charlton Lodge. People make the wrong impression all the time, William. That's what happens. It's how we recover from it that matters. Besides, I doubt you'll have any trouble. You're only there for one reason, aren't you? To see Lady Miller, Digby said, and William nodded. Had it not been for Anne, William would never even have heard of the ball, 
let alone possess an invitation to attend. His purpose in going was singular, and the object of that purpose was Anne alone. He wanted to see her, to speak to her, to dance with her, perhaps even... Steady on, you can't kiss her. It's not like a roll in the hay after a barn dance, he told himself, thinking back to the shenanigans of his youth in Lancashire. The Charlton Lodge Ball would be an elegant affair, dictated by stringent social customs. There would be no opportunity for misbehaviour, surely. If I see her, I'll be happy. If I talk to her, I'll be ecstatic. If I dance with her, well, I can't describe how I'll feel, William said, and Digby laughed. Well then, isn't it worth the nerves? he asked, and William agreed it was. As they drove in the carriage through the streets of London, William's mind was preoccupied with thoughts of Anne and the possibility of what was to come. He imagined the conversation between them, the glances, the smiles, the sense of nervous anticipation. My lady, Miss Miller, Lady Anne, Anne, it's such a pleasure to meet you again and don't you look pretty? No, she's not a lapdog to be fawned over. You look majestic. Oh, listen to yourself, majestic. What nonsense. No, you look lovely, my lady. Your beautiful dress, your eyes, your delicate skin. Stop it, delicate skin. What are you? Some penny novelist. No, I can't say that to her, but I... I wonder if... Oh, it's no use, William thought to himself. He did not know what he would say to Anne, or Lady Miller, as he should surely address her. She had remembered who he was in the arcade. Indeed, it had been she who had approached him during his deliberations over the waistcoats at the tailor's window. Don't look so glum, William. Aren't you excited about the prospect of what's to come? Digby asked, returning William to his senses. I... Oh, yes, I'm just thinking about what to say, that's all, William replied, gazing out of the window as they passed rows of townhouses and elegant buildings in this fashionable part of the city. Digby laughed. Those who attempt to plan what they hope to say usually fall foul of circumstance. It's all very well imagining what you'll say, but how can you be certain they'll respond in the way you want them to? he asked. William nodded. Digby was right. A speech could be rehearsed a dozen times, but it would take only the slightest deviation on the part of the one to whom it was delivered to bring the whole thing crashing down. It was a foolish thing to contemplate even as William sighed at the thought of falling foul of social grace. He quite simply did not know how to behave, how to talk, or how to act. These things required a lifetime. They came naturally to the likes of his godfather, but for William such things had to be learned, and he had run out of time to learn them. You're right, I shouldn't dwell on it. There's no point in doing so. We're on our way to the ball, and there's nothing I can do to better myself now. I can only pray I'm not made a fool of, William replied. They had now reached the gates of Charlton Lodge, where imposing gateposts, topped with stone lions, stood guarding the entrance. Despite being in the middle of the city, the gardens seemed peaceful, with mature trees rising along the length of the drive leading up to the house. Charlton Lodge was less a lodge than a grand house, built in the neoclassical style, with colonnades at its front below an arch where wide steps led up to the entrance. Dozens of carriages were drawn up, and a parade of fashionably dressed men and women were making their way inside, greeting by liveried footmen directing them inside. William felt sick. His stomach was churning. He was like a fish out of water, gasping for air. These people were his betters, not his equals. Look at it, William, isn't it magnificent? The upper echelons of society all gathering together, the power, the wealth. If you want influence, this is the place to come, Digby said, rubbing his hands together with glee. William was uncertain if he was not talking more to himself than to William, and he wondered why Digby had been so keen to accompany him that evening. What would Digby gain from an evening spent watching William dancing with Anne? Why were you so keen to come, Digby? Will you know anyone here? Won't it be terribly dull for you? William asked taking out his fake invitation in readiness to show the stewards. His friend smiled at him and shook his head. Not at all. A man can always find entertainment and diversion in such a place as this. 
mark my words, William. But come now, we must step forth unto the breach. Look, I think I spy Lady Miller over there, Digby said, pointing out of the carriage window. William's heart was beating fast, and he peered out of the carriage window, looking out across the crowd and spotting Anne in the purple dress she had spoken of. She looked beautiful, and William could hardly take his eyes off her. She had changed her hair, tying it up in a bun, and she was wearing exquisite earrings which sparkled in the evening sunshine. William stared at her, caring nothing for anything else but her, his fears and worries melting away. I've never seen... Look at her, Digby, William said, shaking his head, as he could have eyes for no one else but her. She's quite something, isn't she? And that's her mother and father with her, I presume, Digby said. Anne was walking with her parents, and William watched as they made their way up the steps, presenting their invitations to one of the stewards, who nodded and bade them enter. William opened the carriage door and climbed out, his hands trembling as he held the fake invitation, his heart beating fast. Digby came behind him, and the two men made their way up the steps, approaching the nearest steward, who nodded to them. Good evening, gentlemen. Might I see your invitations? he asked, and William presented his, hoping nothing untoward would be noted. The steward examined it, nodding his head as he handed it back to William. Is everything in order? William asked. Oh, yes, sir, certainly. But we've had some attempts to gain entry on a false invitation. Would you believe it? There are those who'd stoop so low as to create forgeries of the invitations. But I know a forgery when I see it. This way, sirs, I hope you have a wonderful evening, the steward replied, ushering them through the doors. Chapter 18 Anne was bored. She had arrived at Carsholton Lodge to find the ball already busy and the first dance taking place. It was one of the highlights of the season, and whilst it seemed those around her were enjoying themselves, Anne had only one thought in mind. Stop craning you neck, Anne. Who are you looking for? Her mother hissed as Anne looked around her for any sign of William. I was looking for Lord Peter, Anne replied, knowing her words would placate her mother, which they did. Well, yes, just don't be so obvious about it. I'm sure he'll be here, and he'll be only too delighted to make himself known to you. Keep your dance card unmarked. He'll want the first, the Countess said. Anne knew she would have no choice but to dance with Lord Peter, though she hoped it would not be to the detriment of William's impression of her. She glanced around, trying to make out the object of her intentions amongst the mass of swirling silks and frock coats. But there was no sign of William anywhere, and now the musicians struck up the second dance of the evening. Lady Blakely, how glad I am to see you, a voice to Anne's right said and she turned to find her mother being greeted by an elderly lady in a flowing green dress, dripping with pearls. Duchess Leopold, a pleasure indeed, Anne's mother replied, and Anne was caught up in conversation with the ailing aristocrat, of whom she knew nothing at all. And your dear daughter. Is she to marry this season? the Duchess asked, turning to Anne, who was forced to smile and nod. I hope so, yes, she said and the Duchess gushed in approval. It's Lord Peter Ulverston. He and Gerald have some business dealings. The match seems a fine one. He'll be here this evening, I believe, Anne's mother said, and the Duchess clapped her hands together in delight. Oh, Lord Peter, my godson, though I hardly see him these days. One forgets how many godchildren one has, she said. And again, Anne smiled and nodded, even as she felt entirely ill at ease with the whole intention of the match with Lord Peter. He was nowhere to be seen, but Anne she could not dance until she had danced with him, preferably several times. Again she glanced around in the hope of catching sight of William, but still he was nowhere to be seen, and now she wondered if he would even be there at all. The finery of Carsholton Lodge had made little impression on her, and neither had the guests, all of whom she found interminably dull, grateful when the Duchess moved on to her next port of call. I wish you'd make more of an effort when you speak to people, Anne, 
you're still looking around you like a rabbit in a field standing on its hind legs. The Duchess was interested in you, and I didn't realise she was Lord Peter's godmother. Make a good impression and it'll serve you well, Anne's mother said, tutting and shaking her head. But Anne was not interested in making a good impression on anyone. Indeed, she would be glad if the Duchess thought her rude and told Lord Peter as much. Perhaps it would put him off. She was about to suggest they partook in a glass of punch when her own godmother, Lady Flincher, came bustling over. Anne opened her fan, raising it to her face for fear of bursting into giggles, for she knew just what her godmother was about to say. I can't believe it, Jemima. I don't know what you're thinking of, she exclaimed, pointing her finger angrily at Anne's mother. Really, Muriel, it's not the place for such things the Countess hissed. But it seemed Anne's godmother was determined to make her point. All the letters I wrote, the encouragement I gave, the lengths I went to make the match. It hasn't been easy, you know, and now I discover you've gone behind my back and promised Anne to Lord Peter Ilverston, she exclaimed. Anne turned away, trying hard not to laugh at the look of incredulity on her godmother's face. But it was true, Lady Flincher had gone to considerable lengths to secure a match with Maximilian, son of the Duke of Lancaster. Anne's father had dismissed the match, though not in any formal terms, and made his intentions clear regarding Lord Peter. It was all a dreadful mess, though one Anne was only too pleased to find herself in the middle of. If her parents and godmother were arguing, it would mean they were less inclined to notice her intended rejection of both sides. Anne had no intention of marrying either Maximilian or Lord Peter, and whilst there was yet no sign of William at the ball, she still had hope in the possibility of what he represented, escape from expectation. Nothing set in stone, Muriel, the Countess replied, but Anne's godmother dismissed her with an angry wave of her hand. Nonsense! If Gerald wants it, it'll happen. I'll be a laughingstock, and I can only imagine what the Duke's going to say. Never mind the Duchess, she said, raising her hand to her forehead in a mock display of distress. I'm sure I don't mind either way, Anne said, and her godmother scowled at her. You'll mind when you discover what sort of man you're marrying, Anne, she said, and in this at least they could find common ground. Whilst Maximilian was something of an unknown entity, Lord Peter's reputation preceded him. He was well known in London circles, and whilst there were those who sang his praises, there were many who did the exact opposite. But Lord Peter's not, Annie's mother replied, but Lady Flincher had heard enough. I wash my hands of the affair, Jemima. Let her marry who she wants for all I care. I was only trying to do my duty as her godmother, she said, and before Anne's mother could reply, Lady Flincher had disappeared into the crowd. Anne's mother sighed and shook her head. It was only ever a suggestion. She does rather like to take over, doesn't she? And she's so easily offended. I'm sure the Duchess of Lancaster won't be offended at a change in arrangements. The two of you hadn't even met. It was just a vague suggestion, she said. And Anne lowered her fan, trying hard to keep her composure, even as she had found the sight of her mother and godmother bickering highly amusing. They were always falling out over this or that, but would be the greatest of friends by the following week. It was always the same. Well, I didn't like the thought of moving to Lancashire, Anne replied, and her mother nodded. I didn't like the thought of it either, Anne. You're my only daughter. I want what's best for you, the Countess said, putting her hand on Anne's arm and smiling. Now was not the time to tell her mother what the best truly was but Anne was glad to think her mother did want her to be happy, even as she had not yet realised what that happiness would consist of. Glancing around, Anne now caught sight of Lord Peter. He was standing with a group of men by the refreshment table, laughing at some joke or other, and now he caught Anne's eye, excusing himself before coming over. Lady Miller, I was expecting to see you here, he said, as Anne's mother stepped back to allow the two of them to talk in private, though still with the chaperone's eye on them both. I'm sure it's a pleasure, Anne said, lowering her gaze. She felt embarrassed in his presence, 
he surely realised she had little liking for him, even as he persisted in his intentions. We should dance. They'll be starting up a waltz shortly, he said, offering Anne his hand. There was no choice but to take it, and now the musicians struck up on their instruments and the ballroom was filled with twirling skirts and flapping tails. Anne was a good dancer. Her governess had instructed her in her youth, and she had often been present at balls given by her father and mother at their country estate in Hampshire. But it was not so much the dancing she disliked, but with whom she found herself engaged in it. Lord Peter was not a good dancer, and he kept treading on Anne's toes as they waltzed amidst the throng. We've been fortunate with the weather, Anna said, failing to think of anything meaningful to say. Yes, but one expects it at this time of year, Lord Peter replied. Will you remain long in London? Anne asked, hoping he might announce an intention to travel or do business elsewhere. As long as it takes, I suppose, he said, and she looked up at him in surprise. As long as what takes, she asked, and he laughed. For us to marry, of course. Isn't that the intention? he said, and Anne nodded. Yes, I... I think so, she said. This was not the romance of one of her penny novels. She was not swept off her feet, seduced by a handsome stranger, or spirited away to marry in secret. In the eyes of Lord Peter, Anne was a proposition, a business investment, like any other. It was hardly romantic, even if she had felt anything vaguely heart-filled towards him. You don't sound convinced, he said, and Anne sighed. I'm sorry. I'm rather tired tonight, she said, feeling disappointed at having come to Charlton Lodge, only for the object of her intentions not to be there. Anne had imagined a furtive liaison, the clasping of hands, the exchange of longing gazes, desire and danger. That was what happened in the stories she read. But instead, William was nowhere to be seen, and now she wondered if he was even going to appear at all. Well, I'm sure you'll wake up a little as the evening goes by, Lord Peter replied. The waltz came to an end, and Anne was only too glad to step back her toes hurting from the number of times Lord Peter had stepped on her feet. I'm sure I'd be delighted, Anne said, as Lord Peter insisted on marking her dance card for the rest of the night. He bowed to her, before disappearing off to join his friends by the refreshment table. Anne looked around her in the vague hope of seeing William, and then she saw him. He was standing on the far side of the ballroom alone, looking somewhat out of place amidst the throng of revellers. Her heart skipped a beat. He was dressed in the purple waistcoat, black breeches, a white shirt, frock coat and cravat, looking every bit the handsome gentleman. Oh, but what do I say to him? I can't very well approach him myself, Anne thought to herself. It had been easy in the street and in the arcade. They had come across one another quite by accident, renewing the acquaintance of the market. But this was different. A woman at a ball did not simply stroll up to a gentleman and make small talk. There were rules to follow, and Anne could only imagine what her mother would say. She'd be horrified, Anne told herself, trying to catch William's eye in the hope he might come over to her. That was the done thing, and she wondered why he was not looking around for her, as she had been for him. It seemed odd to see him standing alone. Surely he knew others at the ball. A gentleman like William was bound to have associates. His father had been an important man, and William too had surely gained a reputation since his arrival in the capital. Oh, come along, William. Notice me, Anne thought to herself, even as her mother now came hurrying across to her. What are you doing, Anne? Lord Peter's just over there. Why are you straining your neck again? Who are you trying to see? The Countess said taking Anne by the arm and pulling her back behind a large palm frond next to a marbled column. I... I was just looking for a friend, Anne replied. Her mother's eyes narrowed. What friend? she asked, as Anne tried to look over her mother's shoulder. She had lost sight of William now, for he had disappeared. Anne feared he might leave in disappointment if she did not make her presence known. Lady... Anstruther she said, and her mother's eyes narrowed. 
I've never heard of her, and I've certainly never heard you speak of her. Who is she? How do you know her? the Countess demanded. Oh, Mother, I feel a little faint. I need to go to the powder room, Anne said, and pulling away from her mother, she hurried across the ballroom in the direction of the powder room. She knew her behaviour was erratic, but she wanted desperately to speak to William. It was the reason she had come to the ball, the reason she had bought a new dress and made an effort with her hair and makeup. Anne knew how foolish she must have seemed, but she had never felt such a strong attraction to another person before. The strength of her feelings towards William had surprised her. He represented something different, something other than the men her mother and father favoured. I've got to find him. I've got to speak to him, Anne resolved, even as she looked around her desperately for any sign of the itinerant gentleman. But as she rounded one of the marbled columns, Anne was surprised to find herself face to face with William's friend, Digby Kirkpatrick. He was deep in conversation with another man, whom Anne vaguely recognised as the son of Sir Michael Stratton, a man of dubious reputation. At the sight of Anne, Digby straightened up, bowing curtly to her and smiling. Lady Miller, what a pleasure. Are you looking for William? he asked, and Anne nodded, even as she knew she should not be. Yes, I feared he might have left, she said, but Digby shook his head. No, my lady. You'll find him in the anteroom, I believe. He's been looking for you too, Digby replied. Anne blushed. She was flattered, even as she felt embarrassed at the thought of William seeing her with Lord Peter. I've been, she said, her words trailing off as Digby nodded, dancing with your betrothed. Yes, I saw you, my lady but I'm sure William's eager to find you, he said, nodding to Anne, who blushed an even deeper shade of red. He's not my betrothed, he's my parents, well, it's complicated. But it's William I'm eager to find, Anne replied, and turning away from William's friend, she hurried towards the anteroom, all thoughts of proper behaviour and decorum now gone. Chapter 19 William felt out of his depth. He had been amazed at the ease by which they gained entry, even as he had witnessed others be denied. It's a fake, the steward had told one man, and he had been hastily ejected by two footmen, shouting his protests for all to hear. But William's invitation had been a perfect forgery, and now he found himself amidst the gathered crowds, looking around him in the hope of catching sight of Anne. But as to what he would do when he did so, William was uncertain. He had practised what he might say a dozen times, even as he knew such intentions were futile. Lady Miller. Anne. You're very pretty. Might I have this dance? No, that doesn't write. Or does it? I do want to dance with her. But shouldn't she present her dance card to me? Lady Anne, shall we dance? No, that sounds like an order. I want her to dance with me, but I don't want to sound like I'm forcing her to do so but I wouldn't be forcing her. She'd want to. Everyone else is dancing, William thought to himself, feeling terribly nervous in this strange and unsettling world. He had never been in such a place before, and it was clear he was participating in an occasion governed by any number of unwritten rules. There were those who would not speak to others because of their social status, whilst others could not speak to others because of theirs. The gentlemen would approach the ladies, but some of them would be outrightly rejected, only to approach those of a lesser standing. The young ladies were chaperoned whilst the gentlemen gathered in groups, urging one another towards this or that intention. Some were rejected, others flattered. And as the music began, the successful matches took to the waltz, twirling and whirling in a display of silks and tails. And what am I to do? William asked himself, glancing around him again for any sign of Anne. It was then he saw her, dancing with a man amidst the throng. William sighed. He had not known what to expect, and in his naivety he had thought Anne would be waiting for him, her dance card unmarked. Instead, this was surely Lord Peter, the man to whom she was apparently betrothed, or so it seemed to William. William turned away, 
disappointed in himself for not making his move sooner. He had been hesitant, and now he shook his head, wondering if any of it had been worth the effort. William had not come to London to gamble and chase after women. He had come to the capital to seek his fortune, and he could only imagine what his godfather would say if he could see him now. And what if word gets back to Lancaster? My godfather's bound to be known here, William told himself, feeling suddenly foolish in his purple waistcoat and new breeches. Digby had disappeared, making an excuse about old acquaintances, and William was left alone. He glanced again towards the throng of dancers, watching as Anne danced with the man whom William assumed to be Lord Peter Ulverston, the man she had mentioned at the arcade. William himself could never hope to be so confident, to sweep a woman off her feet, to mark her dance card, to be the gentleman he was pretending to be. Around him, real gentlemen were promenading, approaching women, taking them by the arm. Are you enjoying the ball? A shrill voice to his right inquired. William turned to find a haughty-looking woman peering at him through a pair of gold pince-nez spectacles. Oh, yes, very much so, William said, his palms growing clammy as he wondered who she was and why she was asking him such a question. Was this the done thing? Should William himself have approached others and asked the same thing? I don't recognise you. I thought I knew everyone here tonight. I issued the invitations, of course, the woman said. William's eyes grew wide with fear. He should know who the woman was, even as he did not have the faintest idea. I'm... William stammered. William Baker, of course, Lady Erdman, Digby said, interjecting, as the woman turned to him in surprise. Ah, yes, and you? she asked, looking at Digby in surprise. Digby Kirkpatrick, my lady. We met at the Browns last spring. Lady Brown was so gracious. I remember distinctly you... He began, but Lady Erdman interrupted him. Ah, yes, Mr Kirkpatrick, I do remember you. Lord Brown, yes, and his dear wife. A pleasure to meet you, Mr Baker, she said, turning and hurrying off across the ballroom. William looked at Digby in surprise. I, um, I don't understand he said, and Digby smiled. She organises the ball. Charlton Lodge is a venue of sorts. No loan lives here. It's owned by the Crown Estate and hired out for these sorts of thing. Lady Erdman doesn't know who I am, not at all. But I know something about her. Did you see the look on her face when I mentioned Lord Brown? He asked. William nodded. Lady Erdman had looked terrified, and now Digby smiled. I did. Yes, but... I still don't understand, William replied. She's been having an affair with him, right under Lady Brown's nose. I happen to know a footman in her household, and he furnished me with some interesting information. I feared we might be challenged, but no more, he said, placing his hand firmly on William's shoulder and giving him a reassuring nod. William felt uncomfortable. Not only was their invitation fake, but it was now justified by blackmail. He shook his head and sighed. You can't hold it against her. Don't lots of people have affairs? He asked, and Digby laughed. I'm sure they do. But she'd have thrown us out, William. I had to have some insurance against it. Haven't you found Lady Miller yet? He asked, changing the subject. William looked around, trying to spot Anne amidst the throng. But he could not see her and shook his head sadly. I did see her, but she was dancing with, well, another man, he replied, feeling embarrassed at having missed his chance. But Digby appeared unperturbed. She was bound to dance with another man, William. What did you expect? To find her a shy and retiring violent shrinking back against the wall? No, she'll have her card marked. I suggest you slip off into the anteroom for some refreshment. Wait until the music stops and return. You'll find her expectant of company, I'm sure, he said. And before William could reply, Digby had left his side. Again he felt a fool, entirely out of place and out of his depth. Had Digby not rescued him from Lady Erdman, he'd surely be out on the street in shame. But instead, he had been given a second chance, and now he drew himself up, 
reminding himself why he had done what he had done. It's all for her. You want to see her again, not from a distance, but up close. You want to dance with her. You want to, he thought to himself, stopping before he got carried away. Taking Digby's advice, William made his way into the anteroom. Charlton Lodge was a magnificent setting for the ball. Marbled columns, velvet drapes, ornate, baroquely. It was lavish, a far cry from William's humble origins. Even Burnley Abbey was not like this, and William could only imagine what his mother would say if she could see him in such a place as this. She'd probably laugh at me, he told himself, as he took a ladle full of punch and sighed. He was about to retreat into a corner when he felt himself being watched, and turning, he found himself face to face with Anne herself. He almost dropped his punch in surprise, and she smiled at him, stepping forward as he bowed. She was wearing a purple dress and was certainly the prettiest young lady in the room. Lady Miller, I... I thought... He stammered, for he really did not know what to say when faced with the object of his affections, the reason he had done everything he had done since meeting her by chance in the marketplace. I slipped away, she replied, helping herself to a glass of punch. William smiled, the two of them stepping to one side as a gaggle of chattering women descended on the refreshments. But I thought you were dancing with someone else. I assumed it was Lord Peter Ulverston, the man you mentioned when we met at the arcade, William said. He did not wish to embarrass her, but he felt somewhat awkward at the thought of playing second fiddle to Lord Peter, who obviously believed he had primacy in Anne's dealings with other gentlemen. I was, but I don't want to. My parents want me to marry him, but I don't want to marry him. I don't want to marry anyone I don't choose to, she said still smiling at him. I feared we might not have had this chance, William replied. I feared so too. But why does it matter? Why shouldn't we talk? It's a ball, isn't it? This is what people do at balls, Anne said, even as she glanced over her shoulder. William wondered what would happen if they were seen together. He knew nothing of the rules and etiquette of such encounters. Should she be chaperoned? Or was the preponderance of women around them sufficient? Was it not enough for two people to want to talk to one another? I'm so glad we are. I've been waiting for this moment, to see you again, I mean, he said, smiling at her. And Anne blushed. I've been waiting for it too, Anne replied. And William felt the blush rise in his cheeks. He had thought himself a mere passing fancy, and a fool to think a woman like Anne should consider him anything more than one of many suitors to cross her path. When he had seen her dancing amidst the throng, he had believed his fears to be true, but her words brought with them a glimmer of hope. I thought, well, I wasn't sure how it would be, William admitted. You're very provincial, Mr Baker. How is it in Lancashire? How are these things done? she asked, looking at him curiously. Well, I, they just happen, I suppose, William replied, hoping she would not ask any further questions about the society of which he was not a part. I might have gone there, you know, but it doesn't matter now. I've been looking forward to seeing you. I'm so grateful to you for helping me in the marketplace over that foolish loaf of bread, she said, and William laughed. I couldn't let him take such liberties with you. It just wasn't right. But I'm rather glad he did. Otherwise, I might not have met you, he said. William did not know if this was too forward, but Anne smiled, blushing as she shook her head. I won't be going to the market again, but I'm glad I did then too, she replied. Well, yes, certainly. I, William said, stammering a little, uncertain of what to say to her. The entire deception had been building to this moment and now William did not know how to act. He was like a fish out of water, surrounded by finery, dressed in finery, and talking to finest woman in the room. He smiled at her, even as it seemed she was waiting for him to ask something. Do you dance, Mr Baker? she asked, and William realised what it was he should have done. Oh, yes I do, and would you care to dance too? he asked 
and a smile came over her face, her wide, beautiful eyes meeting his as she nodded. I'd like that very much, she said, taking out her dance card. William stared at it in surprise even as she handed it to him. It was marked entirely with the name of Lord Peter Ulverston, but Anne had scratched out that of the next dance, leaving the space blank. Digby had given William a pencil for just this occurrence, and with a trembling hand, he signed his name. I hope it's not an impertinence, he said, fearing the wrath of Lord Peter, should he see the two of them dancing. An impertinence? Not at all. Aren't I allowed to dance with whomsoever I wish? It's a lady's prerogative to dance with whomsoever she wishes, Anne replied. William feared he had shown his ignorance again. He knew nothing of the etiquette of such things, and he smiled and nodded, offering her his arm. I think I hear the music beginning again, he said, and Anne smiled. A waltz. I love a waltz. My governess taught me to dance. Did yours? It's so difficult if you don't have proper instruction, she said, as they made their way out of the anteroom and into the throng. William had not been taught to dance by his governess. He had not had a governess, and his mother had been far too busy with her mending and sewing to bother much about whether William knew his two-step from his four-step. Oh, yes, it's quite dreadful, isn't it? he said, desperately trying to remember what Digby had taught him about the waltz. As they stepped into the mass of twirling skirts, William slipped his arm around Anne's waist, gazing down at her and thinking himself to be the luckiest man in the room. She was beautiful and despite his fears, he knew now why he had done everything he had done. It was worth it for this one moment together, a moment of utter bliss as they danced the waltz together. You dance well, Anne exclaimed, for William had not expected to find himself naturally able. It was one thing to pretend in front of the mirror, and quite another to have one's arms around a beautiful woman. But to William's surprise, he was managing it, he did not step on Anne's toes, he kept his head up, his gaze fixed on her, as together they waltzed back and forth. Isn't this fun, he said, smiling at her, and forgetting he was not the man he was pretending to be. The music filled the air, and together they moved effortlessly through the throng, dancing as though they had danced a hundred times before. There were no awkward movements, no stilted turns just the delight of the waltz and the happiness of togetherness. It's wonderful. I was so glad when I saw you. I didn't think, well, I wasn't sure. We hardly know one another, but I feel I do know you, Anne said, and William could hear the sincerity in her voice. He felt embarrassed. She did not know him at all, and if she did, she would surely not be dancing with him. It was all a charade, albeit a delightful one. William was not the man she believed him to be. His only claim was that of his godfather, and the rest was false. He was no gentleman, and he had no entitlement to dance with Anne as he was doing. He was a fake, mutton dressed as lamb. I was glad too, I mean, I've been waiting, he stammered, and Anne smiled. I have too, she said as the musicians struck up another waltz. Chapter 20 Anne had been waiting for this moment all evening, and ever since she had first suggested William accompany her to the ball at Charlton Lodge. He was shy, nervous even, but she found his company a delight. William was so different from the other men, the likes of Lord Peter and his friends. He displayed nothing of the rakish guile she was so used to, seemed entirely honest in his disposition. As they stepped out of the throng, she smiled at him, their hands clasped together. That was wonderful, she said, breathless from her exertions. William had danced well, and Anne was looking forward to dancing with him again, even as she looked down at her dance card in despair. Lord Peter had signed himself at every opportunity, and Anne knew he would be looking for her amidst the throng of ladies and gentlemen now descending on the refreshment tables, before the musicians struck up the next dance. What a marvellous spread of food, all these dainty delights. 
It's a far cry from the meat pies and roasted chestnuts of the market and the stews and broiled meats of the Spaniards Inn, William said, helping himself to a delicate creation of pastry, sweet cream and fruit. Do you frequent such places? I was surprised to learn you've things in London of your own, though I suppose it's not necessarily economical. Doesn't your family own somewhere? Anne asked. Her own father owned several houses in the capital, along with his estate in Hampshire, Fulham Grange. It was normal for members of the aristocracy to move between houses, and it had surprised Anne to learn William was lodging at an inn in the shadow of St Paul's, albeit a respectable one. William looked suddenly embarrassed. Ah, well, you see, it was easier to stay at an inn. The house was all shut up, you see. There's no permanent housekeeper, he said, and Anne nodded. It can be hard to find reliable servants, she replied, quoting her mother, who was always complaining about those who served her. Certainly, William said, shaking his head. Anne helped herself to a glass of punch, glancing over her shoulder lest Lord Peter appear to take her away. She was finally enjoying herself, and in William's company, Anne felt a sense of freedom, such as she had not known before in the company of other men. She was free to say what she thought, and not to feel belittled or foolish. William was different, and she found his shyness endearing. And how long do you think you'll remain in London? I suppose your responsibilities might return you north, she said, but William shook his head. I'll stay as long as I can, he replied, smiling at her, and Anne was glad to hear it. She wanted to know him better. This was her opportunity, even as she feared it would be swiftly taken away from her. In suggesting their rendezvous at Charlton Lodge, Anne had not entirely thought through the consequences. It had been a romantic notion, a snatched liaison, just like those in her penny novels. But now they were together and Anne wondered what would come next, even as she turned to find her mother looking pointedly at her across the refreshment table. Mother, I didn't see you there, she said, and her mother raised her eyebrows. I'm sure you didn't, Anne. I'm certain you didn't, she replied, glancing at William, who swallowed the dainty pastry he was eating with a nervous gulp. Mother, this is Mr. William Baker. William, this is my mother, Lady Blakely, Anne said, feeling terribly nervous as to what her mother would do or say. The Countess looked William up and down with a disapproving expression. And where's Lord Peter? she asked. I don't know, Anne answered truthfully. I see, her mother replied. But Mr Baker was kind enough to assist me in the street some days ago. He behaved in a most gentlemanly manner. I was accosted, and Mr. Baker saved me. He was very chivalrous. Anne said, inventing a lie as justification for her and William being together at the ball. Her mother's eyes narrowed. Anne felt certain she did not believe her, even as she held out her hand to William, who returned her compliment with a nervous expression on his face. Accosted? Goodness me, and you didn't think to tell me anything of it. And what of Helen? Wasn't she with you? But it seems we owe Mr. Baker a debt of gratitude, the Countess said, and Anne nodded. We certainly do, Mother, she said, just as Anne's father appeared from the throng. The Earl did not enjoy such occasions, and would usually retreat into a corner with his associates, bemoaning the state of empire and nation, whilst imbibing copious amounts of punch. His red face and slight sway suggested this had been the case that evening, and now he looked from Anne to William, and then to the Countess. That isn't Lord Peter, he said, and Anne's mother gave a curt nod. No, it's Mr William Baker. Anne was just telling me he rescued her from an accostment in the street. Did you know anything about this? she asked. The Earl shook his head. How dreadful. But no. I didn't know anything about it, he replied, as William looked even more uncomfortable, faced with both the Earl and Countess at once. Well, it was nothing, you see, he said, glancing at Anne, who felt terribly guilty for having led him into a lie. Whatever would he think of her? William Baker, you say? 
I don't know the name of Baker, not in London at least. Are you a businessman? A politician? A diplomat? he asked. William shook his head. I, he stammered, but Anne interrupted him. Mr Baker's come from Lancashire to make his fortune. He's a businessman, Anne said, speaking on William's behalf. She was not about to allow her parents to be snobs. William was not an aristocrat. But London was filled with self-made men, men with fortunes far surpassing that of the aristocracy. The advent of the empire had created vast opportunities for wealth, and men like William were the future. He may not have a title, but he was certainly not to be looked down on. And what business are you in? Anne's father asked. This was a question Anne herself could not answer. It was Digby Kirkpatrick who had boasted of William's achievements, which were considerable despite his youth. Oh, I'm in, uh, exports. Imports, I mean, imports. Yes, William stammered. What do you import? Anne's father continued. Anything I can... I import things and sell things and... That's how it works, William said. He was not giving a good account of himself, even as Anne felt certain he was intimidated by her father's stern questioning. Does it matter, father? Why must we talk business? Anne asked, and her father turned away. As you wish, I'm going back, he said, glancing towards the corner of the room where his fellow aristocrats were guffawing over glasses of punch. Anne breathed a sigh of relief. Her father could be a bully at times, and she was not about to have William scared off by his overbearing ways. Don't linger too long by the refreshment table, Anne, her mother said, raising her eyebrows, as Anne slipped her arm through William's, hoping the two of them would dance again. We're just enjoying ourselves, mother, Anne said, and her mother looked at her angrily. Don't enjoy yourself too much, not when, she began, but before she could finish, the approaching figure of Lord Peter interrupted them. He too had imbibed rather a lot of punch and was swaying slightly, his eyes wide and bloodshot. He looked at William disdainfully. Who are you? he demanded. William Baker, a pleasure to meet you, William replied holding out his hand and smiling. Lord Peter ignored it, turning now to Anne, who held his gaze defiantly. You missed the last dance. I was looking for you. They'll start again in a moment. Come along, he said, but Anne shook her head. I don't want to dance, she replied. Anne was adamant in this. She had no intention of dancing with Lord Peter again that evening. He was drunk and would only step on her toes but her words brought his anger to the fore, and he stepped forward, lunging out to grab her arm, even as William stepped between them. If the lady doesn't want to dance, she doesn't have to, William said, and Anne's heart skipped a beat, fearful of Lord Peter's response, even as she admired William for his chivalry. Who are you to tell me what she wants or doesn't want? I intend to court her. She's to be my betrothed, Lord Peter exclaimed and he struck out at William, who dodged his fist, even as Anne let out a cry. Really, Lord Peter, that's quite enough, Anne's mother exclaimed, looking in horror at Lord Peter, who snarled at Anne, even as William put his arm around her. If you don't want to dance with me, so be it, but I'm your betrothed, I'll have satisfaction, he said, slurring his words, even as Anne's mother interjected. Remember to whom you speak, Lord Peter, she said and to Anne's relief, Lord Peter waved his hand dismissively. I don't care. Dance with whom you want, he said, scowling at Anne, who was only too glad to hear him say this. Lord Peter, won't you... Anne's mother began, but Lord Peter had disappeared back into the throng, making his way towards a group of chattering young ladies standing at the other end of the ballroom. Anne looked at William apologetically. She really had not thought the matter through and now she realised she had put William in a very awkward position indeed. He had lied for her, and she had lied about him to her mother. It was surely not the ideal basis for any future relationship, even one as impossible as theirs was seeming now. How terrible, Anne said, feeling as though William was certain to wash his hands of her after such a spectacle. Well, that's a fine thing, Anne. What a way for him to behave. 
her mother said, and Anne sighed. I, you know what I think, mother, she said, glancing at William, who appeared thoroughly embarrassed. And I think the same too. I never expected for him to lunge out like that. It's quite disgraceful. I'll tell your father, and I'll be sure to tell him of Mr. Baker's chivalry too, the Countess replied. And Anne now wondered if the unfortunate situation might have worked in her favour. William had not expected to find himself the subject of an interrogation at the hands of Anne's mother and father. His lies had only been perpetuated. He knew nothing of business, nothing of exports and imports, and as to for an accostment in the street. Just lie after lie, he thought to himself, as he watched the retreating figure of Lord Peter disappear into the throng. William had not expected to meet Anne's betrothed, even as he had known it was a possibility, and he had certainly not expected to find himself the subject of such an attack. Her circumstances were complicated, and it was hardly the done thing to pursue a woman betrothed to another man, even as that man was entirely odious in every way. I'm surprised at Lord Peter. I never thought, well, I'm sorry, Anne, the Countess said, and William looked up in surprise. Anne did the same, glancing over her shoulder to where Lord Peter was now enticing another young lady to dance. Are you, mother? Didn't you know what he was like? It's hardly surprising, is it? He's drunk and doesn't know what he's doing, Anne replied, and the Countess tutted, glancing at William, who hoped he had at least made a good impression, even as his nerves suggested the opposite. I suppose it was your father. Thank you, Mr. Baker. You behaved very chivalrously. It seems we owe you our thanks for this and for helping Anne in the street when she was accosted, the Countess said. William did not know what to say in reply. He had done nothing, save for acting in what he believed was the right way. Anne smiled at him and slipped her hand into his. Shall we dance? she asked, for another waltz was striking up and the floor was filling with couples. William smiled back at her, glad to have proved himself, even as he was uncertain as to precisely what he had done. Shouldn't I be the one to ask you, he replied, and Anne laughed. Then ask me, won't you, she said, rolling her eyes. William cleared his throat, wanting to do as he had seen the gentleman do around him. Lady Miller, might I have this dance, he asked, glancing at the Countess, who seemed to approve. You may, Anne replied, curtsying slightly, and William now led her into the throng of dancers, delighted to have her in his arms once again. The music played, and the two of them danced, and it seemed to William as though all the lies, the risks, the thing he had done had been worth it. Anne was beautiful, her eyes, her smile, her soft skin. William wanted to tell her as much, but he was unsure how to say so without sounding quite ridiculous. He knew the situation was complicated. He had told so many lies, and now he would have to remember them all if he was to be consistent in his dealings with the Earl and Countess. I hadn't expected to meet Lord Peter in such a blunt manner, William said, as he spotted the rakish aristocrat dancing with another woman. He hardly matters, does he? I didn't ever want to marry him, I assure you. Anne said, and William smiled at her. No, I'm sure you didn't. I can't imagine anyone wanting to marry such a man. He's completely odious. But was there no one else? He asked, for he could not imagine there were no other suitors for a woman such as her. But Anne shook her head. None that mattered, she said, and he smiled at her. Then I... I'm so glad to be here with you now, he said. This was the truth. He was falling in love with her, and despite the difficulties and the lies he had told, William knew the truth in his heart. His feelings were sincere, and he could only hope Anne felt the same. Chapter 21 It's been a most delightful evening, William said, as he and Anne bid one another good night. The ball was coming to an end, and the guests were filing out, wrapped in their shawls and coats, calling out farewells to one another and promising to meet again soon. The punch bowls were empty, the refreshment table demolished, 
and the musicians exhausted. It had been a wonderful evening in the end, at least. We'll do it all again next year, Lady Erdman said, calling out her goodbyes, and thus the Charlton Lodge ball had come to a close. What will you do now? Anne asked as she stood with William in the entrance hallway, waiting for her parents. I'll go back to the Spaniards Inn with Digby, wherever he is. I've got an important meeting tomorrow with a firm of solicitors, William replied. Anne was impressed. William was not of the idle rich. He did not expect money to come his way, even as the like of Lord Peter existed on the wealth of their ancestors. There was a great deal to admire in a self-made man, and whilst William might not have a title, he made up for the fact by his dogged determination to succeed. Anne was glad to have weathered the incident with Lord Peter, for surely it would be to William's advantage in the eyes of her parents. How wonderful. And when will I see you again? she asked, for this was the real question she wanted an answer to. The evening she had spent with him had only confirmed what she had previously believed. William was the perfect gentleman, kind and courteous, handsome, and with a shyness she found endearing. He did not have the brash confidence of a rake, but neither did he behave like one either. The heroes in the stories she read were often rakes, men for whom foolish women fell at the feet of, in awe at their domineering nature. But Anne did not want such a man. She wanted to fall in love. And with William, that was what she was doing. Soon, I hope, if it's possible, he replied, and Anne nodded. It's very possible, she said, slipping her calling card into his hand and hoping he would pay her a visit very soon. And what about Lord Peter? William asked. Anne looked over her shoulder to where Lord Peter was being helped by two of his friends. He was drunk, his head tilted back, his eyes wide, and he appeared to know nothing of where he was or what he was doing. I think you know the answer to that, she replied. Come along, Anne. It's time to go, her mother called out, and with a lingering smile towards William, Anne followed after her, hoping it would not be long before she saw William again. Try to do what? Anne's father exclaimed as they rode home in the carriage after the ball that night. It was the height of summer, and dusk was only just falling, the setting sun casting long shadows through the carriage windows. He struck out at Anne. He was drunk. I've never seen such an outrageous display, Anne's mother replied, tutting and shaking her head. The ball had been a chaotic affair, but Anne was only glad to think Lord Peter had shown his true colours. Her father looked incredulous, and despite having imbibed a considerable amount of punch, himself, was sober enough to condemn his business associate in the strongest possible terms. I never thought he'd act in such a way. He actually tried to strike you, Anne, the Earl demanded, and Anne nodded. Because he wasn't getting his own way, I didn't want to dance with him, not when he was drunk, she said, and her father shook his head. Despicable man. I won't have it, Jemima. I might not be the best of fathers, but I won't have my daughter treated in such an appalling fashion, he exclaimed, shaking his head. Anne was pleasantly surprised. She had expected her father to side with Lord Peter on the matter, but it seemed his chivalry was roused, and he was not about to see his only daughter subjected to such unpleasantness. Does this mean I don't have to marry him, father? Anne asked, for if it was to be the case, she would surely throw her arms around him in delight. I think it's rather doubtful, don't you? he replied, and Anne breathed a sigh of relief. Oh, father, thank you, she exclaimed, and true to her promise, she threw her arms around him and kissed him. Her father looked somewhat embarrassed, but smiled at Anne as she sat back next to her mother. Well, it rather puts a hold on our plans, doesn't it? If you're not to marry Lord Peter, I don't know, Anne. Perhaps Maximilian, the Earl said, but to Anne's surprise it was her mother who interjected. The situation would have been much worse had it not been for Mr Baker, she said. The Earl looked at his wife in confusion. Who? he asked, and the Countess tutted. The young man, the one you're questioned about imports and exports, 
the one who intervened in an altercation Anne had in the street. He stood up to Lord Peter, too, she said. Anne blushed. She knew she would have to elaborate on the apparent altercation. But now her father nodded. Ah, yes, a shy sort, but a good man. You met him by chance again at the ball, did you? he asked. I did, yes, Anne replied, not wanting her parents to think she had in any way planned the whole thing. A fortunate coincidence, and to be rescued twice by the same gentleman, her mother said, raising her eyebrows. Anne smiled. There was no doubting William had made a good impression, at least on her mother. The lie would be forgotten or could be woven into the story of the loaf, the baker turning into an angry assailant demanding her money. William had helped her, and he had done so again that night. He was only behaving as any true gentleman should wasn't he? she asked, and her mother could not disagree with her. But he's self-made? New money? her father asked, and Anne nodded. That's right, but why does that matter? I'm much more impressed by a man who can make his own money, rather than one who can spend what's given to him on a silver spoon, she replied. Her father smiled. In this at least, he would agree. The earldom, whilst one of the oldest in England, had long since ceased to pay its way. And his father was a shrewd businessman and had taken advantage of many opportunities the empire afforded him for profit. It's admirable, of course. I'd like to hear more about him, he said. And her mother echoed the sentiment. We should invite him for dinner, I think, she said. And Anne's eyes grew wide with amazement. She had not expected her parents to so willingly take to a man like William. And she was only too delighted to agree. Really, mother? Do you mean it? she asked, and her mother nodded. Certainly, I do. He behaved with the utmost chivalry this evening. I was suspicious of him at first, but I'd be glad to get to know him better. If that's what you'd like, Anne, she replied. It was what Anne liked. It was what she had hoped for all along, even as she had not dreamed it to be possible. How grateful she was to Lord Peter for showing his true colours and to her mother and father for recognising them. Oh, yes, mother. I'd be delighted to entertain him. A chance encounter can often be the beginning of something more, she said, and her mother smiled. Perhaps we shouldn't have been so eager to make a match for you, Anne, she said, glancing at the earl who harumphed. How was I to know what Lord Peter was really like? He's always been a model of gentlemanly behaviour as far as I'm concerned, he said. Anne rolled her eyes. This was no surprise, even as she felt glad Lord Peter had been proven the opposite of what her father believed him to be. She was excited at the prospect of seeing William again, though she could only imagine how nervous he would be. I'll send an invitation tomorrow. You'll have to give me the address of his London lodgings, Anne, her mother said. Oh, that's easy enough. He's staying at the Spaniards Inn. Helene and I met him by chance outside the other day. He lodges with a friend of his, a Mr. Kirkpatrick, Annie said. At these words, her mother looked somewhat perturbed. He's staying at an inn, she asked, and Anne blushed. She had not been thinking properly. Her mother would surely not approve of William residing in such a place. She would expect him to have a London residence. Lodgings belonged to his family, as befitted an up-and-coming gentleman. Yes, he prefers such a place. I'm sure it's because his friend Digby desired it. He mentioned a lack of servants. It must be terribly inconvenient, Anne replied, though she herself was not entirely sure why William should have chosen the Spaniards Inn for his lodgings. Her mother looked at her in surprise. Well, I suppose it's only temporary. Until he can find somewhere else to live, she said trying, it seemed, to reassure herself. Yes, indeed, I can send Helen with the invitation. She knows where to go, Anne said, for she was not about to allow the opportunity to pass her by. The Countess nodded. Very well, yes. I'll write to him, thanking him for his assistance to you and inviting him to dine with us this coming Friday, she said. Anne's heart skipped a beat. She could barely contain her excitement, and when they had arrived home, she went straight to her bedroom, hoping Helen had disobeyed her orders and waited up. I told you to go to bed. I'd have been quite all right. 
but I've got the most wonderful news, Anne exclaimed, taking Helen by the hands and hardly able to contain her excitement. Oh, my lady, I didn't want you going to bed with your hair tied up in such a way. We need to let it down and comb it, Helen said. Wait a moment, let me tell you first. He's coming to dinner, Anne said, still not quite believing her luck in securing William the invitation. Helen looked at her in surprise. He? But do you mean? she said, and Anne nodded. That's right, Mr. Baker, he's coming to dine with us on Friday. You're to take the invitation tomorrow, Anne replied. She pictured the scene on Friday. William's arrival, their gaze meeting over Sherry, their feet touching beneath the table. He would gaze into her eyes, and she would smile at him, longing to take his hands in hers. What would they talk about? Would he bring a gift, and what would come next? A dinner would surely lead to a picnic, or a visit to the theatre. That was how it was in her novels. The heroine would be swept off her feet, taken to some romantic spot on a lonely heather-clad moor. The moorlands were always heather-clad. Me, my lady? But what happened to Lord Peter? Helena asked. Oh, we can forget all about Lord Peter, I assure you. He's quite finished, in the eyes of my parents at least, and that's good enough for me. There was an altercation. Mr Baker stepped in and saved me, just as he did with the loaf of bread. My mother was very impressed. Oh, just imagine it, Helen. He's going to be here, isn't it wonderful? Anne exclaimed, her heart filled with expectant joy as to what was to come. But Helen adopted a more practical approach to Anne's romantic inclinations. I'm sure it is, my lady, but are you sure about this? You hardly know him. Not really, I mean. At least with the others, you knew their reputations beforehand, she said. But I do know him. I know him well enough, at least. He's a delight. You should have seen the way he behaved this evening. He's a perfect gentleman, she said, wanting only to defend William in the face of Helen's doubts. It was true. Anne did not know William. But any courtship began in such a way. There was no couple for whom the word stranger had not once been applied. Friends were strangers once, lovers were strangers once, and wives and husbands too were once strangers. That was the excitement of something new, the possibility of getting to know a person, of finding out about them, of asking questions and revealing something of oneself too. Anne felt excited at the prospect, even as she knew William was not the same as so many others. He was not of the same mould as Lord Peter or Maximilian. William was different, and it was his difference Anne liked. I'm sure he is, my lady, but I don't want to see you hurt, that's all. It can be all too easy to be caught up in the romance of it all, Helen said. Anne rolled her eyes. What did Helen know about romance? Her maid had never had a love interest, or so Anne believed. She was merely putting a dampener on Anne's expectations, and folding her arms, Anne fixed her with a defiant glare. I won't be hurt. I'd have been hurt by Lord Peter or Maximilian or whoever else my parents had chosen. But even if I am hurt, it'll be of my own doing, won't it? She said, and Helen nodded. As you wish, my lady, she replied, helping Anne ready herself for bed. As she lay down that night, Anne's thoughts were filled with the possibility of what was to come, of William and the dinner on Friday. It'll be wonderful, she told herself, imagining what she would wear and what they would talk about. Do you like Charlotte Roos? Oh no, it doesn't matter what he likes. Mother chooses the menus with the cook, but we could drink wine. Do you care for any particular wine, Mr Baker? My father imports from France, but he'll know that, won't he? He probably imports wine himself. Do you read, Mr Baker? I've just finished a wonderful set of novels about a baron, and, oh, but I'll sound so foolish. He'll think me dreadfully common to be reading penny novels. I wonder what his interests are. Has he travelled? Do you know Rome, Mr Baker? He's probably been to far more places than I have. I don't know Rome. Oh, I hope I don't make a fool of myself. It's one thing to dance with a man, quite another to be faced with him across the dinner table, Anne thought to herself, trying and failing to go to sleep. So excited was she at the prospect of what was to come, even as her nerves were at fever pitch.
Chapter 22 Take it to the Spaniards Inn, Helen. You'll find him there or leave it with the landlord. I suppose he'll be out doing something terribly important during the day, Anne said, as she watched her mother give William's invitation to dinner to her maid. Helen looked sceptical, but she nodded, bobbing into a curtsy before the Countess and leaving the drawing room. Anne clapped her hands together in delight. I still think it's odd to find him lodging at such a place. Where do his servants sleep? It's an awful inconvenience. I couldn't imagine staying in such a place, Anne's mother said, shaking her head. But Anne was not concerned with such details. The heroes in her stories did not concern themselves with such matters, and neither did it worry her to think of William dressing himself without a valet. She was merely excited at the thought of seeing William again. And as she sat with her governess later that morning, all she could think of was receiving William's reply. Anne, you're not listening, are you? Miss Guthrie said, tutting, as Anne looked up at her in surprise. Oh, no. I mean, yes, I was just... Thinking, Anne said, as the governess gave an exasperated sigh. Well, perhaps you'd like to think more about your French grammar than whatever daydream you found yourself in, she said, shaking her head. Anne smiled. She had been thinking about Shakespeare. It was not only the cheap and cheerful penny novels she devoured, but the plays of Shakespeare, too, were chief amongst her loves. The language, the imagery, the characters. The clock struck nine when I did send the nurse. In half an hour she promised to return. Perchance she cannot meet him, that's not so. Oh, she is lame. Love's heralds should be thoughts, which ten times faster glides than the sun's beams, driving back shadows over lowering hills. Therefore do nimble pinioned doves draw love, and therefore hath the wind-swift cupid wings. Anne said to herself, quoting from her favourite play, Romeo and Juliet. She felt just like Juliet, waiting for her nurse to return with Romeo's answer. Where was Helen? What was her delay? Miss Guthrie cleared her throat again. Alla, avoir, quoi, devoir, dire, Miss Guthrie said, encouraging Anne to join in. But as she spoke, footsteps on the stairs caused Anne to look up, her heart skipping a beat, even as she could not prevent herself from crying out in continued quotation of the bard. Oh God, she comes. Oh, honey nurse, what news? Hast thou met with him? She exclaimed, somewhat overexcited, as Helen entered the room, much to Miss Guthrie's annoyance. Honey nurse, are you quite all right, my lady? But yes, I have, and he'd be delighted to join you for dinner, Helen replied, looking somewhat confused, as Anne let out a squeal of delight, all thoughts of French grammar now replaced with the happy thought of what was to come. But what if I make a complete fool of myself, William said, as he struggled with an overly starched collar in front of the mirror in his room at the Spaniards Inn. You know how to eat with a knife and fork, don't you? Digby said, and William laughed. Yes, I know how to eat. It's not that, but I've never eaten in a grand house with an earl and countess. What if I... Well, all the lies, William replied, grimacing as the starched edge cut into his neck. It had been a surprise to receive the invitation from the Countess of Blakely. William had been hopeful as to the favourable impression he had made at Charlton Lodge, though Lord Peter's appalling behaviour had certainly made his task easier. William had stepped into the breach, defending Anne's honour in front of her mother, and thus securing the invitation to the dinner William was now readying himself for. It's not an interrogation, William. These people don't talk about anything of any substance. They'll mention the names of this and that person. You'll pretend you know them, whilst mentioning people they don't know in return. Just be polite, smile, be charming, you can't fail, Digby replied, even as William felt failure was a certainty. He had wanted to make a good impression, and thus he had. But his chivalry may too be his undoing, and William feared he would make a mistake or say something he should not. But I... I'm worried I will, William said, glancing at himself in the mirror and seeing only a fraud in his place. Once again, William was dressed as a gentleman. He looked the part with his stiff collar, long tails, blue and yellow cravat, and all the other accoutrements of gentlemanly dress. But inside, William was still the son of a seamstress, 
raised in a cottage on the edge of a grand estate. He had always been on the periphery, and even now he felt it was still where he belonged. But don't you want to spend the evening with Anne? Isn't being polite to her parents over dinner a small price to pay for what might come of it? Digby asked. William nodded. It was what he wanted, and he had already done so much to make it happen. He had money on his pocket, a burgeoning reputation, and good prospects. All of that was true, and Digby's words reminded him of why he was doing what he was doing. William was falling in love with Anne. He had fallen in love with her, and an awkward dinner was a small price to pay for an evening spent in her company. You're right, I'm wallowing in my own fears. I should be going if I'm not to be late, William said, glancing at the grandfather clock in the corner of the room. He was due at the home of the Earl and Countess at seven o'clock. Dinner would be preceded by drinks, and as he sat in the carriage, William thought again as to what his mother would say if she could see him now. He had written to her regularly, but his correspondence had been only superficial. He had told her of life in London, his prospects for employment, and his impressions of the society he had encountered. But he had made no mention of Anne, or Digby, or anything of those things he had been involved with of which she would surely disapprove. I can only imagine what she'd think, he thought to himself, as the carriage pulled up outside the handsome townhouse indicated on the invitation. Taking a deep breath, William opened the carriage door, reminding himself of all he had done since arriving in London and the gentleman he had become. Just hold your nerve, he told himself, as he made his way up the steps to the large, imposing black door. He knocked, and a moment later, the door was opened by an imperious-looking man, presumably the butler. Good evening, sir, he said, stepping aside to indicate William was expected. Mr. William Baker, for dinner with the Earl and Countess, William said, stepping over the threshold, just as footsteps on the marbled floor brought with them a cry of excited exclamation. Oh, William, you're here, how wonderful, Anne said, hurrying towards him as William smiled at her. She looked beautiful. Dressed in a peach-coloured gown with an ornate silk shawl around her shoulders and sequined slippers on her feet. Anne, I... I'm so pleased to see you, William said, as Anne took him by the hands and smiled. They're waiting for you in the drawing room. We'll have drinks first. It's this way. Did you come by carriage? Your own, I presume, Anne said, leading William through the opulent surroundings of the house. It reminded William of Burnley Abbey, the walls covered in paintings and portraits, hanging above ornate furnishings, the windows hung with lavish drapes and large pot plants, adding a sense of the exotic. Anne was wearing the most delightful scent, and as she walked, it was as though she was leading him through a garden of roses. She was beautiful in every way, more than his dreams could conjure, and in her company the thought of lies, of worries and fear melted away. What a wonderful house this is, William said, gazing around him in awe. Oh, I'm sure it's nothing you're not used to. All these pictures and paintings, fine furniture. One hardly notices it in the end, Anne replied. William smiled thinking back to the simple cottage in which he had been raised, where a table, chairs and an old chest had sufficed for furnishings. Anne led him into the drawing room, its walls decorated in sumptuous wallpaper, depicting scenes of peacocks, and where the Earl and Countess were waiting to receive him. Ah, Mr Baker, how fortunate we are to have this opportunity, the Earl said, stepping forward and offering William his hand. It's a pleasure, sir, my lord. William replied, taking the Earl's hand and affecting a curt bow. He greeted the Countess in a similar manner, and a livery-clad footman now offered him a glass of sherry from a silver tray. William detested sherry. As a boy, he had once stolen a bottle from his godfather's study, drinking the contents and regretting it soon after. Once again, Mr Baker, we're very grateful to you for what you did last night. We still can't quite believe Lord Peter's behaviour. But never mind, it's in the past now, the Countess said, as Anne slipped her arm into William's. I was ever so grateful, William, she said, looking up at him and smiling. His heart was hers. 
He loved everything about her, and now he smiled, feeling embarrassed at having told so many lies to arrive at this moment. Nevertheless, his feelings towards Anne were sincere, and William knew he had acted honourably in the face of Lord Peter's appalling behaviour. I presume... Well, you won't see him again, William said, and Anne shook her head, glancing at her parents as she spoke. No, not again, she said, and William smiled. A gong now sounded in the hallway and the butler appeared to announce dinner in the dining room. William walked with Anne, following the Earl and Countess into a lavishly decorated room, where the table was set with the finest crockery and silverware. A delicious smell was coming from the sideboard, where half a dozen dishes stood waiting to be served. William sat down opposite Anne, with the Earl and Countess at either end of the table. So, William, Anne tells me you're busy searching for gainful employment. You mentioned exports and imports last night. What business specifically do you intend to settle on? The Earl asked, as the footman served the first dish. A soup with the scent of herbs. William was momentarily disarmed. Digby had assured him there would be no talk of such things, merely societal intrigues and gossip. Well, you see, I'm rather hoping to do something different, William said, for he really knew nothing about imports and exports, and certainly not enough to discuss the matter meaningfully with the Earl. Ah, how interesting. Which firms have you approached? Brokers? Lawyers? Or do you intend to try for the commons? I hardly ever go to the Lords, it's so dull, the Earl said. William was relieved. He could at least talk meaningfully of his attempts to secure employment. He had his letter of recommendation from his godfather, and now he took it out proudly. I wouldn't want to enter politics, not at such a young age. One needs experience first. But I'm fortunate to have a letter of recommendation from my godfather. I've approached several firms since arriving in London, brokers and lawyers mainly, and I've got all manner of offers. It's just a case of choosing the right one, William replied. The Earl looked at him with an impressed expression on his face. Your godfather must be an important man. Do I know him? he asked. William smiled. The name of the Duke of Lancaster had already opened many doors for him, and whilst he knew he should be wary of using it now, the temptation was too great. With a flourish, he handed the Duke his godfather's letter. My godfather's the Duke of Lancaster, he replied. The reaction to these words was not entirely as he had expected. Anne dropped her soup spoon into her bowl of soup, splattering her dress, as she let out an exclamation of astonishment. Goodness, I didn't know that, she said, as her mother stared at William in surprise. What a small world we live in, she said, as Anne dabbed at her dress with a napkin. William was worried he had said the wrong thing, realising the aristocratic world was smaller than he had assumed as the Earl laughed. We know the Duke of Lancaster well, his son and, well, it doesn't matter, does it? But yes, dear Ralph, our families are old friends. We've a long history since the Restoration, the Earl replied. At these words, William's heart skipped a beat as he realised the implications of what he had done. In his naivety, William had assumed the Earl, whose estate was in Hampshire, could not possibly know the Duke of Lancaster, how wrong he had been. Oh, then you know Burnley Abbey and the Duchess, William said, glancing at the Countess, who nodded. Miriam's a dear thing. I've known her many years. Well, it's really my friend, Lady Flintshire, who knows her. She's Anne's godmother, the Countess said. William glanced at Anne, who had now recovered her composure. She smiled at him, laughing off her surprise, even as her dress remained stained by the soup. What a surprise! I suppose it's inevitable to find such connections. But you never mentioned it before, Anne said, and William felt embarrassed. No, I suppose I didn't, he replied, fearing what might happen now the connection was known. As it happens, I'll be writing to the Duke in the coming days. I've a business proposition for him. I'll be sure to mention you, William. You've certainly got an excellent connection in the Duke. I'm sure it's opened many doors for you, the Earl said and William could feel nothing but despair at the inevitability of discovery the Earl's words would bring. Later, after he had said good night and left the house, 
excusing himself as quickly as possible, even as he knew Anne would think his behaviour odd. William felt certain he would not be invited back again. They're bound to find out the truth, he thought to himself, fearful of what his godfather would say about his behaviour and what it would mean for his future prospects too. Chapter 23 My bounty is as boundless as the sea, my love as deep. The more I give to thee, the more I have, for both are infinite, Anne said, quoting Romeo and Juliet as she sat on the window seat, looking out over the garden. Helen looked up from folding Anne's dresses and smiled. You're swooning, my lady. Is that Shakespeare? she said, and Anne blushed. She had not meant to say the words out loud. Oh, Helen, am I fool? she asked, but the maid shook her head. Not at all, my lady. Why would anyone think you a fool? she asked, and Helen sighed. She had fallen in love with William, completely and utterly so, and she was fortunate her parents now shared her good opinion of him. Notwithstanding the strange coincidence of the dinner party, where their mutual connection to the Duke of Lancaster had been discovered, Anne felt certain William was the perfect match for her. Besides, it was hardly unusual to find such connections, and Anne felt certain William would explain the matter fully to her in due course. Talk at the dinner table that night had soon turned to other things, and when William had bid her goodbye, Anne had promised she would see him again very soon. That had been a week ago, and she was expectant as to what was to come. As soon as we can manage it, she had whispered in his ear. William had seemed somewhat embarrassed by the connection between the two families, but despite her initial surprise, Anne could only think such a match would win approval. Her godmother, Lady Flintshire could hardly disapprove, could she? I just feel so very much in love, that's all, Anne replied, and Helen smiled. I'm sure Mr Shakespeare has things to say about fools in love, my lady. But when did true love ever make sense? If you've fallen in love with him, so be it. I'm happy for you, and I think your parents are too, the maid replied. It was the perfect match, approved by all, and certain to make Anne happy. She hoped her father would see the sense in a swift engagement, and as she readied herself for the morning, Anne could not help but feel a sense of excitement at the prospect of what was to come. He'll propose before long and then we'll be married. And perhaps I won't mind going to Lancashire then. Oh, but he won't want to go back there, will he? No, we'll get married in London and have our own house here. I'll be mistress of my own house, no more having to eat the ghastly things mother chooses. We'll have turbot and sole and perch. I do love fish. Oh, but first things first, the wedding, Anne thought to herself, caught up in the fantasy of possibility now presented her. She made her way downstairs, intending to take a late breakfast in the dining room before joining her mother in the garden. The countess had taken to cutting flowers in the early morning, decorating the morning room with fragrant blooms, and Anne intended to spend the rest of the day there enjoying her latest book and daydreaming of ideas for her own literary intentions. But as she came down to the hallway, her father was waiting for her with an anxious expression on his face. Anne, I think you'd better join your mother and I in my study, he said with a grave look on his face. Anne felt confused. Her father never invited her into his inner sanctum except on the most serious of business. What's wrong, father? Has someone died? Anne asked fearing some tragedy had visited them during the night. But her father shook his head. No one's died, Anne. But I've received a letter, he said, beckoning her to follow him. Anne did so, entering the book-lined study to find her mother sitting by the hearth with an angry expression on her face. I just can't believe it, Anne, she said, shaking her head. But what's happened, mother? I don't understand. Anne replied, and her father held up a letter in his hand. This, that's what's happened, Anne. After the dinner with William, I wrote to the Duke of Lancaster about his godson. I wanted to get the measure of the young man. I know your feelings for him, and I was grateful to him for defending your honour at Charlton Lodge, and previously when you were accosted. 
I asked the Duke to furnish me with some particulars of William's past, his prospects. Well, he said, his words trailing off as he handed Anne the letter. With trembling hands she took it, her heart beating fast, for it seemed her hopes and dreams were about to be dashed. The pleasant preliminaries soon gave way to detail, and Anne read out loud, horrified at what she now learned. As for William, you will find him a decent sort, the son of a former servant of mine. I have always taken an interest in his education, and for that reason I have sent him to London with a letter of recommendation in the hope he will make something of himself and further his own fortune. I must say, I find it strange to think of him mixing in such circles as your own, though I applaud him for having done so, the lowly son of a seamstress, Raising himself to greater things and entering a society entirely alien to him should be applauded. He knows nothing of such a world. But I thank you for taking an interest in him. She read, her eyes wide with astonishment at what she was learning about William. He was not the wealthy gentleman he had made himself out to be. His claims to connections and wealth were null and void. He was the son of a servant, without any prospects of his own. Anne felt a fool. She had been taken in by his words, by his appearance, and by Digby too. The letter went on to reveal the Duke's hopes for William, that he would find a respectable position as a clerk or junior, securing a modest income, and in the fullness of time, finding a wife. Anne looked up at her father in disbelief. I didn't mention anything about you, Anne. I only said I'd come across William at the Charlton Lodge Ball and asked him to dine with us. I wrote I was keen to help him, but I realise now he's told nothing but lies, the Earl said, shaking his head as Anne began to sob. Don't waste your love on somebody who doesn't value it, she said, quoting Romeo and Juliet once again. How betrayed she felt, as now her mother came to put her arms around her. My darling, don't cry. At least you've discovered the truth before it truly hurt you, she whispered. But the truth had already hurt Anne. She felt devastated to learn William had lied to her. He had seemed so sincere, so truthful. She had trusted him, and all the while he had been laughing at her. The lies he had told, the impression he had given. It was all a sham, and Anne realised she had been a victim of a terrible betrayal. But it's already hurt me, she sobbed, clinging to her mother who stroked her hair and shushed her. There, there, life isn't always like your penny novels, Anne. It's not always easy to realise that, though, she said, as Anne looked up at her through her tears. But I... I'm in love with him, she exclaimed, as though the fact should make a difference to the truth. And we may never know why he's done what he's done. I'm only glad we discovered it sooner rather than later, the Countess said, as Anne's father cleared his throat. Well, the matter's settled at least, he said, but for Anne it was far from so. I'm going to talk to him. I'll tell him what I think of men who behave in such a beastly manner, she exclaimed, her tears turned to anger as she pulled away from her mother and rose to her feet. Anne, you can't do that her mother exclaimed, but Anne was already hurrying out of the study, calling for Helen to bring her shawl and for the butler to summon a carriage. But, my lady, it's... You can't expect him to apologise, Helen pleaded as the carriage pulled up outside the Spaniards' Inn a short while later. He may not apologise, Helen, but I'm going to tell him just how he's made me feel, Anne replied. She was not about to allow William to get away with his lies and treachery. He had played her for a fool. She felt deeply embarrassed at having been caught up in the possibility of romance, even as cruel fate had snatched happiness from her grasp. Flinging open the carriage door, Anne climbed down, followed by Helen, who had spent the entire journey trying to talk her out of doing anything she might later regret. But my lady, Helen called out, as Anne flung open the door to the inn and strode into the taproom. The sight of an aristocratic lady was clearly not a common sight in the low-beamed taproom of the inn, where barrels of beer lined the wall behind the counter, and groups of men sat drinking at small tables around the side. 
Can I help you, miss? The man behind the counter, a large man with a ruddy face and beard, presumably the landlord, asked. You can tell me where I might find William Baker, Anne replied. But as she spoke, she saw William at the far end, his back turned to her, hunched over a tankard of ale. Digby was with him, the two of them no longer dressed in the finery of gentlemen at a ball, but in the common dress of the countryside. Anne strode towards them, and William turned to her with a fearful expression on his face. Anne, I didn't expect to see you here, he stammered, rising to his feet. Anne pointed at him angrily, her whole body trembling as she spoke. Oh, but I expected to find you here. A place like this is just where I'd expect to find a commoner like you, she replied, almost spitting the final words in her anger. Lady Miller, please, Digby said, trying to calm the situation, but Anne was not interested in excuses nor in having her question answered by William's mouthpiece. She wanted to know the truth, not from Digby, but from William. Be quiet. My father received a letter about you, William. A letter from your godfather. He wrote some interesting things in it, she said, as William's face turned pale. Lady Miller, really, this isn't the time or the place, Digby interjected. But Anne silenced him with a withering gaze. I told you to be quiet. I don't need to listen to any more of your lies about this commoner, she exclaimed, as William stared at her in horror. But he's my godfather, I was telling the truth about that, he said. The taproom had fallen silent. All eyes now turned on Anne and William, who stood facing one another at the far end by the windows looking out onto the yard. Oh yes, godfather to the son of a servant without a penny to his name. You're no gentleman, you've no prospects of your own. You know nothing about business or imports and exports. Every utterance you've made is a lie, Anne exclaimed, jabbing her finger at William, who stepped back in fear. Not all of them, Anne, I promise. I didn't mean to lie to you, it just... When we met, I was nothing, and you were... everything. I knew you were different. I'm sorry. Don't think badly of me, please, he said, but it was too late for that. Anne did think badly of him and more so because she had actually thought he was different from the others. He had seemed it, but Anne now realised he had simply been playing her for a fool. In Lord Peter, Anne had discerned a rake, and that was what he was. He had not tried to hide his true nature. But what William had done was worse. He had created a false impression and made himself into something he was not. It had hurt Anne dreadfully, and now she shook her head, refusing to believe anything he told her. But I do think badly of you, William. I trusted you. I believed the things you told me. And now, there's nothing left to say, Anne replied, her lips trembling as she fought back the tears. She had fallen in love with him, and she had believed he loved her too. The words of Shakespeare once again came to mind. Parting is such sweet sorrow. Chapter 24 William was entirely taken aback, even as he had feared what Anne's father would do with the revelation of their shared connection to the Duke of Lancaster. He had been a fool to boast in such things, and now he was paying the price. He stared at Anne, his lips trembling, knowing he had lost her. I'm sorry, Anne. I don't know what else to say. I didn't mean to tell those lies. I got caught up in the possibility of your loving me as I love you, he said. For a moment her anger seemed to falter and a tear rolled down her cheek. I... It might have been so, she said as her maid took her gently by the arm. Come, my lady, you've upset yourself enough, she said, and Anne allowed herself to be led away. William watched her go before sinking into his chair and burying his head in his hands. What have I done? he exclaimed. Don't blame yourself, William, Digby said, and William looked up at him angrily. Then who am I to blame? It was you who encouraged me, gambling, dressing up, lying about imports and exports, William exclaimed, his anger inflamed at the thought of what Digby had persuaded him to do. 
but his friend shook his head. Those things would surely have passed by, William. You had good prospects. But it was your godfather who spoiled them for you. What a letter to write. Does he really hate you so much as to dash your hopes and dreams on the rock of truth? He asked. The rest of the taproom had returned to their drinks after the dramatic spectacle, and William now stared at Digby in disbelief. He had always believed his godfather to have his best interests at heart, and yet the words of the letter suggested otherwise. But I... I don't understand, he said as Digby shook his head. He's betrayed you, William. He didn't need to say those things, did he? He's always been the same, only interested in himself. Look what he's done to you, William. Don't you feel angry at him? Digby asked. William was confused. He did feel angry at the Duke for telling Anne's father those things, even as he knew they were the truth. His godfather had only written the facts as to William's position in life. But whilst it had been William who had told the lies, he now blamed the Duke for revealing them. I, but what do you mean? He's always been the same, William asked, and Digby shook his head, pushing William's tankard of ale towards him. I must admit, William, I've not been entirely honest with you. I knew Professor Murray, of course, but I knew your godfather too, and his brother, Digby replied. William stared at him in astonishment. They had known one another for weeks, and yet Digby had said nothing of his connection to the Duke. But as for the Duke's brother, William knew little about him. He had died in Corsica, just like his own father, and his only legacy was a portrait of him in the dining room at Burnley Abbey. You knew them? But why didn't you say anything? William asked. Digby shrugged. I didn't see the point at first, but it means something now, doesn't it? I'd hoped your godfather might be different now. But he isn't, is he? He's still only interested in himself. He betrays others, William, and he's betrayed you too, he said. And William banged his fist down angrily on the table. No, he's not like that, he exclaimed, even as the evidence suggested the contrary. Oh, but he is, William, he's just like that, Digby replied, shaking his head. William did not know what to think. He had trusted his godfather, just as Anne had surely trusted him too. He felt ashamed at having lied, but angry to have had that lie revealed. And for what? Was his godfather angry with him for what he had done? William still had the letter of recommendation in his pocket, and now he pulled it out, unfolding it to read his godfather's words of introduction. A fine young man, whom I believe can achieve much, he read, shaking his head as Digby snatched it from him. More lies, he exclaimed, and his eyes flashed with anger. William did not understand why Digby should be so angry with his godfather, and he wondered what the connection between them really was. How did you know him? Why can you be so sure about him? William asked, for he still could not entirely believe his godfather had willfully betrayed him. I was the land agent for the Duke's father. At least my father was such and I learned from him. But your godfather didn't want me there any longer. Not after... Well, there was a secret. A cover-up, Digby said, leaning forward and fixing William with an intense gaze. William felt uncomfortable. His mother had always told him to avoid discussions of scandal and secret. Don't listen to people who tell tall tales, William, she had often said, even as Digby continued to hold his gaze. I'm not interested, William said, for he preferred to put the whole sorry matter behind him. He'd been a fool to think his lies would not be found out, and so caught up in his growing feelings for Anne as to ignore the possibility of what would happen when they were. His godfather had merely brought the blow to bear earlier, and William knew there would be consequences for the way in which he had used his godfather's good name to secure invitations and make himself appear the gentleman he was not. Your godfather betrayed you, William. He's taken away your chance of happiness, Digby persisted. There'll be others, William replied, for he was not entirely certain Digby was not without fault either in this matter. But I suppose it's nothing new, is it? The Duke of Lancaster taking away your happiness? Digby continued, a slight smile coming over his face. William looked at him in surprise. His godfather had always been kind to him, 
and despite his initial anger at learning what had been written about him, William knew he owed the Duke every good fortune he had. He's always been good to me. I shouldn't have used his goodness to my advantage. I shouldn't have lied or made myself out to be something I'm not. I gambled. I spent money freely. I used his name to impress a woman I had no right to impress, William said, feeling terribly ashamed of himself. But Digby shook his head. That's what he wants you to think, I'm sure. He's always taken control of your life, William, he said. Come now, Digby. You know nothing about my life, William said. But Digby shook his head. It wasn't my place to tell you, William, but given what the Duke's done to you, betraying his own nephew, he said. It took a moment for William to realise what Digby was saying. He gasped, almost falling off his chair and toppling his tankard of ale as he let out a cry of astonishment. I... what do you mean? What are you saying? he stammered as Digby heaved a heavy sigh. Why would a duke be the godfather of a servant's son? he asked. It was a question William too had pondered in the past, even as he had put the matter down to kindness and philanthropy. It was something he had never questioned, and his mother had never explained. Nonsense, you're just speculating. My father died, he began, but Digby finished his sentence. In Corsica, yes, just like the Duke's brother, the last Duke of Lancaster. They served together in Corsica whilst your mother was left at home, working as a maid at Burnley Abbey, he said, and William's eyes grew wide with realisation. His mother rarely mentioned his father. He was dead and had died in Corsica. William had never before made the connection, though he knew the former Duke had died there too. His father was a hero. He remembered his godfather saying as much, even as he now wondered if Digby was only trying to make trouble. No, I don't believe it. It's not true, Digby. You're lying. Why? Don't you want me to be happy? If you really knew them, you'd know the truth, and... William began. But again Digby interrupted him, throwing down a small leather-clad black book onto the table in front of him. It's all here in black and white, William. The diary of your father, Max, the former Duke of Lancaster. It tells of his love for your mother and his delight in learning she was to bear him a son. He couldn't wait to return home and marry her. It was all planned. And then he died. After that, your godfather, your uncle, wanted everything to be kept quiet. They didn't want a bastard as the heir to the dukedom, he said, pushing the diary towards William, who reached out to take it with a trembling hand. It was that word, heir. If what Digby said was true, William was the heir to the dukedom, his father's dukedom, not his uncle's. Maximilian would be displaced, as would the duke himself. It was all too extraordinary for words, even as William took the diary in his hands and undid the clasp. A diary! How extraordinary, he said, and Digby nodded. They thought they'd got it back, silenced me from telling the truth but there was more to it than they thought. Your father wrote a journal too. I kept as much as I could, along with pages I snatched in haste. I've kept it all these years. I wanted you to know the truth, William, he said, and William looked up at him, still unable to understand why Digby should keep such a secret from him. But... I don't understand. Why didn't you just tell me? He asked, distracted by the entries he was flicking through. Darling Teresa, how I love her, how happy I feel to think of the child. What a family we will be, my son and heir, he read, his hands trembling as he flicked through the pages. I'd hoped your uncle would do so himself. I still wanted him to have the chance to do so. I thought he'd wait until you were established as a gentleman. It wasn't my place to do so. But in this sorry state of affairs, he's betrayed you. I've no choice but to tell you the truth now, and I urge you to take your revenge against him. He sent you to London with a letter of promise, expecting you to make your own fortune. William, a fortune lies ready-made for you in the house he occupies against what's right. You're the Duke of Lancaster, William. Seize your inheritance and revenge yourself against him for betraying you and taking away your chances of love, Digby said, banging his fist down on the table. 
At these words, William felt his anger growing. He looked down at the diary. There was no reason to doubt it. The fraying pages, the fading letters. It was old and dated from the time of the war in Corsica, the same war in which his father had been killed. A sudden sense of sadness came over him too. Why had his mother never told him the truth? She too had colluded in the lie, and William now held the evidence in his hands. Digby was right. His godfather had betrayed him. And if Anne was to reject him, he would gladly take his revenge against the man who had made it so. The letter of recommendation had been only a token gesture. A payoff for that which the Duke had stolen from him. His rightful inheritance. You're right, Digby. I've got to do it, haven't I? I can't let him get away with it. I want you to tell me everything you know, William said, knowing he was caught up in a web of lies, his own paling into insignificance. I think something good can come of this, Anne, her father said, as Anne sat dejectedly in the drawing room that evening. She looked up at him curiously. I don't see what, father, she replied, for she had spent most of the afternoon in tears, lamenting her sorrowful situation. Well. The possibility of Maximilian. The two of you never met, did you? And writing to the Duke of Lancaster rather put me in mind to renew the possibility of an acquaintance between the two of you, he said. Anne looked at him in surprise, even as her mother clapped her hands together in delight. But that's a wonderful idea. Isn't your father clever, Anne? she asked. Anne was not sure she would have used quite that word even as it seemed her father had decided on an idea he would not easily relinquish. It all seemed rather too soon to be thinking about another match, albeit one cast aside in favour of a hope which had now failed to transpire. But he'll surely know about William. I can't, Anne replied. But her father waved his hand dismissively. That man, that fool, was trading on his godfather's good name. A man like the Duke of Lancaster has dozens of godsons. I've got twenty-two. I've no doubt some of them use my own name to secure positions for themselves. I doubt he gives him a second thought. As for Maximilian, well, he's hardly going to associate with the son of a servant, is he? It would do you good to get out of London, Anne. I'll write to the Duke and tell him we'll journey north at once, the Earl replied. Anne was swept up in her mother's excitable intentions, and it was not long before arrangements were made and a letter sent north, informing the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster of their plans. Whatever made you change your minds, I'm glad I didn't write to the Duchess myself calling the whole thing off, Anne's godmother, Lady Flintshire, said, when she came to take tea the following day. It was the godson of the Duke, William Baker, Anne's mother replied, and the tale of what had happened was told. Lady Flincher listened, shaking her head and tutting. Well, we don't need to worry about him any more, do we? The important thing is the match, and it seems you're to make an excellent one, Anne, she said, as though the matter was a fait accompli. But despite her anger at what William had done and the sense of betrayal she now felt, Anne could not help but feel sorrow at the fact of what had happened and how close she had come to finding love only for it to be snatched so readily from her. Chapter 25 William was walking through Bluebell Woods in the direction of his mother's cottage. He had not been able to settle in London, not after learning the truth about his lineage. It felt strange to be back in Lancashire. The familiarity of his childhood replaced by an uncertainty as to who he really was. He had grown up believing his father to be a hero who had died in battle. That much was true, but the identity of his father was something quite different. William had read through the diary a dozen times. It belonged to the dead Duke, his father, and it spoke entirely of his love for William's mother and the hope of William himself. I just don't understand why no one told me, William said to himself, in words he had repeated over and over again. Digby's explanation had been admirable, and William bore no ill will towards his friend, who had kept the secret from him, in the hope of it being revealed by those who should have revealed it. A letter of recommendation was a poor payoff in exchange for the dukedom, and as he had journeyed north, 
William's sense of injustice had only grown stronger. It wasn't meant to be like this. None of it was, William told himself, as he came in sight of his mother's cottage. Digby had accompanied him north and was waiting for his return at an inn in Burnley. William was not certain what he would say to his mother or what he would do when confronted by his godfather. But the time for lies was over and William was angry with the Duke, his uncle, for spoiling his chances with Anne. He had heard nothing more from her and his hopes of romance had been dashed. I was such a fool. They're all laughing at me, I'm sure. The Duke, the Duchess, Maximilian. William thought to himself, for he felt certain everyone else knew the truth, everyone apart from him. As he approached the cottage door, his heart was beating fast, but before he could knock it was opened and his mother stared out at him in surprise. William, I saw you coming along the path, but why are you here? she asked as William held out the pages from the diary Digby had given him. I want to know who my real father is, he replied, as his mother's eyes grew wide with horror. Teresa had not expected to see her son that day. She had spent the morning mending stockings and had been about to start on a pair of breeches when she had noticed William approaching the cottage through the trees. He looked a fine figure of a man, grown up and handsomely dressed, and she had hurried to open the door to him, excited at the prospect of welcoming him home and hearing tales of his adventures. But the look on his face had told a different story, and as he held out the diary and spoke those dreaded words, Teresa knew the time had come. Aye, you'd better come in, William. Make us some tea, she said, ushering him inside. William followed her into the humble dwelling, where a fire was smoking in the hearth, the kettle hung from a chain above. Teresa lived a simple life, taking in mending and getting by as best she could, though always with Ralph and Miriam on hand should she need them. The Duke had been good to her, especially in his treatment of William, and Teresa would be forever grateful to him and the Duchess for their kindness. Tell me, mother, I don't want tea or empty platitudes. I want to know the truth. Who do I call my father? It's the Duke, isn't it? The one who died? William said, as Teresa turned to him with a heavy heart. She had never told him the truth, not out of malice or spite, but because she and the Duke and Duchess had agreed to leave the matter in the past. It was over, finished, and there was no reason to open old wounds or invite fresh scandal. With a sigh, Teresa shook her head. It doesn't matter, William. What matters is how we are now, she said, even as she knew her words were feeble. William had every right to know the truth about his father. But Teresa knew he would not have guessed as much on his own. And now another fear seized her as she sat down with a heavy sigh on the chair by the hearth. How we are now. But I want to know, Mother. I want to know the truth about who I am now. I've read the diary. It talks only of you. He loved you. You were going to marry. He wanted me to be his heir. I'm the rightful Duke of Lancaster, aren't I? William said, fixing Teresa with an angry look as now she sighed and nodded. Who told you, William? How do you know this? You can't have guessed it for yourself, she said, fearing William's answer. There was only one man who knew the truth and would wish to use it against them. Connor Edge, the land agent, sent away in disgrace for his attempts at blackmail and his threat of scandal. It had been Ralph's mother, the dowager, who had exposed his own fraudulent ways, and the Duke had threatened him with ruin if he should ever return. But despite this ultimatum, it seemed Connor, or someone close to him, had told William the truth long kept secret. A friend! They gave me these pages from his diary too. It's all here, mother. I know the truth. Why didn't you tell me? What gave you the right to keep it from me? William demanded. He had always been such a gentle creature and yet in his anger, Teresa could see that of Connor too. He had been the same, swift to claim insult and desirous of revenge. It was for the best, William. You don't know what it was like. We suffered a terrible burden, Teresa replied, tears welling up in her eyes, as she thought back to all they had endured at the hands of Connor and the cruel circumstances of Max's death. Then it's true. 
I'm the heir to the dukedom, William said, and Teresa sighed. It's not as simple as that, William, but it's true. You're the son of Max, the last duke. He's your father, she replied, speaking the words she had vowed to keep forever in her heart. We were delighted to receive your letter, Miriam said, as she took a cake from the cake stand, smiling at the Countess of Blakely, who had come to Burnley Abbey with her daughter and husband that afternoon to take tea. It had been Lady Flintshire, an acquaintance of Miriam's from a season she had spent in London, who had suggested a possible match between Anne, daughter of the Earl and Countess, and Maximilian, who was currently sitting sulkily by the hearth, nursing a saucer of tea. Miriam had been surprised to receive a further missive from the Earl himself, informing her they were travelling north to make the introduction. The past few weeks had seen a lull in Lady Flincher's previously enthusiastic correspondence, and Miriam had assumed the matter to have been quietly dropped, even as Maximilian had shown no interests whatsoever in its coming to fruition. But Anne was an attractive creature, and whilst she appeared shy, the match was not without its potential merits. And we must apologise for the swiftness of our progress north. One shouldn't delay these things, I feel, the Earl said. And Miriam nodded, glancing at Ralph, who appeared content to allow her to make the arrangements on his behalf. I quite agree. And with Maximilian now taking on further responsibilities for the running of the estate, it's the right time to consider a suitable match. How nice to bring two young people together in this way, Miriam said glancing fearfully at her son, who scowled. And what a wonderful estate to take responsibility for, the Countess said, having already gushed over the furnishings in the drawing room, and complimented Miriam on the running of her household. Well, yes, quite, Miriam said, glancing anxiously at Maximilian, who thus far had not shown the slightest interest in welcoming their unexpected visitors. If this was to be the beginnings of a courtship, it was hardly going according to plan. Miriam knew she had no grounds to force Maximilian and Anne together, nor would she want to, given her own history with Ralph. But she wanted him to be happy, and she could not understand why an intelligent and pretty young woman like Anne should not at least spark a little interest in him. It's not been easy for Anne lately. London life, rather, overwhelms her, the Countess said, glancing at Anne, who gave a weak smile. Miriam wondered how much her being there was a matter of coercion rather than desire. She felt sorry for Anne. Like all young ladies, she was at that stage in life where changes come thick and fast and the expectations of one's parents can feel overwhelming. Miriam remembered it well. Oh, I couldn't live in London, but I understand from my husband you've made the acquaintance of our former associate, William, Miriam said, glad to change the subject, even as the Earl grimaced. Ah, yes, we met him at the Charlton Lodge Ball. He spun quite the tale, the Earl said, shaking his head. Anne shifted uncomfortably in her seat, and Miriam wondered if there was not more to the tale than the Earl and Countess were willing to reveal. Miriam and Ralph had heard little from William since he had set off for London, and it had come as a surprise when a letter from the Earl had arrived, seeking the particulars of the young man whom they had sent off to seek his fortune in the South. I'm sure that's not the case. William's a good man. He worked hard here. He comes from a lowly background, of course. But that's no bar to making something of himself. I took it on myself to provide a tutor for him. But his intelligence and quick thinking are the result of his own diligence, Ralph said, glancing at Miriam, who nodded. The Earl and Countess looked at one another, and Anne appeared close to bursting into tears. Oh, dear. It seems we've struck an unfortunate subject. Won't you all have another scone? They're quite delicious, Miriam said, hoping to diffuse the situation. She had not expected William to be a force of division between them, even as Anne pulled out a handkerchief and dabbed at her eyes. I don't know why anyone would bother with William. He's no one, Maximilian said, looking up from his saucer of tea with a smirk on his face. Miriam raised her eyebrows. She knew there was no love lost between the two boys, the two men, as they now were. But she did not like the way Maximilian looked down his nose at William, particularly given the truth she knew about her nephew. 
if the truth was revealed, William could claim to be the rightful heir to the dukedom. It was unlikely, of course, but Maximilian's behaviour had been nothing short of rakish in the preceding months, and Miriam feared further scandal was looming. Ralph had bought her own father's title for him, but he was still waiting for the opportune time to reveal the truth. If William knew it now, it could spell disaster. He's your father's godson, Maximilian. The two of you were friends as children. Why this bitterness now? Miriam replied, not wanting Anne to think badly of Maximilian on this, their first meeting. But to her surprise, Anne turned to Maximilian and nodded. I think you're quite right. He certainly keeps some unfortunate friendships now. Better to have realised that earlier on, she said, as Miriam looked at her in surprise. She glanced at Ralph, whose eyes had narrowed. Who was the friend Anne spoke of? Did William make any friends in London? she asked, and Anne nodded. Oh, yes. He has a friend called Digby Kirkpatrick. They were never apart. When I first met him, I assumed him to be William's valet. But then I assumed a great deal about William I found to be untrue. I didn't much care for Digby. He told as many lies as William. It seems odd now I think about it. An older man, befriending a young man, newly arrived in London. There was something about him I didn't like, his bright blue eyes. They were piercing, always looking for something, she said, shuddering, shaking her head. Miriam did not like to press the matter further, even as a sudden terrible thought occurred to her. Connor, she said to herself, offering the plates of scones to the countess. She forced a smile to her face, looking sympathetically at Anne, who was dabbing her eyes with handkerchief. Well, I'm sure there's an explanation. We've never known William to be anything but a decent, hard-working young man, she said, even as she feared he had been tainted through association. The conversation now progressed, and the Countess spoke of her hopes for a happy match for Anne, even as she did not specific precisely what heartbreak William had caused. There was no suggestion he and Anne had entered a courtship, and whilst Miriam had heard the name of Lord Peter Ulverston in relation to Anne, no mention of him was made either. It seemed the Earl and Countess wanted a fresh start for their daughter, and they had brought her north for just that reason. Will you stay long in Lancashire? Ralph asked and the Earl and Countess glanced at one another. We're in no hurry to rush away, Anne's mother replied, just as the door opened and the butler, Mr Gregson, appeared with a characteristically disapproving look on his face. Miss Teresa Baker, to see you, Your Grace, he said, and Miriam rose to her feet immediately. Please forgive me, you must excuse me, she said, fearing what news Teresa was bringing. She thought again of Connor. Had he found William? and made it his business to poison his mind against them and make mischief for him in the process. She hurried from the room, trying to maintain her composure as she found Teresa waiting for her in the hallway. Something's happened. It's terrible, Teresa gasped, clutching at Miriam, who nodded. I fear I know it, she said, and Teresa stared at her in astonishment. But how? It's William. He he's come back, and I fear... He's met Connor, she said whispering the final word as though it were an incantation. Miriam sighed. And in the drawing room we've got the other part of the story, she replied, ushering Teresa into a room off the hallway and explaining everything that had just occurred. Chapter 26 William was angry. His mother had hardly given him a satisfactory explanation, though she had admitted the former duke was his father. It seemed everyone, his mother, the Duke, the Duchess, knew the truth, except him. He wanted to know why they had hidden it from him, and why his godfather had not accepted him as the rightful heir. I am the rightful heir, he told himself, thinking of Maximilian and his false claims to the inheritance. William had been told a lie, or rather, the truth had entirely been kept from him, and he had lived his life in false belief. He was not pauper to be tossed a few bones and told to be thankful. His father had been the Duke of Lancaster, and had he lived, he would have married William's mother, and William would have been raised as the heir. It's not right, none of it, 
he said to himself, pacing up and down in front of the hearth in the cottage. His mother had gone to Burnley Abbey, promising to tell the Duke and Duchess what William now knew. He wondered how they would respond, for surely they would not take kindly to William's claim. But William was determined to make it. He knew the truth, and he was not about to be silenced in revealing it. There was scandal involved, great scandal, and William had many unanswered questions as to what had happened all those years ago. I just don't understand, he thought to himself, as a knock came at the cottage door. It was Digby, who had been waiting for William's return to the inn where they had taken lodgings. William was surprised to see him. How did you know where to find my mother's cottage? he asked as Digby entered the parlour. I know all about your mother's cottage. I know all about everything, William. But what did she say? Did you confront her? Digby asked, and William nodded. He had not wanted to be angry with his mother. She had been visibly upset. But the concealing of such a monumental truth was too much to bear, and William had felt a sense of betrayal at having been kept in the dark for so long. Would they have ever told him the truth? She admitted it. William replied, and Digby smiled. She couldn't do anything but admit it. It's the truth, and the truth can be unpalatable at times. I suppose she's hurried off to Burnley Abbey, has she? I can just picture your godfather's face when he hears what's happened, Connor said, a smirking coming over his face. William did not understand what Digby held such vitriol towards the Duke, but his thoughts were concentrated on his anger, and he was grateful to his friend for at last revealing the truth. But what happens now? Am I really the heir to the dukedom? William asked. What did your mother say? Digby replied. William's mother had not actually agreed with him as to the facts of his inheritance. William did not know if he was the heir or not. It was all very confusing, but William was determined to discover the truth. She said my father was Max Oakley, the previous duke, the one who died in Corsica, the same story as my own father. But that would be him, wouldn't it? They made him up. I used to picture him, a hero, charging into battle. But now you knew him. What was he like? William asked, and Digby shook his head. I'm afraid they're all the same, William, self-entitled, and willing to lie and cheat others out of what's rightfully theirs. It was all a terrible scandal back then. At least it would have been, he said, his eyes narrowing and an angry look coming over his face. But what happens now? William asked, for he had not entirely thought through the implications of what was to happen in the wake of these astonishing revelations. He had returned to Lancashire burning with anger, and now he knew a confrontation was inevitable. Digby smiled at him. Go to Burnley Abbey. It's yours, isn't it? And one final thing, don't allow your mother to defend their cause. She was as much to blame for hiding it from you, he replied. William had been to Burnley Abbey on numerous occasions in his youth. He had always felt a sense of awe at its towering facade, its richly decorated rooms, the army of servants, and the trappings of wealth and opulence it exuded. But as he hurried up the steps that day, it was not as the son of a former servant coming to see his godfather, his benefactor, but as a man coming to claim what he rightfully believed to be his. They can't stop me, can they? William said, turning to Digby, who shook his head. Don't let them, William. They tried to pay you off, sending you to London on a promise. They made it seem they were being generous, and all the while they kept this from you. This is your rightful place, William. This is where you belong, Digby replied. William knocked loudly at the door. It was opened by the butler, Mr Gregson, a man who had always looked down his nose at William. Can I help you, sir? he said his voice cold and domineering. But William ignored him, pushing past the butler, who gave a cry of indignation. You can start by summoning Ralph and Miriam. Is my mother here, Gregson? William demanded, for he was not about to speak of the Duke and Duchess in formal terms, not after the way they had treated him. The butler stared at him in astonishment. I... But... What impertinence! he exclaimed as Digby now came through the door behind. It's quite all right, Gregson, 
No need to concern yourself. They're in the drawing room, I suppose, he said, and pointing across the hallway, he hurried William towards the drawing room door. Voices could be heard from inside, but William was determined to act, and now he burst through the door, only to be confronted by an extraordinary scene. His godfather and the Duchess were there, along with his mother, but they were joined by none other than Anne and the Earl and Countess. William stared at Anne in astonishment as his godfather rose to his feet. William, I think you need to... He began, but William interrupted him. I know the truth about my father. I know I'm the rightful heir. You've kept it from me all these years, all of you, but I know the truth now thanks to Digby, he said, as Digby entered the room behind him. To William's surprise, the appearance of his friend brought with it a gasp from his mother and the Duchess, their faces set in fearful expressions as Digby came to stand next to William. Yes, it was fortunate someone was willing to tell William the truth, wasn't it? he said, placing his hand on William's shoulder. Connor, the Duke snarled, and William turned to Digby in surprise. Connor, he said, and Digby smirked. An old name, William. One I haven't used in many years. Yes, they know me as Connor. But it hardly matters, does it? What's in a name? I'd say their secret is rather more... interesting, he said, glancing at the Earl and Countess, both of whom looked thoroughly bewildered. What's the meaning of this, William? More lies, I suppose, the Earl demanded, as Annie continued to stare at William in astonishment. Not lies, sir, no. The truth at last, William replied. William, this isn't the time, his mother said. But for William, the time had come. He was not about to allow the truth to be brushed aside or to be dismissed as a mere irritant. William was the son of the Duke of Lancaster, and he was not about to be kept quiet. The scandal was revealed, and the truth was there to be told. I think it's the perfect time, mother. What better time could there be? William replied, even as Max rose to his feet. I don't understand. What's all this about? he demanded, advancing towards William, who stood his ground defiantly. It's about the fact of your being my cousin, Max, William replied, stopping Max in his tracks as the Countess gasped. William, please, it can all be explained, the Duke said, but William was determined to have his say. I know who my father is. I know you're my uncle. I know it should be my mother and I living amidst this opulence. I know I should be the one to inherit the dukedom, William replied, fixing his godfather, his uncle, with a defiant gaze. The duke sighed and shook his head. You've poisoned his mind, Connor, he said, but Connor only laughed. I've told him the truth, Ralph. I'd say it's you that's poisoned his mind. You kept the secret from him all these years, the three of you conspiring. I only told him what he had the right to know. You tossed him a bone, Ralph, a letter of introduction. Well, I've made sure he has something far more worthwhile, the right to a claim against you, Connor replied, his tone triumphal, even as the Duke pointed his finger angrily at him. You don't know the truth, Connor. And don't you remember what I told you the last time I set eyes on you? You know what you did, and you know what I promised too, William's godfather said. Empty threats, Connor said, turning to William, who was still seething with anger. This was my right, all of this, he said, but the Duke shook his head. It wasn't, William. You'd never have been the heir. A child born out of wedlock can't be the heir. My brother and your mother weren't married. He died before they could be so. You've no legitimacy. That's why we protected you by keeping it a secret from you, the Duke replied and you promise him nothing. You send him off to London and hope he's forgotten, Connor snarled. But to William's surprise, his godfather shook his head. On the contrary, Connor, you don't know the full story. I've provided handsomely for William, and I sent him to London to help him stand on his own two feet before giving him that which was always promised, the title of Baron of Mowbray, its land and income. It was to be William's at the point he'd established himself. I'd have told him the truth then, as was always my intention, the Duke said. William stared at his godfather in disbelief, 
and Connor, too, seemed unsettled by this unexpected revelation. But I... I don't understand. What title is this? William asked, and it was the Duchess who now replied. My father's title, William. Before I married the Duke, my father lost everything. It was Ralph who saved him. He had no male heir, only my sister and I. Your godfather, your uncle, bought the title from him, and we've managed the land and income ever since. It was always to be yours at the proper time. It's just a shame Connor saw fit to make mischief over it. But then that's his way, and I'm afraid you've fallen into his trap. He didn't do any of this for you, but for himself, she said, fixing Connor with an angry gaze. William turned to his friend in astonishment. Why had Digby, Connor, made no mention of his past? There had been ample opportunity to do so, even as William now thought back to the odd manner in which Connor had presented himself. Had he been waiting for William at the Spaniards Inn? It was surely no coincidence. I did it for the truth, Connor replied, folding his arms. But the Duke shook his head. You know nothing about the truth, Connor. You're a liar, and you always were a liar. You thought I cared nothing for William, that I cheated him out of his rightful inheritance. But it's not true. His inheritance wasn't secure. He'd never have been accepted as the Duke of Lancaster. But to be made Baron of Mowbray, that's a completely different thing. A bought title can be gifted, and I intend to gift William the title immediately. It's his and it was always going to be, the Duke said. Which leaves us with the matter of your past, Connor, William's mother said, stepping forward and fixing Connor with an angry gaze. My past? I don't know what you mean, Connor said, though he was visibly unsettled by the Duke's words, and William turned to him curiously, unsure of what to think. What past? I don't understand. You said you knew my mother, my godfather, and the Duchess. But how? he asked. We knew Connor very well, William. He tried to blackmail us over you. He threatened to reveal the scandal to secure his own position of power. But it was your grandmother, my mother, who ensured his plans came to nothing, the Duke said as Connor gave an angry cry. Lies, just like the lies you've told, he snarled. We kept a damaging truth from a young man, waiting until the proper time to reveal it, William's mother replied and William felt suddenly foolish for having done what he had done and said what he had said. His godfather had intended a title for him all along, and he was right. A bastard couldn't inherit the title of Duke of Lancaster. William thought back to everything his godfather had done for him, and felt terribly guilty for the anger he had just displayed. He glanced at Anne sitting next to her parents, the three of them listening in silent astonishment. He wondered what they were thinking as this scandal unfolded before them. If the Earl had not approved of him before, he would certainly not approve of him now, and as for Anne, William could only imagine what was going through her mind. I... I'm sorry, he said, and his mother stepped forward and placed her hand on his arm. We wanted to tell you sooner, but there was never going to be the right time. Your uncle wanted you to make something of yourself, not just inherit wealth and privilege. Your father would have said the same. He was a good and honest man. I'm only sorry you've had your mind poisoned by Connor, she said, shaking her head sadly. Connor let out an angry exclamation. I'll reveal it all. I'll show you. If he won't do so, I will, he said. But the Duke shook his head. And don't you think I have your ruin to hand too, he replied. Connor stared at him in surprise. What do you mean? he demanded. I kept everything. I could still have you sent to prison. Didn't you think I'd want some insurance against you? I was far too lenient before. I should have reported you to the authorities, Ralph said, as both the Duchess and William's mother closed ranks on either side of the Duke, who folded his arms with a defiant glare on his face. William was astonished. He had been played for a complete and utter fool by Digby, by Connor. The man was nothing but a fraud, and now it all made perfect sense. Connor had used William for his own gain. He had drawn him into scandal, ruined his reputation, and all for the revenge he had waited to enact these twenty years gone. You cheated me, Digby, 
Connor. I trusted you. I was so blinded by my feelings for Anne, you took advantage of that, William said, glancing at Anne as he spoke. She was staring at him in disbelief, but her expression was softer now, sympathetic even. Blinded? I helped you, Connor snarled. But you didn't care about me. You cared only for your petty desire for revenge. I'm so sorry, Mother. I realise what a fool I've been now. I trusted this man, but I shouldn't have done. I was so caught up in my feelings for Anne. Lady Miller, I'd have done anything. But if only I'd waited, you'd have told me the truth, William said, turning to his mother, who smiled. You've a right to be angry, William. There was never going to be an easy way out of this. But I'm glad you know the truth, the whole truth she said, glancing at the Duke, who nodded. And the whole truth means you've a bright future ahead of you, William, or should I say the Baron of Mowbray, he replied. Chapter 27 Throughout this exchange, Anne had sat in stunned silence. The appearance of William and Digby in the drawing room had astonished her, but it was nothing as to the extraordinary revelation now told. William was the son of the former Duke of Lancaster and Digby had sought to use that fact in an act of revenge against the current Duke and Duchess. There were so many questions left unanswered, and Anne knew her parents would be shocked by the extraordinary scandal of William's birth. But it seemed the Duke, William's uncle, had always intended to make amends, and despite the lies William had told, he really was a gentleman now. The Baron of Mowbray. You... No, I'll tell everyone the truth about the bastard. Connor snarled, his face flushed with anger. And if you do that, you'll have me to answer to as well, Anne's father said. Anne turned to her father in surprise, as did the others. What do you mean? Connor retorted, turning to the earl who rose to his feet. In my inquiries concerning William, I made some interesting discoveries about certain dealings at Boodle's Club. It seems there's been some discrepancies at the gambling tables. Weighted dice, that sort of thing. There was a steward involved, and he gave your name as part of the confession. If it became public, he said, allowing the words to hang menacingly in the air. Connor stared at him in disbelief, even as the Duke and Duchess glanced at one another with a look of relief on their faces. I... you won't. It was supposed to be, Connor stammered, but there was nothing more to say. I think you'd better leave, Connor, and remember the threat hanging over you before you try to manipulate another innocent for your own gains, the Duke said, and with that, Connor turned on his heels and marched out of the drawing room, slamming the door behind him as a collective sigh of relief went up all around. William turned to Anne with a sorrowful expression on his face. I'm so sorry, he said, but Anne shook her head. She had been angry with him before. He had played her for a fool, or so it had seemed. But in the extraordinary scenes just witnessed, Anne had realised the extent of William's manipulation. Connor, his supposed friend, had poisoned William's mind against the very people who loved him the most and turned him into a puppet for his own gains. If William was guilty of anything, it was only the naivety of youth and the trusting nature of one who only wanted to do his best. He had fallen madly in love with her. Anne could see that in everything he had done, and it was a feeling she shared, for love was a madness shared by those lucky enough to know it together. I don't think you've got anything to be sorry for, William. That awful man, he cheated you so terribly. He made you into something you're not and for his own gains, Anne replied. Anne, why don't the two of you talk alone, her mother whispered, and Anne rose to her feet glancing at the Duke and Duchess, who both nodded. We could walk in the gardens, William suggested, and the Duke nodded. I think you've both got a lot to talk about, and I'm sure Maximilian won't mind, he said, glancing at William's cousin, who shook his head and laughed. I think it's too extraordinary for words. My cousin, I can hardly believe it. But it doesn't alter anything, does it, father? he asked. The Duke shook his head. It only means you have an ally rather than a rival. I hope you'll both see that in one another. It was always my intention, 
even as I know you've not always seen eye to eye, he replied. You've proved yourself today, William. I admire your pluck in confronting your uncle, and your magnanimity I knowing you were wrong, Anne's father said, and William blushed. I really am so sorry, he said. But the others shook their heads. There's a lot to be sorry for amongst us all. But for you, William, we're not sorry. We're blessed by you, and it seems you can be a blessing to another too. We can see just how in love you are, both of you. Why should we stand in your way? We want you to be happy, Anne. I've not seen that look in your eyes for a very long time, the Duchess said, smiling at Anne, who offered William her arm. They stepped out of the drawing room, walking in silence until they emerged from the hallway onto the terrace, where the gardens were spread out magnificently before them. The scent of roses and lavender hung in the air, and they walked across the lawn, under the shade of weeping willow trees, whose branches hung down as though to make an arch, where dappled sunlight speckled the green grass. What a terrible thing Connor did, William, Anne said, horrified at the thought of what had transpired between the two men. William shook his head. He looked embarrassed, even as none of it was surely his fault. I allowed myself to be manipulated by him. I was such a fool, he said. But Anne would not hear of such talk. Nonsense, he played you for a fool. He gained your confidence, but he was the enemy all along. He did all this for revenge. How fortunate your uncle was two steps ahead of him. I know it must all be a dreadful shock discovering the truth like this. But you know it now, and it makes a difference, Anne said. She had been angry with William. He had made himself out to be a gentleman. He had told lies about himself and the things he had done. But all that had been at the behest of Connor, he had set William up to fail and manipulated his chance encounter with Anne for his own ends. I'm so sorry I lied to you. I didn't want to. But I didn't think you'd pay me any attention if I was just William, the son of a servant. I kept the truth from you about my godfather but I told you so many lies in its place. I wish I'd just been honest with you, he said. Anne smiled. She thought back to her penny novels, where the hero was always as he said he was, and the heroine just as she appeared. But life was not like that, not truly. It was filled with twists and turns, and reasons for this and that, some of which made sense, and some of which did not. Anne could not blame William for his naivety in believing Connor's lies. He had stepped out into the world with hope in his heart and had been unfortunate enough to encounter Connor on the way. But the truth wasn't even that, was it? Your godfather was your uncle, and what you believed about yourself and your prospects was false. You were always destined for this title and for the privileges your uncle had secured for you. If you'd known it before, you'd not have told those lies. You're hardly the first man to tell a few untruths in the hope of impressing a woman, Anne said. And William laughed. No, perhaps not. I only did it because, well, from that first moment in the market I've thought of nothing but you, he said. Anne's heart skipped a beat, and she paused, turning to him, as they stood beneath the dappled shade of the willow trees, the arch framing Burnley Abbey behind. She smiled at him, knowing she felt just the same way, for she had thought of little else but him, either, since the first day of their meeting. Love is a smoke made with the fume of sighs, being purged, a fire sparkling in lovers' eyes, being vexed, a sea nourished with lovers' tears. What is it else? A madness most discreet, a choking gall, and a preserving sweet. The words of Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet came at once to Anne's mind. The smoke had cleared. The truth was there to see. Anne loved William as he loved her, and despite the anger of the past few days, her love for him been undiminished. It was the sorrow of loss she had felt most acutely. The loss of what she had hoped would be, replaced by an arrangement with Maximilian, or whoever else her parents deigned to choose for her. But William was Anne's choice. And now she knew the truth, there could be no barrier to the happiness they deserved. I've thought of nothing but you, either, she confessed. 
and it was a relief to say those words and reveal the innermost feelings of her heart. She could have settled for nothing but him, and now he stared at her in astonishment, as though he had only expected rejection on her part. Do you... mean it? he asked. And she nodded, gazing up into his eyes and feeling only love for him and hope for all they might share together. I was angry with you. I thought you were like all the others. But I see it now. You're nothing like them. You pretended to be a gentleman and wanted to impress me with expensive clothes and business credentials. But I don't care about any of that. It was you I fell in love with, she said. And William let out a deep sigh of relief. I never wanted to be something else, I promise you. I'm just William, the son of a seamstress from Lancashire, he said. But Anne shook her head. You're far more than that, a little naive, perhaps. But you're young, and so am I. We're allowed a flight of romance and a little foolishness, I think. But my father was right. You proved your courage in confronting your uncle and your magnanimity in accepting you were wrong. I was proud of you, she said, and William blushed. I'm still a pauper, though. I didn't know my left foot from my right at the Charlton Lodge ball. I was completely out of place. I dressed myself up, won money in that awful game of cards and pretended I was a gentleman. But I'm not, and I don't know if I can be so either, he said, shaking his head. He looked at her with a doubtful expression, but Anne only smiled and slipped her hands into his. I know plenty of penniless aristocrats. Society won't care, you've got a title, they're all snobs, that's all that matters, she said, and William laughed. Well, yes, I suppose I do now, don't I? The Baron of Mowbray. I don't even know where Mowbray is, he said and now it was Anne's turn to laugh. Oh, that doesn't matter either. Titles don't mean you actually live in the place of your namesake. I remember my father telling me of a former Duke of Cumberland. He never set foot there, not for his entire life. He spent his fortune in London and died penniless in Portsmouth, Anne said, smiling as she recalled her father's story. The Earl himself spent hardly any time in Blakely and gave the village of his namesake little by way of his attention. The fact of William's title would be enough for society to accept him, and to accept a marriage between him and the daughter of an earl. I suppose that's something, I must say. It's all come as something of a shock, the whole thing. I never knew anything about my father. He was a soldier who died in Corsica. That's it, and now... Oh, goodness, he exclaimed, and Anne looked at him in surprise. What's the matter, she said, and he took her by the hand, leading her back across the lawn. I've just realised something. I can see my father right now, he exclaimed, and together they hurried towards the house, even as Anne felt confused as to how they could possibly see the long-dead duke. But as William led her through a side door, she realised what he had meant. They had entered the dining room, and there, above the fireplace, was a portrait. It could have been a portrait of William himself, perhaps in ten years or so, and as the new Baron of Mowbray gazed up at his father's image, a tear ran down Anne's cheek. There's no doubting it, William, she said, and he turned to her and smiled. I never noticed it before. I suppose I wasn't looking for it either. I just believed, well, I believed I was just William, he said. But Anne shook her head. He was not just William. He was the man she had fallen in love with, the man who had now discovered the truth about himself and about his past, and who had overcome the power conspiring against him. He had a bright future ahead of him, and it was a future Anne wanted to be a part of. You're far more than that, William, she said, as he took her hands in his and gazed lovingly into her eyes. I've never met anyone like you. I knew from the first moment I laid eyes on you. I love you. But I was a pauper. I had nothing. How could I be the sort of man a woman like you deserved? I'm sorry I lied to you, but I did it with the best of intentions. I wanted to be something I wasn't. But I realise I don't want any of that now. I just want to be me. The Baron of Mowbray. The title means nothing. But if it means I can ask you this question, then I'm glad of it, he said, sinking down on one knee. 
Anne gasped, and he held her hands in his, gazing up at her in hopeful imploration. She knew what was to come, but this was no penny novel, or even a Shakespearean romance. It was their own, and nobody else's. William, I... she said, but he shook his head, interrupting her with the words she had longed to hear. Will you marry me, Anne? he said, and Anne needed no time to think as tears rolled down her cheeks. I will, a thousand times I will, she exclaimed, and William leapt to his feet, throwing his arms around her in delight. You've made me the happiest of men, Anne. I'm sorry for all that's passed between us, but I... I promise from this day forward, no more lies, only the truth, only happiness, he said, and their lips met in a kiss. Anne was entirely caught up in the moment, a perfect moment of happiness. She clung to him, feeling as though her heart was about to burst with joy. It was overwhelming, and as their lips parted, she let out a deep sigh, thankful at last to have found the love she had always hoped for. And I promise the same. We came so close to loss, and yet, here we are, on the threshold of something unimaginably wonderful, she said, as he gazed lovingly into her eyes. I never thought you'd take a second look at me, but Providence brought us together, and perhaps we'll look back on my feeble attempts at being a gentleman with mirth in years to come, he said laughing, as Anne shook her head. Oh, I thought you made an exquisite gentleman. It wasn't all a pretense, though I realise you know nothing about imports and exports now, she said. Ah, but I intend to learn. I won't rest on my laurels. I'm going to make a name for myself in business, I promise, he said, and there could be no doubting the sincerity of his words. We must tell the others, Anne said, and for a moment William looked doubtful. I fear your mother and father still might not approve of me, he said, but Anne shook her head. You're the first person I've ever heard my father compliment in such a way. They want me to be happy, William, and with you I will be, she said. He put his arms around her again and kissed her, and for a few moments they stood in a silent embrace beneath the portrait of William's father. So much had changed so quickly, but the truth had been revealed, and it was a truth they could both find happiness in, a truth to honour and celebrate. I hope I'll make my father proud, William said, glancing up at the portrait, and Anne smiled at him as the two of them walked hand in hand from the drawing room. I think you've already done so, William, she replied, feeling that same pride in the man she was now to marry, the man who had become her whole world and whom she could not imagine life without. Epilogue Lancashire, England, 1816 Six months later. That's it, my lady. All ready, Helen said, standing back as Anne rose to her feet. It was the day of her wedding, and Anne had spent the night at Burnley Abbey, for she and William were to be married at the church on the estate, in the graveyard of which was buried William's father, the former duke. It was six months after William's proposal, and a great deal had changed for them both. William was now a man of business, working in a firm of brokers in the city. He had swiftly proved his worth, and the couple were to divide their time between the city and the countryside. Podmore Grange, the ancestral seat of the Mowbray family, was to be theirs, and the house had been opened up for the couple to spend their first night there as man and wife. You've done wonders, Helen, Anne said, gazing at herself in the mirror. The maid had styled her hair in a bun, and she wore the pearl earrings, inlaid in silver, her mother had given her before the Charlton Lodge ball. Anne's father had bought her a new dress, and with a pair of sequined slippers on her feet, and a silk shawl wrapped around her shoulders, Anne was ready. You'd look beautiful in anything, my lady. I'm so happy for you, Helen replied, as a knock came at the door. It was Anne's father, dressed in a new frock coat and tails, he looked every bit the proud father and had come to escort Anne to the waiting carriage. I can't believe it's happening, Anne said, as they made their way downstairs, followed by Helen, whom Anne had insisted on inviting to the wedding. A truly happy day, Anne, for us all. I'm so proud of you, 
the Earl said, and his words brought a tear to Anne's eye. Her father was not given to outbursts of emotion, but there was no doubting the sincerity of his words, and as they came down the stairs to the hallway, Anne's mother was waiting for them, along with the Duke and Duchess. William's just left. Don't worry, you won't meet him. He's gone with Maximilian and Teresa. Your carriage awaits, Anne, the Duchess said, and the party escorted her out into the wintry sunshine of that perfect day. The carriage had been decked with holly and ivy, the red berries glinting with frost. It was a cold day, but the sky was bright and blue, and there could be no doubting the warmth in their hearts as to the happy occasion to come. Anne sat opposite her mother and father, with Helen at her side, and the Duke and Duchess rose behind in a separate carriage, the party making its way in procession to the Church of St. James, the Church of Burnley Abbey. Oh, look, my lady, there's quite a crowd gathered already, Helen said, as they drew up at the Lich Gate. The Duke and Duchess of Crawshaw were there, along with their son, Ernest, a dashing blonde boy in the first flush of youth. Isabel, their daughter, too, was there the friend of Anne's who had written to her in such disparaging terms about Maximilian, and who now waved to her and smiled. In the previous six months, Maximilian himself had changed beyond all recognition. He and William had become firm friends, and it seemed the revelation of their kin had given rise to a far more congenial relationship. He was standing to greet the guests, acting as William's best man. Well-wishers from the village had come, and a cheer went up from the gathered crowd as Anne and the others climbed down from the carriage. You look beautiful, Anne, Isabel said, hurrying up to greet her. The two had become close in the past six months, and Isabel had been a great help to Anne as she settled into her country life. I can't believe I'm here, Anne replied, for she felt quite overwhelmed at the thought of marrying William and becoming his wife. The bells of the church were pealing a merry ding-dong and Maximilian ushered the guests through the Lich Gate as the rector, Reverend Archibald Peterson, came to greet them. He was dressed in a billowing white surplice, and with his grey hair and half-moon spectacles, he looked every bit a minster of the established church. Good day to you all. A chilly day, but the warmth of happiness pervades. The poor baron finds himself somewhat nervous, I fear, he said, and Anne laughed. Then let's not keep him waiting any longer, Reverend Peterson, she exclaimed, as her father offered her his arm and they entered the sunlit interior of the church, where the organ was thundering a march. Anne could see William waiting for her in the chancel, his back turned, even as he now turned to her and smiled. This way, my lady, the clergyman whispered, and together with her father, Anne set off down the aisle, smiling at William as they approached. Were you nervous? she whispered, as her father let go of her arm and she slipped her hand into William's. I've never been more so in my life, but now you're here, we're here, and you're true, the most beautiful creature on all God's earth, he replied, as Reverend Peterson came to stand before them. Anne smiled, squeezing William's hand, as the clergyman cleared his throat and opened his prayer book. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honourable estate, instituted of God in the time of man's innocency, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church. Reverend Peterson began, commencing the marriage service, as Anne and William stood arm in arm. In that moment, Anne could feel nothing but happiness. She was taken up in it, caught in this moment of supreme joy, just like one of the heroines in her stories. Except this was not a story, not an idle romance, but the truth of the happiness she had longed for, the happiness now realised for them both. Anne and William made their vows before God and their families and friends. They promised to be faithful to one another their whole lives long and love and honour one another in good times and bad. As they were pronounced man and wife, William turned to Anne and kissed her, and as their lips parted, he told her again just how much he loved her. And I love you too, she replied, smiling up at him, 
and knowing this was just the beginning of a wonderful life together. Isn't it a charming place? Anne said, looking up at Podmore Grange as she climbed out of the carriage later that afternoon. A lavish tea party had been held at Burnley Abbey to celebrate the nuptials, and having eaten their fill of dainty cakes and jam-laden scones, Anne and William had bid the others goodbye and set off for Podmore Grange, a short carriage drive from Burnley Abbey. Anne had not yet visited the ancestral home of the Mowbrays, for William had promised to make it a handsome dwelling for her, a wedding present of sorts. A fine house, indeed. We'll be quite happy here when we're in the north, though my feet are itching to return to London, William replied. Anne laughed. She knew William had taken to the city, and whilst she too preferred its hustle and bustle, there was something delightful about the house. A fine red brick building covered in ivy, with tall chimneys, set amongst lush, mature gardens, and looking out across a vast expanse of moorland, its pink and purple heathery hue shimmering in the winter sunshine. I think it's lovely, my lady, Helen said, for she had accompanied the couple from Burnley Abbey and would remain with them for the duration of their stay. As Helen helped Anne down from the carriage, the door of the house was opened and a tall woman, with a beaming smile on her face, emerged to greet them. Good day, my lord, my lady. Welcome to Podmore Grange. We've got the fires lit and a cheerful welcome awaits you, she said introducing herself as the housekeeper, Mrs. Foxbury. A footman hurried out to take the bags, and Anne and William found the other servants lined up and waiting for them in the hallway, where paintings of the previous occupants hung on the walls, and a fire burned in the hearth. Oh, look, that's your aunt. She told me about this painting. I must invite her to take tea whilst we're here. She'll be delighted to see over the place. When the Duke had tenants here, she didn't feel she could come and see it. But it's really her home, isn't it? Anne said, pointing to a portrait of a man and woman with two children hanging on the wall. I want you two myself for a few days, William whispered, and two of the housemaids had to try hard to suppress their giggles. Anne smiled, slipping her hand into William's. Don't worry, I won't invite anyone for at least a week, she replied. Having made the introductions to the servants, the housekeeper led Anne and William into the drawing room, where candles had been lit, and the fire gave off a merry glow. There was wine, and the pleasant scent of cooking promised an excellent dinner to come. I'll leave you alone now, my lord. Please ring if you require anything, Mrs Foxbury said, before retreating from the room with a gracious bow. Anne sat down by the fire with a grateful sigh. She could not have felt happier than she did in that moment, and William now came to sit beside her, slipping his arm around her and smiling. At last, we're alone, he said, as Anne rested her head on his shoulder. But what a beautiful day it's been, Anne replied, looking up at him. He leaned forward and kissed her, a lingering kiss, their hands clasped together, his arms around her. No more chaperones, no more pretense. We can be alone together, just the two of us, he whispered, as their lips parted. If only I'd known how much that loaf of bread was really worth, Anne said, and William laughed. It wasn't worth anything at all. It just chalk dust and husks of wheat, he said, but Anne shook her head. Oh, but to me it was priceless. If the baker hadn't charged so much for it, you'd never have come to my aid. I can't thank him enough, she said, resting her head on William's chest as he ran his fingers through her hair. It's funny how fate plays such a part in our lives. A chance encounter can change everything, and a single word be the difference between happiness and sorrow. How grateful I am to fate, he said. But some things are meant to be. I'm not sure I believe in fate, so much as an unfolding of things meant to be. Everything in its proper time. Your secret, for example, she said, and William nodded. The families had agreed to keep the matter of William's parentage to themselves. The scandal would still be great if it was revealed, and there was no oddity in the Duke of Lancaster gifting his godson the forgotten title of Baron of Mowbray. All had ended happily, and whilst William was proud of his newly found lineage, 
there was no reason for it to be revealed. Connor was gone, threatened on every side by the knowledge of his wicked ways, his cheating and lies, and the secret would be safe with all those it concerned. But you and I shall have no secrets, William said, and Anne nodded. None at all. What could possibly be a greater secret than this? No, we'll have no secrets, William. Why would we? When you're in love, you wouldn't want to hold anything back, she replied, and William smiled. And that's why we've got such a happy life ahead of us, Anne. We know everything about one another. There's nothing to hide. I love you, and you love me. That's all that matters, he said. And again he kissed her, and Anne knew his words were true. All they needed was love, and they had that in abundance. William and Anne fought against the demons from the past, shielded by their love. But what about Maximilian? Will his rakeways keep him from a loving future? Will his old enemies leave him alone? He has to find out. Read Max's story now. Scan the QR code or click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.